The first is they are local. They really were churches operating at that time. In fact, Sir William Ramsey conducted an intensive archaeological investigation, skeptically at first, totally convinced when he was finished, that these churches not only were actually existed, they had local problems that the letters were relevant to. And we'll talk about some of that as we go through the four letters, or seven letters. But they, had, they were literal churches in John's day that needed the Lord's counsel. Okay, that one's a no-brainer. We got it so far? Okay. They're, I'm going to suggest they're admonitory to all churches. Notice what the, it says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. See, all seven letters were sent to all seven churches. One of the richest sources of knowledge about man's ancient past is the art he left behind. From the earliest times, human beings have recorded their impressions on the walls of caves, on the surfaces of pottery and stone, and in the form of sculptures. But when artifacts are found which portray images of dinosaurs, are we to conclude that man and dinosaurs lived at the same time? In this program, we will investigate two of the largest and most controversial collections of artifacts ever found, which show humans interacting with dinosaurs. The Acambaro figurines of Mexico and the Ica stones of Peru. Do these artifacts suggest that ancient artists were eyewitnesses to living dinosaurs? According to our present understanding of man's development, this is impossible. While dinosaurs flourished during the Jurassic period, they supposedly became extinct almost 65 million years before man walked the earth. The Acambaro figurines and the Ica stones have been investigated by some scientists and labeled a hoax. Yet others feel these investigations were superficial and inconclusive. They claim the collections have been unfairly judged because of the implications of man and dinosaurs living together. As a result, both of these amazing collections of art have remained mired in confusion. Now, an independent archaeologist takes an unbiased look at these controversial artifacts and reveals the amazing story behind them. When the Spanish first arrived in Mexico 400 years ago, they encountered artistic expressions that were completely foreign to their way of thinking. Fantastic temples reached to the sky. Statues and carvings so bizarre, the conquistadores believed they could only be the work of the devil. Today, in the town of Acambaro, a collection of clay figurines continues to baffle all who gaze upon them. The Acambaro collection, found in Mexico in the 30s and 40s and excavated in the 50s, is an amazing subject. It has over 33,500 individually made, not more made, artifacts. One of the most spectacular and controversial aspect is the representations of apparent dinosaurs, which were presumably extinct at least 60 million years ago. It all began 50 years ago when an amateur archaeologist named Valdemar Yulsrud unearthed a clay figurine that was unlike anything he had ever seen before. When Yulsrud learned that local farmers had been finding similar statues in the area of Bull Mountain, he began to collect them. He was initially puzzled by what appeared to be Egyptian and Sumerian styles among the growing collection. It includes representations of blacks, orientals, Eskimo, of South American, Asiatic and African animals, of bearded white faces, uh, it goes on and on. The most startling artifacts in the Acambaro collection are dozens of strange dinosaur-like figures. They are portrayed in a wide variety of interactions with humans, from people being devoured by the giant reptiles to much more intimate relationships between man and beast. To Yosrud, these images were tangible proof that man and dinosaurs lived at the same time. Independent researcher John Tierney has been tracking the Acambaro mystery since he first saw the bizarre figurines over 40 years ago. 
This Acambro discovery is either the greatest hoax in the entire history of science, or it is one of the greatest archaeological discoveries ever made. If it's authentic, it's going to upset the orthodox concepts and timescales in many fields of study. Archaeology, anthropology, zoology, history, paleontology, even psychology and religion. For the people of Acambaro, the story of Valdemar Yulsrud and his fantastic collection has become a local legend. Over a period of 10 years, Yulsrud amassed over 33,000 clay figurines. I went to his house one day and uh, it was loaded. Uh, boxes everywhere, figurines, dinosaurs. It was fantastic. I was overwhelmed. I used to visit him with a friend from grammar school. He would always let us come in and gaze at his enormous collection, his esteemed collection as he called it. He extended an open invitation to anyone from our school to come and study the artifacts. He led us from room to room. He, he was sleeping in the bathtub at the time. It was just, just so loaded with these artifacts. He would always explain to us how significant the collection was, and we were so impressed by its enormous size and importance. To his credit, Yulsrud never tried to commercialize or profit from the collection, but it never attracted the serious scientific attention he felt it deserved. In 1954, the Mexican authorities sent a team of official archaeologists, four members, very prominent archaeologists, to a Cambro. They, at the site, mind you, at a site of their own choice, excavated scientifically samples of these jewels with artifacts, and they agreed that they had to be authentic. But three weeks later, they filed a report claiming they could not have been authentic because of the fantastic representations of dinosaurs and other creatures. And that is where the situation has remained ever since. This is something that has been largely ignored by the scientific community, simply because it's so incredible it can't be true. The implications of this discovery are so immense that it would seem to me that anyone of education and intelligence would not rest until he found an answer to it. Cherney's challenge was accepted by Neil Steedy, an archaeologist who has worked for the Mexican government for over 20 years. I am what is known as a contract archaeologist. I'm not locked in to an established mindset. I've seen reports from both camps, and some people claim that, no, there were artifacts that were created on the spot for him, and they were sold to him, whereas other people claim, no, they were found in the area, and they are authentic ancient artifacts. Are these items um, of ancient manufacture, or are they of modern manufacture? And that's what we're going to try and judge. The first hurdle to confront Tierney and Steedy was the exact location of the fabled collection. There was a real concern that the entire collection could be lost. Town Councilman Senor Ignacio Nares recalled rumors that several old boxes of clay statues were stored in a locked room nearby. Could this be the legacy of Valdemar Yulsrud? The Councilman was intrigued and granted permission to investigate. Senor Nares and his colleagues had only recently been elected to office. They had never seen the entire Yulsrud collection, and expectations were high. The next morning, the team was ready to enter the storeroom. But the door had been locked for years, and the key was nowhere to be found. I'm not sure how long this door has been locked, but there are apparently several thousand or more, maybe 10,000, artifacts locked in this room behind us. Nobody's seen this whole collection, I don't know how many years. Finally, Senor Nares gave the order to break into the store. <laughs> The original collection was said to contain more than 33,500 figurines. It 
it says here something like eight, 42 pieces. It says how many pieces. Uh, that gives you 40, that'd be 4,000 pieces of props. If that, if that figure remains true, which of course you don't know. According to rumor, many of the statues had gone missing or were broken or stolen. Wow. The idea today is to go through every artifact, however many there are. And if they turn out to be modern renditions, that's part of the show. Uh, what can you say? What does that look like to you? I I've never seen one. <laughs> As the storeroom began to yield its treasures, it became clear that there were many thousands of artifacts to be examined. Neil worked methodically, categorizing the figurines by style, size, color, and subject. It would take time, but he was determined to examine each and every artifact. I can't believe this man has walked onto the scene. He's a professional archaeologist, and he's just a type of open-minded person that we've been looking for over the years. Here um, we have these two dinosaurs, which I suppose are representing a dimedon by the fin. It's interesting, they only have two front legs. Were they done in the 1940s? If they were done in the 1940s, people knew what uh, dinosaurs looked like, and they were a fairly common uh, item that people were aware of, and so it would be easy to make something like this. If they date late as 1000 AD, Already we have some problems, uh, because even at 1000 AD, nobody that we know of had been digging up and putting together dinosaur skeletons, so how would they know what it looked like? Let's suppose this artifact itself actually dated um, 4000 BC. If it dated 4000 BC, it wouldn't be so much the human factor as our dinosaur factor we'd have to bring forward, rather than pushing humans back. Did man live at the time of the dinosaurs? I, I personally find that very difficult to believe myself. I'd rather believe that some dinosaurs live to a much later stage than uh, we believe today. What I want to know is what the truth is and give us a scientific basis to be able to substantiate that truth. Even with the help of volunteers, it would take four days to examine and categorize every statue in the storeroom. We've now cleaned out the aisle, and it uh, looks like, well, we've got light in here now, too. We've got about, uh, oh, 50, oh, man, oh, man, look at this. They didn't tell me this. There's a whole other door here. Oh, man, there's a whole room here. Halfway through the investigation, Neil and his team had examined over 10,000 individual statues. He was beginning to form an opinion as to the authenticity of the figurines. I'm having some great doubts about the large part of the collection. I'll give you a quick example. This pot was made out of a piece of clay, which they formed the bowl, and then they had a stem sticking up here, and a knife was taken and cut four ways to create these legs. As we examined the sides of the cut, you can see where grains of sand were dug along, pushed by the instrument that did the cutting. That means that you had to have something that was rigid enough, such as a very hard plastic or, in fact, a metal, um, which would imply the civilization that did this had metal. Uh, and it's those types of things that are bringing up questions. As Neil's doubts grew, the two investigators began to differ in opinion. Even though I respect Neil's work, I'm going my own way. Neil is going his way. These artifacts could have been made by as many as a half a dozen different cultures, in different places at different times, for different reasons, by different methods. There is a civilization in the area known as uh, Chipiquito civilization, which uh, flourished in pre-Columbian times, in fact, before Christ. And um, we are finding some artifacts are of that civilization. But there seems to be a whole other style of artifacts that are the ones that everyone has been questioning. As we look among the, the questionable artifacts, there is this. It all comes, apparently, from one deposit, clay deposit. Okay, one minute. 
try and do here, look for a piece of carbon. To obtain the age of the artifacts, Neil took small samples from two specimens, a primitive face and a figure resembling a dinosaur. These samples would be carbon dated by a professional laboratory when he returned to the United States. That's going to be all I need if I can get it. The next test would be to try to find a figurine actually buried in the ground. According to the reports gathered by Tierney and others, the majority of the collection had been unearthed along the base of Cerro Toro, or Bull Mountain. They were buried in shallow pits in groups of about 20 to 40. It was said you could find them almost anywhere along the foot of the mountain. Neil consulted a map of the area and calculated the chances of finding new Acambaro figurines in unexplored soil. With the permission of Senor Nares, the team initiated an archaeological dig. If we move this much earth, we have an 80% chance, just the statistics, of finding the same kind of artifacts they had. We're going to find, I suspect, all sorts of different stuff. But if we do that much, we can say, hey, the statistics tell 80% chance. That's darn good chances. Anybody take it in Las Vegas. Before long, pieces of clay statues began to appear. These two seem to be pot handles or legs are similar in structure as to size and structure of a lot of those animals. There's the possibility that, in fact, they're related. What we have to demonstrate is, are they the same type of pottery or not? Do they date the same or not? The team worked methodically, digging and sifting down through the stratified layers of earth, looking for remnants of previous cultures. Once we set up the stratification, that we can compare it with the other side where the machines are dug, then we'll have a point of... Hey, look at these ones. Uh oh, uh oh. It looks like we found something similar to his stuff. We found a small artifact which looked very similar to some of the stuff that was in the Jewels World collection. It does fit the collection. However, it fits the non controversial part of the collection, not the controversial part, which is the dinosaur like figures. After several hours, the team had excavated some interesting artifacts. But none of them, according to Neil, resembled the controversial artifacts in Yulesrud's collection. I think we feel that uh, they're digging in the wrong place. I would say that it's the wrong spot to begin with. Uh, however, I say let Neil Speed be Neil Speed. Uh, he's very adept at his business. He has his own reasons for choosing the site. I, however, would have gone directly to the old site and uh, cast around in two spots that we have reason to believe could be more valuable initially. In the 1970s, several compelling artifacts turned up in a very unusual location. Yulesrud's writings had attracted the attention of a pair of unlikely investigators. Professor of Anthropology Charles Hapgood and Earl Stanley Gardner, creator of the courtroom hero Perry Mason. Hapgood reasoned that since the foundations of the houses on Bull Mountain were erected on unbroken ground, no one could claim statues found under them could have been planted there. There were claims made that these were being made modernly. So uh, in 55, Hapgood uh, demonstrated that uh, he could take them out from under a house that had been built 25 years previously. While dining in the home of Acambaros' chief of police, Hapgood mentioned rumors that statues could be found by digging almost anywhere in the area. He convinced his host to let him dig a hole in the hard-packed dirt floor of his home. He uh, tore a hole in the uh, cement floor of the house and uh, dug down I don't know how far and uh, eventually came up with some pretty good pieces. I tend to believe that if Charles Hapgood in 1955 excavated these objects through the concrete hard floor of a house, that other houses along there must have had the same capabilities of producing that sort of a find. Neil was willing to give it a try. We're riding all over the old site right now. Is that right? So this may have been where they dug them up? Either? Yeah, originally there was, a, there was a ditch, a roaded ditch that ran down here, and Jules was riding his horse down when he discovered the first figurine. In an attempt to replicate Hapgood's experiment, the team located a suitable house within a block of the police chiefs. 
The trick would be to convince the homeowner to let them dig. Okay. Okay. We were trying to replicate what Hapgood did uh, quite a few years ago. And uh, we went down four and a half, maybe a little bit more, uh, feet. No one else has ever excavated here. The statistics read to us that in this large of a space, which is six foot by four foot or three foot wide, we should have found at least three figurines. We found several bags of shards, which we will analyze, but we found no figurines whatsoever, which of course is quite disappointing in relationship to the collection that we're studying. And uh, I would say that the thing that we need to do at this time is analyze what we have and take it from there. It looks as though it isn't going to fit in with the stories that we've been told about the collection we're studying. It wasn't a spot I would have selected myself. I would have continued to uh, dig on the site uh, directly above the present level of the house that's constructed there today. And that's a little far afield. We don't know how far they, the objects were before. The house dig was within 100 feet of where Hapgood had done his house dig and found his evidence. Now we leave these people with this huge hole in their patio which um, we've tried to convince them to convert to a swimming pool now that it's there, but uh, they've asked us to go ahead and fill it back in, so that we'll start doing. John did suggest that we dig farther up the apron at Bull Mountain. The reason I chose not to is because observing the area where he wanted to dig, the soil at the most was a foot to two feet deep, and it was mostly made up of large rocks six to eight inches, which would have long since pulverized any type of figurines which would have been under them. For Neil, the last piece of the puzzle would fall into place when he received the laboratory analysis of his samples. Meanwhile, the investigation rekindled a 40-year-old debate. There are many unanswered questions about this collection. Most importantly, who could possibly have manufactured more than 33,000 figurines? There was this man named Odilon Tinajero, and he was the one with his family and other artisans who began making these clay figurines. Funny as it sounds, he saw a series of pictures on boxes of matches that were popular during that time, the early 40s, and he copied them copied pictures of dinosaurs and other extinct animals. Absolutely impossible. It would take a scholar along with a huge amount of people to turn these out and uh, turn them out so well. They say that it would take thousands of years to create so many pieces, but that's not true. Here the craftsmen can make up to a hundred, even five hundred a day. That's a ridiculous claim that they could have been made at the rate of 500 a day. Several months later, Neil received the test results from the lab. The human face was carbon dated at 4,000 years old, close to what Neil expected from a pre-Columbian artifact. However, the dinosaur-like figurine was dated at 1,500 years old. Rather than solve the mystery, these test results only added fuel to the controversy. When we dated the dinosaur-like figure, the idea was to hopefully obtain some of the filler material, such as straw, that is used many times within such a figurine to strengthen it. Now, within the clay deposits itself are organic materials that were there since the time of the formation of the clay deposit. I believe what we obtained was the date of the clay rather than data filler material. Steeding wants it both ways. If the, if the carbon-14 test shows that they're old, he's got to find some out. The field observations, I find a figurine that would not have lasted in the soil 1,500 years. It is a very soft, baked figurine. It is very crumbly. I don't think it would have lasted 20 years in the soil. All that contradiction tells me that the laboratory test has not given us a true reading of the age of the figurine in question. There was no possible way scientifically that they could have visually determined that the jewels were controversial type 
had been made since the turn of the century. I, I really have reached the point where I have to say that Neil Steedy seems to be the Inspector Clouseau of modern archaeology. Today, the Acambaro figurines are on display for anyone to see. The imagination of artisans in Acambaro is extremely vivid. If you're going to study these figurines, just look at them as part of Mexican culture and nothing else. It's a world-class discovery and a world-class scientific scandal. Let's see what happens from here on. Peru, rich with mysterious landscapes, ancient ruins, and unanswered questions. Hundred-ton blocks of granite fitted together with the precision of a jigsaw puzzle suggest a technological capability far beyond our understanding. Megalithic temples perched atop the Andes Mountains evoke images of another world. The Nazca lines crisscross the desert for 20 miles with the accuracy of a laser. Gigantic figures are made of one continuous line, as if drawn from the air by the finger of a god. Some feel the mysteries of Peru are merely the work of indigenous cultures. But one man insists they are evidence of a technologically advanced civilization that flourished millions of years ago. He claims he has the proof of their existence. In 1966, in the nearby town of Ica, Dr. Javier Cabrera began a collection of extraordinary engraved stones. Carved on these stones are images that seem impossible. Skilled surgeons performing a complex heart transplant using acupuncture. Ancient pilots hovering above the ground in a flying machine. Astronomers gazing at the stars through what appear to be telescopes. According to Dr. Cabrera, these inscribed stones are records of an ancient culture which was far more scientifically advanced than any we have ever imagined. I thought it was really far out and completely loopy and cranky, but uh, the photographs caught my eye. I was profoundly attracted to them, very interested, and at the same time uh, very challenged. Um, so I call it an intellectual shock. I've even called it an intellectual cataclysm because it challenged my um, my training, basically. Dr. Cabrera calls these 11,000 artifacts a library in stone. They seem to be pregnant with knowledge and meaning, but um, what was their meaning? I, I was completely uh, at loss. While the level of technology recorded on the stones has stirred much controversy, vivid portrayals of dinosaurs are even more disturbing. Many of the stones accurately depict Brontosaurus, Stegosaurus, Tyrannosaurus rex, and flying pterodactyls. How can this be? According to Dr. Cabrera, these ancient scientists knew how to kill the giant reptiles. Dinosaurs had two major nerve centers, the brain and the pelvic ganglion. If either were disabled, the giant could be brought down. Images on the Ica stone show men attacking one or the other nerve center with hand axes. Teniendo en cuenta que because the engravings on these stones show scenes of the universe and planet Earth with the continents in significantly different positions on the globe, and also show plants and animals that are considered extinct today, including dinosaurs, we are forced to admit that the beings depicted in these stones lived millions and millions of years ago far before men was supposed to have existed. From a geologist's point of view, there is a, at least a 60 million year gap in history between uh, the demise of the dinosaurs and the appearance of man, or at least Homo sapiens sapiens as we know it. So it would be an enormous review, a revolution in scientific thinking um, to postulate that they might have coexisted. For years, Dr. Cabrera has extended an open invitation to the scientific community in the hopes that the Ica stones would be validated. Many scientists are aware of the Ica stones, but most refuse to investigate them. Present-day men, scientific men, believe that the humanity of the 20th century is the pinnacle of civilization. 
It is very hard for them to imagine that, in the past, there were beings with more knowledge and more intelligence, much greater beings than today's humans. It polarizes people, either utter disbelief, and people say it's impossible, it's not real, or total fascination. Very rarely can someone just look at them dispassionately. Sophia Maleska, a geomorphologist, was sponsored by the Institute of Noetic Sciences to conduct a preliminary study of the ecostones. My wish is that um, archaeologists, both in Peru and abroad, would take the problem seriously enough to examine it in a fresh way, unsullied by all the controversy and the polemic. Neil Steedy, intrigued by Maleska's report, decided to visit the collection himself. I love dinosaurs. I would love to believe that man lived with dinosaurs. I'd love to believe that somebody actually could have a pet brontosaurus or uh, the whole story that we see in Jurassic Park. I mean, what an adventure. I would love to believe that. The story began when a friend gave Dr. Cabrera a stone for his birthday. On it was inscribed the image of a fish. Because of his training as a medical doctor, Dr. Cabrera recognized the fish as a prehistoric species which has long been extinct. He wondered who could have made the inscription. The collection itself is unusual in that you have themes that are not portrayed in other similar collections. There is no civilization that I know of which shows brain transplants, stomach transplants, um, complete blood transfusions and so forth. In this series of stones, according to Dr. Cabrera, we see details of an advanced surgical procedure, a heart transplant. In the first stone, a pregnant woman is reclining with a tube attached to her arm. This tube is removing blood which is passed to a small bottle. The bubbles indicate that a chemical exchange is taking place. According to Dr. Cabrera, a hormone is being filtered out and the blood returned to the patient. This hormone, which only pregnant women have, is an anti-rejection hormone, which naturally prevents the fetus from being rejected. In the last stone of the series, the new heart is irrigated with this hormone and surgically placed into the recipient. It is obvious that these beings were depicting the many technological feats they had achieved such as the unusual flying machines shown in some of these stones. In these stones, ancient pilots are riding in a craft which resembles a bird. In some drawings, these flying machines are hovering over dinosaurs, while the co-pilot seems to be observing the heavens through a telescope. In many of the Ica stones, men seem to be gazing at stars and comets. Dr. Cabrera believes that they were recording the comet which crashed to Earth and caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. They do have a similar art style which makes them look like they all should be grouped together. After collecting and studying these amazing artifacts for almost 30 years, Dr. Cabrera has a fascinating interpretation of what this ancient library means. You can see by the very large brain capacity of the beings depicted in these stones, but they had far greater cognitive ability than we do today. Present day man, who thinks he discover all knowledge, is not as intelligent as the man that appears on these stones. These stones carry a message, a fundamental message left by an advanced race of humans that preceded our own by millions of years. They themselves faced a catastrophic demise and they told their story the only way they could, by inscribing images of their world on stones, teaching the next human race how to live in and take care of this universe. The problem with the reasoning that Dr. Cabrera uses is that he says, the message reads as such, this proves that it is authentic. And the problem with that is there is no scientific reasoning there. We're what we are looking to judge at this moment is the antiquity of the stones. The reading will make no difference as far as proving the antiquity. Proving the age of the Ica stones is more difficult than one might assume. There is no scientific test that can accurately date when a stone was carved. 
If you date the stone itself, what are you dating? The age of the stone. The stone could have been made 20 million years ago. And so the stone will date 20 million years old. So what we are more interested in is the patina that covers the stone. The patina will be the oxidation or the aging that sometimes made up of algaes and not just oxidation, which appears on the surface of the stone. The proof of antiquity is elementary. I did laboratory tests at the University of Lima, the University of Bonn in Germany, and I also sent samples to Joseph E. Blumrich of NASA. All came to the conclusion that the engravings in these stones are covered with an ancient patina, which proves categorically that the stones are ancient. If we have a stone that has this patina and you etch something into it, as is done on the Cabrera stones, that patina is broken on the surface and it is not down in the grooves of the etching. You can pick any stone you want and do whatever analysis you want on it. Neil took two of the stones for further study. Oh, these are the samples? Although there were many artifacts to examine, the most important element in determining their age was missing. The context in which the artifacts were found. El Rio de Ica, the river Ica, several years ago, flooded its banks and washed away a new area, opening the mouth of a cave that no one had ever seen. Some of the treasure hunters of Okukaje discovered the cave and when they went inside, they found thousands of these strange engraved stones. They brought the stones to Ica, and the people of Ica thought, they're not real, they're not authentic, they were made by the farmers. Dr. Cabrera has stated that there was a cave, and in fact that he has been to the cave. He described the interior of the cave and the contents of the cave. Therefore, it has become a very real cave in our discussions. However, what is the evidence of the cave? The only evidence of the cave are not photographs, are not maps, are not pictures, are not drawings. It's Dr. Cabrera's word. Despite Neil's numerous requests to see the cave for himself, Dr. Cabrera refused to reveal its whereabouts. Ojalá. I sincerely hope that no one reveals the location of the cave. I hope with all my soul that it's not found by people looking merely for archaeological treasures. This would be a great mistake. We would lose all the marvelous material that is there now. It would be dispersed around the world and the sense of the messages on these stones would be lost. Dr. Cabrera is understandably very cautious about it, and I think he's right, because only when uh, a team of archaeologists, Peruvian and possibly uh, American or an international team anyway, uh, is ready to go there to check it out, should that be done, because otherwise too much vandalism would, uh, would ensue, and then it would, it would um, cover all the scientific uh, data that might come from a pure find. The desert town of Okukaje has long been known for the grave robbers, or Huacaros, who live there. Neil reasoned that if Huacaros had originally found the cave, maybe they could help. Rumor had it that someone had unearthed a new cache of Ica stones from an ancient burial site in the area. A midnight meeting was arranged. The Huacaros claimed the stones were found beneath the decaying remains of a mummy suggesting they could be at least hundreds of years old. But once again, the context of these artifacts could not be verified. Grave robbers rarely admit the source of their discoveries for fear of arrest. I need some type of hard evidence. We have the artifacts out of context. Not knowing how they were placed in context originally, that is, all the surrounding things that should be with them. Then. We don't have any idea what goes with them. So we have to judge the artifacts by themselves. So to say they're found in a cave is irrelevant. It doesn't matter where they're found. They're now out of a cave, out of context. At the museum in Ica, many remnants of ancient cultures are on display. But noticeably missing from their shelves are inscribed stones. Neil learned why from Peruvian archaeologist Fernando Herrera.
The inscribed stones in the museum are kept away from public view because of the controversy surrounding Dr. Cabrera's Ica stones. Mr. Herrera offered a rare glimpse of these controversial artifacts to his fellow scientists. The authentic stones found in Inca tombs are much lighter and have quite a different flavor to them than do the stones there in Dr. Cabrera's collection. True, they portray for the most part domestic animals and some non-domestic animals of the area, but the style on it is they have a lot finer workmanship on them and the cuts aren't nearly as deep or as brusque as they are on the Cabrera stones. My view is that we have again a very complex picture of a core of ancient stones created by a very sophisticated ancient culture. And then layers upon layers, like strat cultural strata of other cultures who um, just copied what the, the, the ancient peoples did or uh, developed it their own ways. And um, up to quite recently. The investigation seemed to be at an impasse. If no one would reveal the location of the cave, perhaps there was another road to take. Neil's path led to the door of Basilio Achuya. We took these two stones to one of the people that claims to have fabricated the stones for Dr. Cabrera. And by surprise, we showed them and said, do you recognize these? He goes, oh yeah, I did those about 10 years ago among a series of them. And when asking them to describe other stones that he did at that time period, he described the stones that were on either side, above and below, the, these same artifacts. For a long time I was working in the fields, and it was a lot of hard work. When I first saw some of these ceramic pieces of the ancients, I started copying them to sell. Then I saw that it could be done in stone also, so I started looking for soft stones that I could carve on fairly easily. Doing that was much easier than working in the fields. I've brought Dr. Cabrera about 11,000 stones, but he also has some real ones. Do you have any idea how many? I don't know, maybe about 5,000. After speaking to several people in Okukahe, we find that we have quite a few artisans who are claiming to have done many of the major stones, and in fact, as a summation, all of the stones that are in Dr. Cabrera's collection. Dr. Cabrera admits that many of the stones have been faked to sell to tourists. However, he maintains that all the stones in his collection are real. If any fake stones exist today, it is only a recent occurrence. It is only now that they have become famous, now that the whole world, including people of all disciplines, have learned what is inscribed on these stones. But I can easily tell which are real and which are copies by how they are engraved. The engravings on a recent stone, a fake stone, they don't have the patina in the grooves of the stone. This allows us to tell whether the stone is ancient or recent. From what we were told in the field, Dr. Cabrera himself brought drawings out to people and said, this is the drawing I want on the stones. Dr. Cabrera doesn't know the origin of the stones I bring him. He doesn't know I'm making them myself. The whole thing calls for great caution because one has to differentiate very carefully between the core of ancient stones and the, the modern curios that are being done for tourists, basically. The question with the Cabrera stones, of course, is that it has what appears to be a patina on all the outside, except the bottom of the grooves of the carved the grooves on each stone. It should have aged fairly evenly, and it hasn't. For myself, I'm not sorry that I've chosen this difficult path. But I realize that by taking this path, I've brought suffering upon my family. I have hurt them. But when a man comes to hold a certain conviction of the truth he has discovered, he must defend it. Defend it even to the death, if necessary. Mine wouldn't be the only case in history. 
the case of Javier Cabrera. There are many, many parallels throughout the history of science. It is true, of course, that I can be judged as a man who preferred science to his own children. Pero, but I know that there will be a day when my children's pain will turn to happiness. You can never have such happiness if you haven't gone through the pain of defending the truth. I'd buy that if you can show me the evidence. You can tie me up so that I can take no notes. You can blindfold me. You can hold me at gunpoint all the way there. Take as long as you want to to get there so that I can't remember which turns as I'm blindfolded or whatever. I will put my life in your hands and then when we get there, you undo my eyes, I take some pictures, and then I leave immediately and I will analyze the pictures. But that couldn't be done. Why couldn't it be done? I never got a good answer. Of course, I think the obvious answer, and I have come to believe the obvious answer, is that there is no cave. Until we go back to the source, the origin of the Ica stones, we won't ever know for sure. And uh, I feel that the scientific establishment uh, need to take them seriously enough to mount an expedition and go there. The Acambaro figurines are said to have been found at the foot of a mountain and the Ica stones found in a cave. Their sources may never be revealed and the authenticity of these collections never proven. But if anomalous evidence is simply ignored, valuable knowledge about the history of man may be lost forever. Very recently, I was speaking with, to a couple of colleagues at a convention, and the colleagues were asking, why would anyone waste their time doing this type of stuff? And the answer to those colleagues simply is, because you won't. Someone needs to. Someone needs to be not afraid to go into the stuff that is controversial. And to my colleagues, I'd like to say, don't be afraid. It doesn't hurt. The other philosophy of, of government is based on creation, which says laws come from the creator, rights are unalienable, and the government should be limited. It's called a republic. One they've got in there now is called Australopithecus afarensis. That was proven wrong in 18, I mean in 1973. 30 years ago, proven wrong. Why are they keeping that in the textbooks as evidence for evolution? They've got Australopithecus africanus, or afarensis, better known as Lucy. How many have ever heard of Lucy before? Donald Johansson found Lucy in 1974, Ethiopia. He had gone there with a grant to look for missing links. Somebody gave him some money, said, here, go find a missing link. If you don't find one, no more money. Two weeks before his grant money expired, he discovered Lucy. Highly motivated, I suspect. And that would be a suspect, by the way, in a court of law, you know. Lucy was three feet tall. It was obviously a chimpanzee of some kind. But yet you have articles in the magazines all the time, you know, about evolution. Where are we going? I can tell you that. You're going straight to hell if you don't accept Christ. Now, the bones of the skull were crushed thoroughly. Could not tell anything about the skull. But when they put it together for your kid's textbook, they can make it half human, half ape. They named it Lucy because they were listening to the song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Very popular back then which, by the way, has the initials LSD, which they must have been on when they found this thing. But uh, the knee joint that was labeled Lucy's knee in National Pornographic, uh, Geographic was actually found a mile and a half away and 200 feet deeper. But National Geographic labeled it Lucy's knee. It's not Lucy's knee. It's a mile and a half away, for heaven's sake, okay? There's quite a controversy about that knee joint still. But this, the knee joint is the best evidence they have that Lucy was becoming a human. Because an ape has the lower and upper leg that are in a straight line with each other. A human leg goes up to your knee and angles off to the side because your hips are wider than your knees. Lucy's knee angled off to the side, the femur angled. And Donald said, see, that proves she's becoming a human. No, any monkey that climbs trees has an angled femur. What he found was a tree climbing monkey. It's not proof it's becoming a human. He said, well, the bones are slightly bigger than a regular ape. Well, that's true. That doesn't prove it's becoming a human. The bones of a Clydesdale are slightly bigger than a regular horse. That doesn't prove it's becoming a truck, for heaven's sake, okay? What he found was a heavy-duty chimpanzee, and probably the pre-flood chimpanzees and everything was probably more heavy-duty. 
If they're living longer, much healthier, that's all he found. There are big horses and little horses today, by the way. St. Louis Zoo put human feet on their Lucy display. Not one foot bone or hand bone was found. Not one. Every other australopithecine that's been found has curled toes. Professor Menton at Washington University said, the statue is a complete misrepresentation. That's a big fancy word for lie. I prefer, I prefer smaller words. It's a lie. The zoo director said, zoo officials have no plans to knuckle under. We cannot be updating every exhibit based on every new piece of evidence. We look at the overall exhibit and the impression it creates, and we think this impression it creates is correct. Uh, Bruce, are you telling me you would lie to kids coming through your zoo just to get an impression across to them that evolution is true? You mean your theory is more important than the facts? That's exactly correct. They will lie to the kids going through these science centers and zoos to make them believe this evolution theory. And there are lies in the textbooks, like 60 of them. We cover that on video number four, lies in the textbooks. In Africa, they found perfectly normal human footprints in a layer of ash that had turned to stone. Perfectly normal human footprints. But the footprints were in ash, supposed to be three and three quarter million years old. They studied the footprints and said, wow, these footprints are exactly the same as ours today. Russell Tuttle, University of Chicago, studied the footprints carefully. He went and found a place where people never wear shoes. They never wear shoes, ever. And he studied their footprints. He had them run through the mud, walk through the mud, you know, jog through the mud, trot, skip. He said the footprints of these people that never wear shoes are exactly like the footprints found in Laetoli, Africa. Identical. And then he said, if the Laetoli footprints were not known to be so old, we would conclude they were made by a member of our own genus. In other words, if we didn't know better, we would think a human made these. Well, how do you know better? Oh, because the rock is too old. This is an example of where the evolution theory is a hindrance to common sense and to scientific research. It's one of the greatest hindrances to science. It's not part of science. It's counterproductive to science. The National Geographic put human ape, human ape like mixture features on these uh, creatures walking through this ash. Now keep in mind, not one bone was found. No bones are found. If you find perfectly normal human footprints, what would justify you putting dark-skinned, ape-like creatures walking there on your drawing? And if I was African-American, I'd get upset that they always use dark skin on the missing links. Like there's some kind of, you know, darker skin is less evolved. <laughs> That's what they're trying to imply here. And why did they add this toe separation? Notice the big toe is separated away from the rest of them on the picture. They did it on purpose because it's a real serious problem going from an ape-like foot to a human foot. Apes have a toe that sticks off to the side like a thumb. That's so they can grab a, tr a tree branch and hang by their back feet. You can't do that. Okay? If you want to practice it, I'd suggest you start on a low branch for practice, okay? Because <laughs> you're going to hurt your head. But here they have four million years of bipedalism, and they gave every one of these so-called missing links human feet. Because the foot is a serious problem for the evolutionist. Charles Oxnard studied Lucy and said, the bones of Lucy represent an animal that is not in the line of humans. It's not a missing link. He did a computer multivariant analysis of the bones, okay? There could be these creatures, the little ape-like creatures that walk upright, still alive in Sumatra today. Lucy may represent an animal that is still alive. Peking man was used for years as evidence for evolution. Everything disappeared during World War II. But they found a cave with a bunch of crushed monkey skulls in there. The skull had been smashed, and they found a bunch of human tools. And so some brilliant scientist said, wow, these monkeys are learning to make tools. Oh, and they're practicing on their head. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good one. Let's keep that one right over here. Well, duh. They didn't tell anybody they found 10 normal humans in the same cave, skeletons of humans. See, in some cultures, they like to eat monkey brains. You ever seen Indiana Jones? Mm -hmm. They just found a cave where they were eating monkeys. That's where they had their feasts or something. It's not a missing link. Homo erectus is still in the textbooks. Homo erectus used to be called Java man. Then they changed it to Pithecanthropus erectus and now called Homo erectus. It was found by Dr. Dubois, a Dutch anatomist, who went to Indonesia purposely to try to find missing links. He hired a bunch of prison convicts to go dig for him. He wasn't even there when they found it. What they found was an ape's skull cap, three human teeth, and a thigh bone found a year later, 50 feet away. Dubois put them all together and said, we have a missing link here. 
You don't even know those animal bones go together. Three teeth, thigh bone, and a skull cap from an ape. This was also going to be used in 1925 as evidence for evolution at the Scopes Monkey Trial. The Java Man. The famous anatomist uh, Virchow said, In my opinion, this creature is, a, is an animal, a giant gibbon. In fact, the thigh bone has not the slightest connection with the skull. Dubois hid the fact that he found two human skulls in the same area. He put those under his bed, under the floor. Like Edgar Allan Poe, you know, Telltale Heart, only this was Telltale Head. But there's no evidence of how man evolved at all. Fossil evidence for evolution for uh, humans is fragmentary. Fossil evidence of chimpanzee evolution is absent altogether. There is no evidence of how chimpanzees evolved. But yet you have articles in the magazines all the time, you know, about evolution. Where are we going? I can tell you that. You're going straight to hell if you don't accept Christ. It's real simple. That's a no-brainer. In Skull, they were going to have a big display of the Orc Man. Orce, O-R-C-E, the Orce Man. They were going to put the, have a big you know, party for the Orce Man they discovered until they discovered it's actually a piece of a skull fragment from a donkey four months old. That was going to be the missing link. A dolphin's rib had been labeled as human collarbone in the museum for a long time. So somebody said, oh, that's a dolphin's rib. That's not a human collarbone. The Hobbit was just found here in 19, or 2004. The Hobbit was a little bitty, tiny human, probably a result of uh, secondary microcephaly dwarfism. Just a normal human, about three and a half feet tall. There are people like that today running around the planet. Okay? There's a good book on the so-called cavemen, if you want to read this, if you're being taught this in school. Get the book by Marvin Lubenow, Bones of Contention. Excellent book. It'll really put everything into perspective for you. The only missing link I can find is up between these guys' ears. You know, something is missing. Somebody's professors spend all their free time digging in the dirt looking for bones. My dog does the same thing. But we don't make the taxpayers pay his salary while he does it. Yes, one was addressed to Ephesus, but they were all supposed to read and learn from it. Another was addressed to, you see, you follow me? Churches is in the plural, which means, he that, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, plural. They're all supposed to watch all of them. You got it? So there must be lessons there appropriate to the churches in general. And we can suspect that since there are seven churches, in some sense, they embrace all churches. Once you learn those seven letters in depth, you can profile every church in terms of percentages. Every church has some elements of all seven letters, even the uncomplimentary ones. But different churches, love you, they're, oh, this one, they're 70%. X and only 10% Y. You, know, you follow what I'm saying? The, the, the seven become a sevenfold space in which you can map any church. Some good, some bad. They're all there. So it's important to understand. They're report cards. Okay. But this phrase also says, He that hath an ear. How many of you in this room have an earlobe? Can I see a show of hands? <laughs> then this letter, these letters, all of them are written to you. I know Philadelphia is written to me. But no, what about the others? Okay. <laughs> Okay, so they're homiletic, that is they're personally, they're, uh, uh, they're intended for personal application. This is not something I'm contriving, that's embraced in the very language of the letters. We tend to overlook it because they're addressed to a particular church. No, it's addressed to the church you're going to, whichever it is, in some degree, and it's also addressed to you personally, personally. So you see why this becomes the most important part of the entire book, okay? But now there's a fourth part that I hope you will take it skeptically at first, but I'm going to suggest before it's over, you may be absolutely stunned with the next one. And that is, these seven letters will outline a profile of 2,000 years of church history. You say, Chuck, that's speculation. Yes, it is. It's conjecture, in part. But you'll be able to make your own conclusions before we're through. But I'll put this right up front. If the letters were in any other order, that wouldn't be true. In the order that they're in, once you understand them, they lay out the history of the church on the planet Earth. Now, I know some people say, well, the church, you know, the old story about the, the, uh, the elder that comes to the pastor says, they're chewing gum in the sanctuary. The pastor says, no, no, the sanctuaries are chewing gum. In other words, we are. And yes, the church... You know, we're, we're the temple of God and all that. Yes, but here the term church is being used for these geographical churches. Churches as we tend to use the term, not as buildings, but as uh, assemblies, 
that are in various locations. Okay. Okay. Now, is there a prophetic profile? We've got Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And I'm going to suggest before it's over that each one of these churches have a, not only a history, a future. And that future is reflected in the letters in a way that's astonishing. The more you know about this, the more astonishing it'll become. So that's my challenge to you, because between now and next session, I want you to read, your general assignment is to read the entire book of Revelation between each meeting. It's not that long, don't, bur don't groan. But I certainly want you to read chapters 2 and 3, all, both chapters, before next session, for some reasons. But I want you to really understand the first seven verses of chapter 2. But we'll get you're going to discover that each of the seven letters has seven, how many, how many design elements would be in each letter? Make a guess. Seven. Good guess. Good guess. The name of the church will turn out to be meaningful to the letter. What a coincidence. <laughs> the title Christ uses of himself is relevant to the letter. Not when you first read it, when you understand the letter and you go back, you realize Jesus chose of the many titles of himself, he picks the one that particularly relates to the problems in that church. You follow me? There is, it's a report card. There's a commendation. You did these things well. Well done here, 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 and here. Great. Good. good well done. Then he has the concerns. Whoops. You got to work on this area or that area. It's a report card. Then there's an exhortation. It's obviously consistent with that. Here's what I want you to do. Here's your remedial assignment, right? And then there's a promise to the overcomer. Each letter has this little, uh, you know, promise to the overcomer. The overcomer will get this or that, some, something special. Each one's different. Each one, seven different ones. And then he has this, clo this peculiar closing, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. These seven elements are the seven basic elements of all seven letters. Here's the thing that makes it a little complicated. You'll discover that in the first three letters, the close... The promise to the overcomer is not in the letter, it's in a postscript. It comes after the letter is finished. That's kind of weird. And it's consistent in the first three letters. Why? In the last four letters, the promise to the overcomer is in the body of the letter. What's that got to do with anything? Um, you'll also discover two of the letters have nothing good said about them. <gasps> Whoops. Two of the letters have nothing bad said about them. That's wild. But here's the important part. Every one of the recipients of all seven was surprised. The guys that thought they were doing well weren't. The guys that thought they weren't doing well were. And the lesson is that we don't really have the ability to second guess our own report card. Let's find out what, how Christ's report card reads of our church, or more specifically, us personally. That's why we're going to get into this with some <coughs> substance. So we have these churches' report cards, seven of them, and uh, we'll talk about each of the names, and we'll talk about each of the uh, um, titles that Christ uses. Each one's different, and we'll go through each one of these, and we'll also obviously deal with the structure when we get there. Now, to just back up and wrap it up, the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed, and the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. The Old Testament closes with unfulfilled prophecies, unappeased longings and so forth. The Old Testament is incomplete in itself. And what it lacks is right there in, in the New Testament. And we believe it's prophetic. Over 8,000, according to one categorization by J. Parton Bain, his Encyclopedia of Biblical Prophecy, he catalogs over 8,000 predictive verses in the Bible on almost 2,000 predictions on over 700 different matters. And we live in a day where there are major themes unfolding. Israel, Jerusalem, the Temple, Babylon, Russia or Magog, the rise of China, the European superstate, ecumenicalism, the move towards the global government, the rise of the occult. These are all trends that are clearly converging to a climax, and each one of them is mappable in terms of Bible prophecy. And that's why I always like to throw this up as a challenge. One last challenge. You've heard me before, but I'll put it up again. And if you accept the challenge I put on the screen, you flunk the course. I want you to skeptically attack or challenge this preposterous assertion that you and I are being plunged into a period of time about which 
The Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in history, including the time that Jesus walked the shores of Galilee or climbed the mountains of Judea. That's absurd. More than the gospel period? Yes. I believe you and I are, going to be, are, are being plunged into a period of time. The Bible says more than it does even about the gospel period. Now, to challenge that audacious statement, you've got to do two things. You've got to find out what the Bible says, not what Chuck Missler says or your favorite prophecy club or whatever, what the Bible says. Find out what it says, part one. Part two, used to be hard, not today. Find out what's going on. You won't on the 10 o'clock news, even on Fox News. You've got to do better than that. Find out what's really happening on the Internet, talk radio, proprietary news. There's all kinds of ways, all kinds of resources available. Find out what the Bible says, find out what's going on. And the more you know about the Bible and the more you know about what's really going on in the world, the more you'll can observe the convergence of these things into the ultimate climax. But the ultimate issue is that you and I are, in fact, in possession of a message of extraterrestrial origin. We'll see that manifestly in the book of Revelation. It portrays us as both the participants and the objects of an unseen and invisible cosmic warfare. Whether you know it or not, you are in it, in the middle of it. You're on enemy turf tonight. And our, yours and mine, your eternal destiny and mine depends on our relationship with the ultimate victor in that conflict. But I peeked ahead. We win. <laughs> and where do, you, where do you stand with respect to him? That's what it's really all about. Now for the next session, here are your assignments. Read the entire book. It's not that book. And I want you to, by rereading it, rereading it, grasp the, the, an overview. of it. It's really a symphony. It's very uh, interwoven. Examine chapters 2 and 3, because that's going to be the primary uh, area of inquiry over the next few sessions. Outline the first seven verses of chapter 2 if you can. I've given you the outline. I've given you seven elements. Structure them. Just, just write out the verses, but part, part, uh, you know, partition them in terms of those seven elements. And, you, and as I'm asking you to summarize the Ephesians, which is the first of the seven letters, the, book of the, the letter to the church at Ephesus. Summarize their report card. And we'll go into Acts 20 and some other background as we look at that next time. Acts 20, you want to read Acts 20, verses 16 through 38. That was the middle to the end of the chapter. And you may also want to take a look at Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. It's one of the most rewarding of all the epistles. Sometimes when I'm in an airport and I've got a few minutes before the plane goes, and I'm not sure what else to do, I'll just pop my Bible and read the book of Ephesians. There's a couple I use. That's, just, that's right up there. Because I know no matter what my mind's been on, what other hassles I've had, that pulls me out of it, and it is so high-flying. It is so awesome. And there are so many subtle surprises in that book, that letter. So I encourage you, six chapters is no big deal. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Where are the lampstands in chapter 1 right now? In, this, in the imagery of, the, of, of, of chapter 1. Where are they? On the earth. You got it. You're going to find them in heaven in chapter 4. Many people overlook that. It's not a big proof. I'll show you some other things that make it more con conclusive. But just understand the consistency here. And the seven lampstands represent... Why lampstands? Because they are light bearers. What's the church's mission? To bear the light. The Israel was supposed to bear the light. That's why the menorah is today the symbol of Israel. Not the star of David on their flag. That's an emblem. Fine. The official symbol of the state of Israel is the menorah. The seven branch candlestick. Why? Well, for lots of reasons, not the least of which, it represents their mission to be a light to the world. They were intended to be the proclaimers of the, of the, of the Creator and the Redeemer. Here we have seven lampstands, seven churches. Are there more than seven churches? Of course, there are dozens of churches. One of the assignments I want you to think about between now and the next session, why these seven? If you're a student, I'd have you make a list of the churches in the New Testament that are not. You'll come to 20 or 30 of them that aren't mentioned. Where's the church in Jerusalem? The church at Rome? The church at Antioch was the primary base camp for the proclamation of the gospel of the Gentiles. Not mentioned here. And you're gonna, you mentioned, you'll, you'll think of a lot. Lister, Derby, there's a bunch of them. Why these seven? We'll talk about that. Okay. Seven churches, the things which are. Why these seven? Each letter has a peculiar phrase in it. There's one phrase, only one phrase, that occurs in each of the seven letters. It's a closing phrase to the letter. 
He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. By the time you go through chapters 2 and 3, you'll be tired of hearing that, so to speak. Okay? Because it's there on every letter. There, I'm going to suggest to you, for your own confirmation, you figure it out for yourself, but there are four levels of interpretation or application of these seven letters. Father, we just praise you for who you are. We thank you that in your kingdom there are no accidents, no coincidences, that we're all here right now by your divine appointment. We do pray, Father, that your purpose would be accomplished in each of our lives. We do pray, Father, that as we enjoy this incredible tour de force that we call the book of Revelation, we thank you for its edification. We thank you for its excitement. We thank you for its majesty. But above all, we thank you for Jesus Christ. And we we pray, Father, as we enter the seven letters that you would use them to speak to each of us personally, individually. Help us to understand those seven report cards. And thus, Father, help us to repair our own, that we each might be more fruitful stewards and above all, more pleasing in your sight as we commit ourselves into your hands in the name of him which was and is and shall be forevermore. Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, our King of kings and Lord of lords, in whose name we do pray. Amen. God. philosophies, two choices, one decision, you decide. Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, I had the uh, great pleasure of uh, appearing here last year in a similar format, although last year's format was, was where the questions were already decided. This time it's more of an open forum. Um, so we don't really have anything worked out. I thought I would just uh, start off by talking a little bit about evolution, what evolutionary theory is. Um, I brought with me some overheads, and uh, you may hear uh, Dr. Hoven, for example, be referred to as a creationist. Um, we also talk about creation science, which is an attempt to prove creation uh, using scientific method, uh, those sorts of things. Um, what I brought here is sort of a comparison of the two models. Scientific creation model, which says that the universe, the earth, and life on the earth were created by supernatural processes. The universe and all its contents were created simultaneously about 10,000 years ago. Biological change um, since the creation has occurred within created kinds of plants and animals. And the fossil and geologic records are the result of a worldwide catastrophe of a hydraulic nature, specifically the biblical flood. The evolution model, on the other hand, states that the universe, the earth, and life on the earth evolved by testable natural processes. Let's see if I can get that centered. Uh, number two, the universe and all its contents evolved over time. The universe is about 15 billion years old, the earth 4.5 billion, and life on earth about 4 billion. Uh, changes occurred within species, and new species evolve from existing species. Uh, and number four, the fossil and geological records are the evidence for billions of years of systematic change. Well, let's talk about evolution. And let me, let me, let me see, uh, uh, it's kind of hard for me to see, it's dark here, but how many of you really know what evolution means? The definition of evolution. 
If you're absolutely positive, you know what it means. Let me give you my definition of evolution, and one which a lot of biologists, anthropologists, chemists, physicists, all sorts of people of a scientific nature, uh, uh, how they use the term. Uh, but I'll just, I'll just give you my definition. This is a definition I give my students in class when we sit down. Uh, evolution is specifically a change in the gene pool in a population over time. It's that simple. It's a genetic change over time. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you in this room tonight are exact carbon copies of your parents? Anyone? Raise your hand if you're an exact carbon copy of your parents. Do you know why not? It's because from one generation to the next, and if I use this room as our population, a population is a group of organisms. Okay? If I use this audience as our population, we could, we could, we could perform a little test uh, for evolution. And we could see whether or not the genes, right, your genetic makeup, what makes you you, are the same from one generation to the next. And if they're not, according to my definition of evolution, a change in gene frequencies in a population over time, that is from one generation to the next, if the genes have changed from one generation to the next, my definition of evolution is correct. If you're not a carbon copy of your parents, that means you have different genes. In fact, everybody in this audience is a combination of the genes of their parents. All right? Your mothers and fathers got together and bore a child, either male or female, and that child has half of the genes from his or her mother and half of the genes from his or her father. It's that simple. We're combinations of our parents. Siblings work out the same way. With the exception of identical twins, even siblings aren't exact copies of each other. You know, brothers and sisters don't turn out to be exactly the same. Well, we talk about this in terms of microevolution. And, you know, I've heard Mr. Hovind say before that, you know, microevolution, I don't think he really has a problem with that because, after all, they're going to talk about changes within kinds of animals. Noah took on the ark two of each kind of animal. Two dog kind, two cat kind, two uh, ungulate kind, you know, those sorts of creatures. Well, they have to explain if Noah took two of each kind on the ark, how then do we get the diversity of species that we see today? Why do we have so many different kinds of dogs? Why do we have Dobermans and Dachshunds? And I've got a chow at home, right? Different kinds of dogs. Well, that's microevolution. It's what we consider to be a change within a species. In fact, um, one of the other things that I teach my students is that we can see human evolution sort of in process. Let me ask you another question. Um, how many people in here were born or, or have all 32 of their human teeth? Anybody still have all 32 teeth, including all of your wisdom teeth? You, know, you younger folks probably don't have your wisdom teeth yet. You're only going to have 28 teeth, okay? Uh, as long as you have your adult teeth. Anybody in here had to have their wisdom teeth removed, taken out? Come on, raise your hands. Don't be shy. We can put our hands up. I had my wisdom teeth out. Why do humans have problems with third molar, wisdom teeth? Why do we have to have them removed? And what happens to you if you have problems with them and you don't have them taken out? What happens if they get impacted, infected, if they grow in crooked? You can get very sick from it. You can die from it. Well, you know, that seems like an imperfect design. We put a design flaw in the system. We're going to make an organism that has too many teeth for its mouth. In fact, it has so many teeth for its mouth that it's going to have problems with them. And if you don't have access to modern medicine, fortunately we do, we can go to the dentist, and the dentist can put braces on our teeth, or the dentist can pull some teeth. Right, I had to go to an oral surgeon. It was really nasty. I had to go in there and cut my jaw open and take out my teeth. And in fact, they severed my mandibular nerve while they did it, so I have a dead spot in my lower jaw from it. When we look at human evolution, and one of the things that I will encourage you to do tonight, I brought along some, some fossil casts of some of what I consider to be our human ancestors. Okay? And I'm going to lay them out on this table, and I encourage you all to come up and look at them. I'll ask that you be careful with them, because 
They're, they're kind of expensive, and uh, you know, I don't want them to get broken, but, but feel free to come up and look at them. In fact, I'll be pointing out some features tonight on some of these casts. When we look, for example, at a human ancestor uh, a million years ago, we find that they had 32 teeth. They had tremendously large faces. One of the things that we'll probably come up tonight is the issue of transitional fossils. They'll say to me, Dr. Hartman, if, if, if evolution is true, then we should see change. We should see evolutionary change over time, represented in the fossils that we have. I can show it to you. I've got it on overheads. I brought in some of the skulls. How many of you people in here have actually seen a real human skull before? Skull of an early hominid, an early human. I've got some to show you tonight. If you haven't ever seen them, I encourage you to look at them. One of the things we realize is that earlier humans had smaller brains and larger faces. Larger faces had plenty of room in there for all 32 teeth. Over time, one of the changes that's occurred in humans is that our brains have gotten larger. In fact, they're tremendously large today. Human beings have the largest brain to body weight ratio of any animal on the planet. Not the largest brain. I mean, a blue whale has a, a, a much larger brain than humans do. But blue whales also have tremendously large bodies. They need a huge brain to control that huge body. We made room for that large brain, the expansion of our cranium, the upper part of our skull, through a reduction in the size of our face. Our faces have been getting smaller, and I'll lay out a series of fossils for you to look at. And you'll see some of the earliest ones that we have have really large faces and really small brains. Dr. Hovind may tell you that, well, that's just a glorified chimpanzee, but I will point out to you the differences between humans and chimpanzees, and I even have an ape skull that you can look at, so you can see for yourself, and show you why I think that this fossil that I have is more human than it is ape. Well, over time, the faces have gotten smaller, the cranium have gotten larger, the brain has gotten larger. Well, our faces are getting smaller, that's crowding our teeth. In fact, within the last uh, 100,000 years ago, we start to see humans, not just in the fossil record, but, you know, I also do quite a bit of archaeology. I'm one of the guys that goes out there and, and digs up the remains of dead people. And I've seen hundreds of them. And we see in the archaeological record that this is not a unique problem to modern humans. This is ever since we became modern humans. People have been having trouble with their teeth. And it's because of this. Ordinarily, we talk about people that have problems with their teeth being uh, in trouble from an evolutionary perspective. I mean, if you die, you're not successful. Well, we're pretty successful. Um, there are currently, what, six billion people on the planet today? We're one of the most prolific species on the planet. One of the other things that I'll talk about briefly, is where we fit in the animal world. Brought in a little chart. This is a, a, what we call a taxonomic system, how we categorize different things in the animal world. One of the things, by the way, that I will challenge Dr. Hovind to do tonight is to give me a definition of kind. I will ask him to do that, and I hope he will be able to provide you with a definition of kind. What, what constitutes a kind? Because I can talk about species. I am a homo sapien, genus species. Homo, genus, species, sapien. means wise human. We got to do the naming, so we got to say that we're wise humans. In fact, to the subspecies, we consider ourselves homo sapien sapiens, really wise humans. Boy, we're at the top of the ladder, aren't we? By the way, I don't believe that we're at the top of the ladder. Okay? In the taxonomic system, we name things. We identify things based on where they fit. The kingdom, well, we're all animals, so we're in the animal kingdom. Phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Genus, homo, species, sapien. Did you all know, I'll give you another fact to, to, to dwell upon. I know my time is almost up here that humans and chimpanzees share 98.2% of their genetic material. That's an interesting concept. There's more relatedness, more genetic relatedness between a human and a chimpanzee than there is between an African and an Indian elephant. 
And yet when we look at them, we have no difficulty saying those are both elephants. When we look at a human and a chimpanzee, we have no difficulty saying one is an animal and one is a human being. Genetically, they're not that different. In fact, there's a difference in matter of chromosomes. And let me tell you right now, chimpanzees have an extra set of chromosomes. So don't let anybody tell you that complexity is dependent on how many chromosomes you have. Because dogs and plants, some plants have hundreds of chromosomes. That doesn't make them more complex than human beings, just makes them different. won't get into a lot of other similarities. We don't have a whole lot of time to dwell on that. One of the other things I want to bring up tonight is that there are an awful lot of Christians out there, out here in the world, who don't really have a problem with evolutionary theory. In fact, you didn't see anything in my theory that says there is no God. Don't let anybody tell you that because you are an evolutionist, because you believe in evolution, you must also be an atheist. That's not correct. The Catholic Church doesn't have a problem with evolution. The Lutheran Church doesn't have a problem with evolution. The Jewish Congress doesn't have a problem with evolution. Presbyterians, Methodists, I'm married to a Southern Baptist who is also an anthropologist. She is one of the most ardent believers in God and in Jesus Christ, and she doesn't have a problem with evolution. There does not have to be a conflict. Now, some of you are rolling your eyes. In fact, the guy at the timetable is rolling his eyes at me. Where does it say in my theory that there is no God? I don't see it anywhere. I'm not going to stand up here and tell you there is or isn't. I believe that someone's faith is a very personal thing. It's not my job to convince you that I'm necessarily right. In fact, if you walked in here completely disbelieving evolution, great. I have to stop now. Um, I'll turn it over to Dr. Hoven. Well, it's an honor to be here tonight. My name is Kent Hovind. I taught high school science for 15 years. Now for the last 10 years, I've been in evangelism, and I travel around and speak on the subject of creation, evolution, and dinosaurs. Even my website, drdino.com, shows our great love for dinosaurs around our ministry. I, I appreciate uh, Dr. Hartman coming tonight. It is surprisingly difficult to find an opponent to debate on this topic, and I'm, I'm very much honored that he would be willing to come tonight. Um, it appears to me, after speaking on this topic for 10 years, that uh, the ones who believe in evolution generally want to stand in front of their freshman class where they have the academic and psychological advantage, and they don't want to take on somebody on a level playing field where they can answer their questions. So I'm going to share with you tonight the two different views, and I appreciate what he said, and I would have to agree with everything he gave in his two definitions of the two different uh, theories, creation and evolution, with one minor exception that uh, I would have to dis differ with him on. The Bible teaches very clearly that God made the world in six days, and he did it about 6,000 years ago. He said up to 10,000 years ago. Well, maybe so, I don't know. But certainly the dates in the Bible add up to about 6,000. And then 4,400 years ago, there was a worldwide flood, and a fellow named Noah built a big boat and saved all the animals on board. This is the biblical view of history. The evolutionist view says 20 billion years ago, some say 15, some say 12, the numbers vary, but a long time ago, there was a big bang. They don't know what exploded, but they think there was a big bang. And then 4.6 billion years ago, some say 4.5, the earth cooled down and formed. And this, as it cooled down, it began to rain on the rocks for millions of years and turned them into soup. And the soup came alive about 3 to 4 billion years ago. This is basically the evolution theory. The Bible warned us to beware about science that is falsely so called. I like science. Don't accuse me of being against science. The word science means knowledge, things that we know by observation or testing or demonstration. It is my contention that there is absolutely nothing about evolution that is scientific. And I'll give you the six different meanings of the word evolution in a minute. But five of them are purely religious. There is no scientific evidence for them at all. And we offer a quarter of a million dollars at our ministry for somebody who can give real empirical testable evidence for evolution. I think kids are being brainwashed. They lose their faith. One professor said he was at 15, became a Christian, joined the Southern Baptist Church, Loved Jesus, but we went to University of Alabama, where I spoke yesterday. He lost his faith. Some professor got him to doubt God's Word. A actually, 75% of kids that go from Christian homes to secular universities will end up losing their faith by the end of their freshman year. Evolution is a religion. 
It violates the obvious first and second laws of thermodynamics. It does not explain where matter comes from, where energy comes from, where the laws come from. It does not explain how things get better without an input of enormous amount of energy and an intelligent force to organize the energy. It's a total violation of the known laws of science. It gives time, space, and matter the same character traits that we give to God, able to create things. It, it, I'm sorry, it just evolution, uh, I think, is a, is, a, is a dud of a theory. It requires faith in all sorts of things. It requires faith that life can come from non-living matter. Nobody's ever seen that. It requires faith that an animal can produce a different kind of animal. Nobody's ever seen that happen. Members who no longer believe are excommunicated, just like any other religion. If a professor at the University of Little Rock stood up in front of his class and said, students, I no longer believe in evolution. I believe creation is true. There is a l good chance that he, people would try to get him fired from his position. Dean Kenyon at Stanford University, they tried to fire him. He was a 20-year tenured professor of biology. He wrote books on evolution. But as soon as he got converted and began to be became a creationist, they fired him. He sued him. They finally reinstated him as a lab assistant, which is what college seniors do only because he believed in creation. Last week I sat in the living room of Robert Gentry who worked at Oak Ridge Laboratories in Knoxville, Tennessee. He wrote major articles for magazines like Science and Nature, published all sorts of articles in major science magazines until they discovered he was a creationist and his funding was shut off at the spigot instantly. Call him up, Robert Gentry, he's got a website, halos.com, H-A-L-O-S, and he'll be glad to talk to you about it. There are case after case where people are excommunicated because they no longer hold the faith of evolution. It is a religion. Only members in good standing are considered worthy of judgment. So if you don't believe in evolution, therefore you can't be a scientist, therefore all scientists believe in evolution. They define the terms, and of course, if we're under those ground rules, of course they're going to win the war in, in that, that situation. It att evolution attempts to provide basic answers to the questions of life. Who are we? Why are we here? Where did we come from? Where are we going when we die? It is a religion. It deifies nature. Gaia hypothesis and evolution, those words are always capitalized, capital E. It's a religion. Majority opinion is somehow considered proof that it happened. I hear this all the time when I do debates. It's like, well, everybody believes in evolution. Oh, well, first place, not everybody believes it. Second place, even if everybody did, that's not proof that it happened. And these professors, and I'd appreciate Dr. Hartman coming tonight, but I'll tell you, the vast majority, you told me you asked quite a few to come tonight and they wouldn't do it. We probably get a thousand to one refuse to debate as opposed to the, the few that will come debate. And I certainly appreciate the opportunity tonight. Uh, Darwin, when he was 22 years old, graduated from Bible college to be a preacher. He set sail on board the Beagle in 1831. As he sailed around, he came to the Galapagos Islands and he noticed there were 14 different varieties of finches based upon their beak shape. Charlie concluded that probably all the finches had a common ancestor. I bet you're right, Charlie. It was a bird. And then he concluded that this probably proves the birds and the bananas are related. Charlie said in his book on page 170, it is a truly wonderful fact that all plants and all animals throughout all time and space should be related to each other. Would, would I be quoting this correctly to say that he is claiming that the birds and the bananas are related? I don't want to put any words into his mouth, but that is what he's saying, isn't it? Everything is related. See, what Charlie observed is called microevolution. And the whole argument here tonight is going to be over the definition of this word evolution. The kids, I think, are being deceived by the slippery definition of that word. Microevolution says dogs produce a variety of dogs. Roses produce a variety of roses. Folks, that's a fact. It happens. The Bible said it would happen. Ten times in the first chapter, God said the plants and animals will bring forth after their kind. And I think because of the Genesis definition here, if it's able to reproduce, it's the same kind. But you asked for a definition of kind, I gave you one. I think if it's able to reproduce, a dog and a wolf are capable of reproducing. They're the same kind of animal. Now they're classified as different species, but they are the same kind of animal. This word evolution has lots of different meanings. There's cosmic evolution, that's the Big Bang. Some people say, that's not what's in the books. Oh, I, I taught science 15 years. Trust me, it's in there, folks. The textbook says 18 to 20 billion years ago, there was a Big Bang. This is a vital part of their theory to explain where matter comes from. And then you'd have to have chemical evolution. If the Big Bang produced hydrogen and helium, how do we get the other 92, uh, 90 elements? We see carbon decay, potassium decays to argon, uranium decays to lead. All the evidence we see is for things decaying without an enormous amount of input of energy. In stars, under intense pressure and heat, maybe higher elements can be created for a few moments. But where did the energy come from? 
There'd have to be a long period of chemical evolution. Then you'd have to have stellar and planetary evolution. The stars would have to evolve. Nobody's ever seen one star form. We've seen lots of them blow up, but nobody's ever seen one form. So the evidence is against this stage of evolution. Then we'd have organic evolution. That's the origin of life. Nobody's ever seen non-living material come alive. This is not part of science. It's part of what they believe in. It's a religious worldview. Textbooks teach 4.6 billion years ago, the earth cooled down. Millions of years of rains created great oceans. This is what the books say. I'm not making this up. I collect the books. I have hundreds of them. Millions of years of rains created great oceans. This one says, swirling in the waters of the oceans is a bubbling broth of complex chemicals. Progress from a complex chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. <laughs> well, I guess it is. Totally stopped. Doesn't happen at all. That's how slow it is. This one says, the first self-replicating systems must have emerged in this organic soup. This is a college textbook. So basically, the evolutionists believe that the humans, the birds, the crocodiles, all had a common ancestor. Now, they're welcome to believe that. Honestly, I don't care what they believe. But I'm sick and tired of them using my tax dollars to spread this kind of propaganda in our school system when it's not science. <laughs> Charlie Darwin said, if my theory be true, numberless intermediate varieties must assuredly have existed. Boy, you're right about that, Charlie. There should be billions of intermediate varieties. Where are they? Even David Ropp, who's a strong believer in evolution, said, in the years after Darwin, his advocates hoped to find predictable progressions. In general, these have not been found. Yet the optimism had di died hard, and some pure fantasy has crept into textbooks. Oh, <gasps> you're kidding. Fantasy in the textbooks? Oh, believe me, they are full of fantasy. I would like to point out, if you find a fossil in the dirt, like the fossil replicas on the table over here, all you know is it died. <laughs> you don't know, for, you know where it died at, and you know where it ended up being buried at, but that's all you know. You don't know that it had any kids, let alone different kids. You found a bone in the dirt. Oh, okay, it died. And I'd like to ask the question, why is it you think thing, bones you find in the dirt can do things that animals today cannot do? Monkeys today are still having babies. Make another human. I want to watch it this time. Apes are still having babies. Humans are still having babies. Everything's still having babies. Why don't we ever see an animal produce a different kind? Why is it it can only happen long ago and far away? Let's see it happen. It's not observed. Fossil evidence wouldn't hold up one second in a court of law. The problem is evolution doesn't have to be proven in a court of law. It has to be stuck into the brains of these un unsuspecting freshmen when they go to college. And they don't have the option because that teacher's going to give them a grade. But I'll tell you, if we had to go to court of law and they said, where's the evidence? Where's, what's the best evidence that any animal has ever changed to a different kind of animal? The best evidence they have, they claim they have, is the fossil record. And yet there is no fossil evidence that any animal ever produced a different kind of animal. And like I said, if you find a fossil in the dirt, that's not, fossil, that's not evidence that it had any kids at all, let alone different kids. So we have cosmic evolution, chemical evolution, stellar evolution, organic evolution. Then we would have to have macroevolution. That's changing from one kind of animal to another. Nobody has ever observed that. Finally, we have microevolution. Now, the first five are religious. The last one is science. And the kids are going to be confused with the definition of the word evolution. There's a lot of varieties of dogs, and they probably had a common ancestor, and it was a dog. You might get a big dog or a little dog, but it's still a dog. And a three-year-old can tell you it's the same kind of animal. Okay, boys and girls, here we have a dog, a wolf, a coyote, and a banana. Which one is not like the others? <laughs> well, duh. It's the same kind of animal. Uh, what's going to happen, though, the teachers are going to give thousands of examples of microevolution. Like he mentioned, we're different than our parents, and our jaws are smaller, and the wisdom teeth don't fit. Well, that, that's, a, that's a micro change. We're still a human. He's giving examples of microevolution, and then he's going to try to make you take a giant leap of faith and logic into believing that that somehow is mystically evidence for macroevolution. And it just isn't. Macroevolution is a fantasy based on imagination. It doesn't happen. And they spend a lot of time arguing about where is the line between micro and macro. Well, I don't know exactly where the line is in some cases. I think that might be a good field of research. But that certainly doesn't mean the other ones are included. See, the other five definitions are smuggled into the textbook, writing on the coattails of examples of macroevolution. 
They're just smuggled in, folks. There's no evidence for them at all. I defy somebody to show me some evidence. We've got no argument with truth. Man, I love truth. I love science. But evolution has no scientific evidence to back it up. Truth comes from God. I'd like to see some evidence to back, back up evolution. We welcome any challenge. I have a standing offer. We offer a quarter million dollars for proof for evolution. I mean, come on, let's have it. And I, I, I pay for my tickets to fly to do these debates. It's so hard to find an opponent. I, honestly, I don't, I'm not a professional debater. I've never had a class on debate in my life. And usually the evolutionists are a lot smarter than I am, but I'm right and they're wrong. It's very easy to win a debate like that. We only object to lies being included in with the textbooks. If there's some real evidence for evolution, I would like to see it. There is none. In t advertising, what's called, it's called bait and switch. It happened tonight already. Uh, Dr. Hartman gave his definition of evolution. Look at this textbook. Evolution is change over time. Is that really what they mean? In other words, there is no doubt living things have changed over time. Well, I agree with that definition. This textbook says evolution can be defined as a change in species over time. Okay, if that's really what you mean, I agree. Evolution happened. But that is not really what they mean. They, soak, they, they suck the kids into believing in evolution with this one definition, change over time, which everybody's going to agree with. You're different than your parents, aren't you? Of course you are. And then as the kids get indoctrinated, they slip in the other cosmic evolution, Big Bang, organic evolution. And they're told, if you don't believe in all this other five, then you don't understand science. <laughs> I resent that. I was in a debate in El Paso, Texas a few weeks ago, and the professor basically said over and over throughout the debate, well, you know, the average person just doesn't understand the complexities of this topic. I said, folks, what he's trying to say is, he's smart and you are dumb. That's what he's very much trying to, not to avoid saying, but that's what he means. There is no evidence. See, variations happen, but they have limits. I agree variations happen. You might get a big pig or a little pig, but you're still going to get a pig, and there's a limit. You're never going to get one as big as Texas. There's a limit. Roaches become resistant to pesticides, but they'll never become resistant to a sledgehammer. There's a limit. And it's still a roach, by the way. They don't produce any new kind of plant or animal. Variations happen. Christ Christians and creationists have no argument with that, but they have limits. Big dogs and little dogs are still a dog, and nothing new is added to the gene pool. Thank you. where he can go through slides, you know, zip, 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 here you go, I'm right. Everybody goes, yes, we're all good Christians, we, we, we accept that. Um, I would ask him to, to accept one of those debates where he can put his, his thoughts in words where everybody can see them, give his evidence, put it up there, let people scrutinize it, give people a chance to respond to it in writing, give people time to think about it. That's what I would like to see. I came here tonight not because I think you all are dumb. I don't. If I did that, I wouldn't be here. I don't think my students are dumb. I'm not trying to indoctrinate my freshman class. It may surprise a lot of you to know that, you know, I carry one of these around with me a lot. Bible. I tell my students to read the Bible. Especially if you're going to go talk about evolution and you're going to talk about creationism. You need to know what's in here, folks. The same way I would tell you that if you read nothing but the Bible, you're being misled too. You need to read what's in the science textbooks. Not just listen to what one man comes here and tells you. Read what it says in the science books. One thing I will take issue with, when you put up a quote from somebody and you see those little dot, dot, dots in them like you saw in the Darwin quote, there's something missing there. That means you're paraphrasing. You're, you're quoting something, but you're only quoting the parts of something you want somebody to see, and you're leaving out the parts that you don't think somebody should see. That's a little misleading. If you're going to put a quote up by somebody, if you're going to quote somebody, quote the whole thing. Read the whole thing. I understand time constraints, but you know, I'm not up here quoting anybody. I'm not up here telling you what somebody else says. I'm up here telling you what I have to say. Okay? Let's see, what else? I wrote quite a few notes. Um, interesting that when I said that creationists believe the earth is 10,000 years old, Mr. Hovind said 6,000 is what it says in the Bible. Um, somebody correct me, because I'm, I'm kind of rusty on this, but Adam was created on the sixth day. Is that correct? Well, in Paul, he says a day unto God is like a thousand years unto us. So on the sixth day, the earth was already 6,000 years old. If you add 6,000 years to that, which is the time since Adam, that makes the earth at least 12,000 years old, not 6,000 years old. Yeah, yeah, I know, I'm nitpicking, I'm splitting hairs, but you know, if you're going to stand up there and tell somebody the earth is 6,000 years old and here's my evidence, and it's scientific evidence, 
or whatever kind of evidence you're going to provide, I have to be able to go and refute it. That's what science is all about. If I put up something here that you don't agree with, feel free to go after it, attack it viciously. Evolution is not a religion, it's a theory. It's no worse than the theory of gravity. I've got a set of keys here. Anybody want to take a $250,000 bet that if I let go of these keys, they will not hit the floor? Put your faith in the theory of gravity. Well, not faith, but trust in the theory of gravity. You know, Einstein was right about it. Lots of other scientists have been right about it. If you reject evolutionary theory, you're not just rejecting what he would consider somebody's religion. You have to throw out geology, physics, chemistry, archaeology, anthropology, biology, all of those ologies, all of the sciences, all of the things, by the way, we benefit from. You know, modern medicine is based on biology, it's based on evolutionary theory. Our ability to treat viruses is based on our ability to cope with their evolution. One of the reasons why the HIV virus is so difficult to treat is because it, because it mutates so rapidly, it changes. Let's see, what else? Capable of reproducing, his definition of kind. Able, do organisms able to reproduce? Definition of species, the scientific definition of species are two organisms that mate naturally and produce fertile offspring. Kind of left out the fertile part, right? You could take a horse and a horse, and what are you gonna get? Somebody tell me. Horse, horse kind. Take a, a, a donkey and a donkey, and what are you gonna get? Donkey. Take a horse and a donkey, and what do you get? Mule. Take a mule and a mule, and what do you get? Nothing. What happened? Wait a minute, they should be able to reproduce after their kind. If they're all the same kind of animal, you should be able to get a mule and a mule together and produce more mules. You can't do it that way, folks. You have to start out with a horse and a donkey. Maybe they're the same kind. If they're the same kinds, they should be able to reproduce after their kind. And their kind should be able to reproduce after their kind. But they can't. There's a problem there. Oh, the fan's blowing my notes. Thank you. Yeah, I've tripped over that a couple of times. You have to be careful with the podium up here. We don't see stars form. Well, you know, I've seen some images from the Hubble telescope that look pretty impressive. Star formation. You should check out NASA's website. They have some pretty amazing photographs not just of star destruction, but of star formation. Public schools don't like the idea of evolution being taught in public schools. Well, you know, that's a matter of, of uh, personal opinion also. And you talk about not letting the majority rule, that's the whole basis of this country. We're getting ready to elect a new president. How are we going to do that? One small minority says, I'm right, oops, excuse me, and you're wrong, therefore I get to pick the president. Is that how we do it? Majority of scientists don't uh, uh, just sit around and say, oh, we all agree on this, so you all are wrong, and we're right, and we win. Doesn't work that way. Carl Sagan once said, um, you know, we're for science because it's been tested repeatedly and it works. If we found an alternative, you know, we're not out there trying to trick you. I'm not an agent of Satan. Somebody might argue otherwise, right? I'm not trying to trick you into... Uh, believing there's no God or, or something like that. I'm trying to show you how the natural world works, at least how we understand it to operate. You know, at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock, we don't just teach evolution. We do teach it. We teach it in the biology classes. I teach it in anthropology classes. We also have a religious studies program. To know that's a public university, and we teach classes on religion, and we study religion. Amazing. Your tax dollars are paying for people to go and study religion. How can that be if we're all against religion? It can't be. I don't have a problem with elementary schools offering classes in religious studies. But it should be more than one religion that is studied. It should be more than just the Christian religion or one particular aspect. After all, if you all are, are Baptists, you don't want your kids to go to school and learn how to be good Catholics. Do you? I grew up a Catholic. Maybe I don't want my kids going to school learning how to be good Baptists. There are differences within Christianity. How many of you want your kids to go to school and learn how to be Seventh-day Adventists who don't quite believe the same way that other Christians do, or Mormons? 
See, whose version of creation should you teach? Just the one in the King James Version of the Bible? I grew up Catholic. I don't use the King James Version of the Bible. I guess I'm wrong for that. I guess I'm going to hell for that. I don't believe that. The Pope doesn't believe that. I have a very good friend of mine. He's a Seventh-day Adventist. He thinks the Pope is the Antichrist. The nice Pope, Pope John Paul II. I don't know. Well, let me give you, uh, uh, let's see, how much time do I have left? About six minutes? Okay, plenty of time. We do observe microevolution. We can observe it. Just because macroevolution, we say, well, it takes longer time than we have to sit and observe it. We talk about empirical evidence. Well, I want to talk about Mr. Hoven, or Dr. Hovind's challenge, too, by the way. Um, empirical evidence. Well, I'm sorry if it takes, you know, 100,000 years for something to change. I'm not going to live that long. In fact, unfortunately, we haven't been writing about things that long in order for us to actually have these kinds of observations. Now, give us 100,000 years. Come back then and, and check in, and I'm sure we'll have some good evidence for you. Can't do anything about that, folks. We can look at microevolution, and we can, we, can, we can decide that microevolution is simply a matter of accumulated change over time, and eventually it produces what we consider macroevolution. Let me show you something. How do you suppose it got to be if horses and donkeys are the same kind of animal that something got screwed up with their genes so that they can no longer produce after their own kind? How did that happen? Well, I think it's because the populations got isolated. Suppose there was a primitive horse kind. Let's not even talk about species. Okay? Microevolution says that there will be change over time. Macroevolution is just an accumulation of those changes such that you get something that can no longer reproduce with what it once was. It's that simple. Here's a little diagram. Two deans of a single species, two populations of a single species, if you will, separated by some kind of barrier, a water barrier. If you have organisms that can't cross a river and a river flows between them, it effectively isolates the two groups of populations. Put the horses on one side, the donkeys on the other, if you want to. Over time, microevolution happens to both of them. If we're willing to grant that microevolution can change somebody's teeth, why not somebody else's reproductive system? See, we can say that, well, it works on teeth, but it doesn't work on anything else. It works on everything, folks. Microevolution works on everything. Eventually, you've got enough change to where maybe their genes don't quite match up. The problem with humans and chimpanzees is that chimps have 48 chromosomes and humans have 46. If you did try to get a human and a chimpanzee to mate, God forbid, right, you couldn't produce anything because they have incompatible chromosomes. When the sperm and the egg get together, there's a chromosome left over, and it happens to be a big one. It's an insurmountable challenge. It won't happen. Can't even do it in the laboratory. Not that we should try. Hopefully nobody's trying that. Okay? Two separate populations separate for long enough, different microevolutionary changes. All of a sudden, you get them back together, right? Somebody gets a farm and gets a horse and a donkey, puts them back together, and they can't produce after their own kind anymore because there's been a real genetic change, a microevolutionary change that's accumulated over time such that now it's a macroevolutionary change. Horses and donkeys and mules are different species, and I would argue they're also different kinds of animals. Let me finish up with a challenge. I saw this, you know. Hey, I'm like the rest of you. My mouth water. $250,000. Where's the criteria? Where does it say what kind of evidence I will accept? Well, one man tried to accept the challenge. Um, I'll ask Mr. Hovind if he's familiar with uh, Kevin Henke, and Dr. Berendt Vlarder-Ingerbrook, who's from a Scandinavian country, pardon me for butchering his name, one of them said that the only evidence he was told would be accepted was for him to actually create a new universe. Well, that would prove both theories, wouldn't it? Because Kevin would be the creator. He created a whole new universe. I can't do that. Nobody could do that. What other kinds of evidence? So I'll ask Mr. Hovind 
to present you know, what criteria he would accept for real scientific evidence, real empirical evidence of evolution. Give me a suite of things to choose from. Don't just give me one thing. Also, I, I checked out his website. You should check it out, by the way, www.drdino.com. I believe that's it. Because he goes into this. There's a panel of judges who will review the evidence. But see, they're real busy men, and they don't have time to answer facetious or silly questions, so he's not going to tell you who they are. Well, you know, if I have to take my time out of my life, however long it takes me, to get my evidence together and present it, I'd like to know who's going to review it. When I submit an article for publication in a scientific journal, I get a list of reviewers. I know who's reviewing my work. Sometimes I'll get comments back from them. I know ahead of time. Now, I trust that uh, Dr. Hovind here is an honorable man and wouldn't stack the deck against me. You know, I'd like to know who the six people are, or however many judges there are, uh, who they are and what their backgrounds are, whether or not they're creationists, whether or not they're evolutionists, you know, those kinds of things. You know, um, I was being facetious, but you know, I really will make that bet with anybody. It's the same kind of bet. I'll hold up my keys and I'll let go of them. If they don't hit the floor, you win my next uh, year's paycheck. Not quite $250,000, unfortunately, but you know, not an insignificant amount of money. If you're going to reject the theory of evolution, why not reject all scientific theories? They all must just be based on religion. After all, we can't see gravity, can we? It's about time for me to stop, so I'll go ahead and stop there. Thank you. All right, this will be the uh, rebuttal session, and then we'll go into the question and answer session, so it'll be exciting. Um, he mentioned that my quotes have the dot, dot, dot in there. That is very common. I mean, if you quoted the entire quote, it'd be, it'd be uh, horrendously long. And I challenge you to show me where any of my quotes in my seminar, and I use thousands of them, show me where they're not giving the true meaning of what the author said. You leave out extraneous words, that's common practice, and anybody who's quoting from, from uh, that, that, that would be ridiculous to say this is evidence. It, it seemed to be implying that I'm trying to misquote them, and evolutionists often accuse creationists of misquoting. Everything's documented right on the bottom of the screen. Look it up, show me where I'm wrong, where I'm not giving the true meaning. You mentioned about email debate, people wanting to debate me on email. I type about 12 words a minute with 18 mistakes. I get over 400 emails a day. I don't have time to get involved in a long email debate. I was home for 12 hours this week. I got in at three last night. I speak 700 times a year. I tell all the evolution, what they want to do is they want to eat up all of my time so I can't get out and speak to folks that really want to hear. They don't want to hear anyway. As far as not giving out the names of the judges, some uh, anonymous coward named Boudica emailed me and I said, I shouldn't have answered him the first time because I always ignore anonymous mail. But he was, this was anonymous and I saw email back and said, if you'll tell me your name, I'd be glad to answer all of your questions. He had 300 questions. He said, no, I refuse to give you my name. I said, well, then I'm sorry, I won't answer your questions. I don't, I've got nothing to hide. You've got my name, address, and phone number, and I'll give you a map to my house if you want. I have nothing to hide. See, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Well, Boudicca sent in what he said was evidence for evolution. It was ridiculous, but I sent it to the judges. I told him I'm going to send it to these guys. Boudicca right away wrote nasty, vile, filthy letters full of profanity to these judges. And I said, fellas, hey, I'm sorry. I won't let this happen again. Uh, if somebody sends in some real evidence, well, here's what happens. I get probably five or six emails a week from someone saying what Dr. Hartman said a few minutes ago. Well, if I knew who the judges were, what they're trying to say is, I don't really want to give you my evidence because I don't have any, but boy, I'm going to pick on you for your offer. They, pick it, they strain at gnats in the offer of quarter million dollars rather than just send the evidence. I would like you tonight, Dr. Hartman, to give the audience here the best evidence you have for evolution for macroevolution, the best evidence you've got. Let's not waste time with all the little stuff. Please give us the best. I have over 500,000 videos out there in circulation that we've produced, plus who knows how many copies of those that have gone around. My words are easy to examine. I don't have time to type everything out, though we are putting, as of today or tomorrow, should be my entire seminar will be on my website. You can click a button and watch the videos and listen to the audio free of charge, and then you can challenge anything I'm saying, and if you think I'm misquoting somebody, please let me know. I'm certainly not perfect, and I've made lots of changes through the years. He mentioned evolution as a theory like gravity. Now, that is absolutely ridiculous comparison. Gravity has evidence. We can observe it happening. We don't observe anything about what he said about evolution. 
To compare evolution with gravity is, is silly. There's, I, well, sure, we can watch things happen. We can watch gravity. There's testable evidence. Where is the testable evidence for macroevolution? Where is the testable evidence for cosmic evolution? Where is the testable evidence for organic evolution? There is none, and that's what my offer is all about. So don't compare evolution to gravity. And then he said, we, you know, we should, if, we, if we reject evolution, we have to reject science. Well, that's a ridiculous comparison. I don't reject science. I defy you to show me one beneficial thing we have in the world today because of the evolution theory. What good has it done? Is that why we have electricity? Is that why we have computers or video projectors? Is that why we have... Can you name anything we have in the advancement of science because of the evolution theory? When you, when you have your time in just a minute. Um, as far as mutations of viruses, modern medicine, all of the branches of modern science were started by creationists. The evolution came in like a leech and took over what they'd already created. They don't ever create anything new. They take over universities that were started by Christians and creationists like 97% of the first colleges in America were started by Bible-believing Christians. They come in there and take them over, but they don't start their own. It's like a leech. They've got to take over what somebody else does. What good has evolution done? You mentioned about star formation. I believe I got your quote. You said it may be happening now. You saw some pictures of the Hubble telescope sending back. This is typical. They say, well, evolution, you know, we, we have evidence coming in right now. Or the, they're studying this in the laboratory. What, we've been studying it for 120 years. Where's the evidence that has stood the test of time? Why is it always, well, we're looking at it right now. Well, that's not evidence yet. Let's see something that has stood the test of time. Nobody has proven the formation of any stars. They're seeing a bright spot in Crab Nebula, saying, wow, it might be a star forming. Well, it might be the dust is clearing, and you're seeing a star that was behind it all along. We don't know yet. Let's see some evidence that stood the test of time. He's mentioned about majority rule. Well, 91% of the population of America believes God created the world. 47% of them believe He did it in the last 10,000 years. If we're really going to have majority rule, then let's throw evolution out, since so few people believe it anyway. He mentioned about 98% DNA similarity. Now, this is interesting. Since only 1% of the DNA has even been studied and analyzed and decoded, it's a little premature to say it's 98% similar. If it is 98% similar, 98.2, I believe you said, to humans and chimpanzee DNA, that would prove we have a common designer. It doesn't prove we have a common ancestor. The same God designed the animals. That's what it proves. I think it was pretty smart for God to make all of the plants and animals from the same basic amino acids so that a brown cow can eat the green grass and digest it and turn it into white milk, which turn it into yellow butter, and I eat it and get blonde hair, all made from the same amino acid. That's not proof that we came from a common ancestor. It's proof the designer was thinking. See, if we didn't all have the same similarities, we could only eat each other. We wouldn't be able to digest anything else. So it was smart for God to make things from the same building block. The argument that similar DNA proves a common ancestor is like saying, I have two books on the table, and I've analyzed all the words in these two books, and I noticed they have exactly the same 26 letters. They would, wouldn't they? This proves they both evolved from an explosion in a print shop 10 billion years ago. I mean, come on, that's ridiculous, okay? This proves somebody's using the same 26 letters with intelligent design behind it to create words and paragraphs and sentences. An intelligent designer took the 20 amino acids and put them in to make uh, protein strands, which makes the cells, which makes our complex bodies. They were all come from the same designer. And it wouldn't hold up two seconds in a court of law to say, similar DNA proves evolution. <laughs> Any freshman law student would say, no, this could just as easily prove a common creator. And the kids ought to be taught both. He mentioned Catholics and Lutherans believe in evolution. Well, that's, those are the ones that haven't been to my seminar. If they would come, we would straighten them out. <clears throat> he mentioned about empirical evidence, and his, his answer was, I said, where's the empirical evidence? He says, well, we don't live long enough. Now, now think about that. If we could see it for 100,000 years, come back in 100,000 years, you might see the evidence. What that is really saying is, we can't show it to you. Is that what it, is that what it, okay. Therefore, that's my point. It's not science. It's not observable. It's something you believe in, and you're welcome to believe in that, Dr. Hartman, but don't call that science, and for heaven's sake, quit using tax dollars to teach that religion to the students. I'll tell you what. If we come back in 100,000 years and see that things really have evolved, then we'll, we'll start teaching it. Until then, it does not belong in education. What he translated that sentence was, we don't have the evidence. 
My offer's on my website. As far as creating a new universe, I never said that to those guys from South Africa with the weird names that wrote me the letters. I corresponded with them a half a dozen times. They never would send any evidence. They did the same thing they always do. Well, who's on the panel? You know, where's the bank? What, 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 what's the account number for the bank and all this stuff? I said, look, my word is good. You send the evidence. They never do send the evidence. All they do, I was in a debate one time in, in Minnesota, and this lady said, there's lots of evidence for evolution. I said, let's see it. She said, well, there, there's, just, there's just lots of it. I said, okay, let's see it. Well, there's just, there's just so much. Okay, show me one. Oh, there's just, there's just lots of it. Okay, show me one. They never do show you one, folks. All they do is say there's lots of it. And these guys claim that they want to pick on my offer over some little straining at a gnat, and they're swallowing the camel of believing that we all came from a rock over 4.6 billion years. Man, that's ridiculous. My offer is good. The, my, my point is evolution has six different meanings. I would like empirical evidence for all six. There is none. Uh, my offer is clearly spelled out on my website, drdino.com. Look it up. He asked, are the, are the judges all creationists? First place, I don't know. Second place, I wonder why that question would even come up. Because does that determine whether a person is qualified to be a scientist or not? In the minds of some, it certainly does. In other words, if you believe in creation, you're not a scientist. This sounds like the Soviet Union 10 years ago. If a teacher stood up in the Soviet Union and said, you know, kids, I don't think communism works. I think capitalism is a better system. What would happen to that teacher? He'd be out shoveling snow in Siberia, right? And then the leaders get up and say, hey, everybody believes in communism. Well, of course they do. Look what happens if you don't. Evolution, the textbooks are, are, are full of lies that are shown to the kids to try to get them to believe in evolution. And I resent that. You have varieties of corn, and they probably had a common ancestor, and it was a corn of some kind. And there's all sorts of kinds of corn today, but you still crossbreed them and you still get corn. You never get a hamster or a tomato or a whale to grow on your corn stalk. Nothing changes. There's varieties of dogs, and they probably had a common ancestor. You have big horses and little horses, and they might have had a common ancestor. And as far as the horse and the zebra and the mule not being able to breed, well, what, we, what we're seeing is branches on a tree that came from a common root, and now they're so different, they can no longer interbreed. That still doesn't prove they didn't have a common ancestor. Think about the argument. He's saying a horse and a donkey or a mule or jackass or whatever it was he mentioned cannot breed and produce fertile offspring. And therefore, they're different species. Well, maybe so. If, if we, if, it depends on your definition of species. Who gets to, who gets to decide what the defini definition of species is, for one thing? But get a horse and a zebra and put a five-year-old next to him and say, are these the same kind of animal? Oh, yeah. Anybody could tell you they're the same kind of animal. Seeing the branches on the tree where they now have diversified, where they're no longer interfertile, well, that doesn't prove they didn't have a common ancestor. It also certainly doesn't prove the horse and the banana are related to a rock 4.6 billion years ago. We got varieties of cows and things happen, but the textbooks contain things that just aren't true. I've got a whole two and a half hour video going through lies in the textbooks that kids are exposed to to try to get them to swallow this evolution theory. And it's really sad. They're going to tell the kids the appendix is vestigial. Well, I'm sorry, the appendix is part of the immune system. It is not vestigial. Take that out of the book, okay? There's no such thing as a vestigial structure. This book tells the kids that the whale used to walk around. It says the whale has a vestigial pelvis and leg bones. Vestigial pelvis and leg bones, evolution of its, uh, evidence of its evolution from four-legged land-dwelling ancestors. Well, the guy that wrote this is either ignorant of his whale anatomy or he's a liar because th those bones are essential for the whales to reproduce, muscles attached to those bones. The male and female whale bones are very different. That has nothing to do with the whale walking on land, but this kind of stuff is presented to the kids as evidence for the evolution theory. And I'm sorry, it's a lie. If you have some real evidence, I would like to see it, but don't lie to the kids. This one says, the humans have a tailbone that is of no apparent use. I had a guy tell me that in a debate in Huntsville, Alabama. He said, humans, we, can, we got proof for evolution. You no longer need your tailbone. I said, sir, there are nine muscles that attach to the tailbone, without which you cannot perform some very valuable functions. <laughs> but if you think the tailbone is vestigial, sir, I will pay to have yours removed. <laughs> Bend over. It is not vestigial. I would like to point out there are no vestigial structures. And secondly, even if there were, that would be the opposite of evolution. That's losing, not gaining. Show me how we gain something. And even people like Pierre Gross, who believes in evolution, said mutations do not produce any kind of evolution. 
All you get is a mutant variety. And then the textbooks tell the kids that natural selection goes in with evolution somehow. Oh, come on. I got nothing against natural selection. Natural selection is a conservative process that keeps the species strong. It doesn't change it to something else. It's sort of like a quality control. It's not going to change it to anything else. But the textbook tells the kids, natural selection causes evolution. And that just simply is not true. Natural selection keeps birds, birds, and dogs, dogs. It doesn't turn a bird to a dog or anything in between. It's a conservative process. They tell the kids the fruit fly is evidence for evolution. All they did after years of mutating those poor flies is got flies that were worse off than Grandpa Fly. They got flies with curled wings and flies with no wings. That's not a fly, that's a crawl. They got all kinds of mutated flies. They never got a beneficial mutation. They're going to tell the kids, it's still in your textbooks right here in Little Rock, Arkansas, that the peppered moth is evidence for evolution. After 40 years of watching, exactly two moths were found on the trees. Two in 40 years. So they glued dead moths to the trees in order to take the picture to put in the textbooks to make the kids believe in evolution. That's a lie, folks. They're going to tell them there's evidence from similar structure. The forelimb of the animals is all similar. That proves a common ancestor. No, no, no. That proves a common designer. Chevy and Ford all have four wheels on the ground. That proves they all evolved from a skateboard 18 million years ago. No, it proves it's a good design and it works good, okay? That's what it proved. They're going to tell the kids that human embryo has gill slits. That was proven wrong 125 years ago, but it's still in textbooks today. Ernst Haeckel made up this whole thing in 1869. His charts are used right now, today, at the University of West Florida. And I guarantee that same concept is being taught right now in Little Rock, Arkansas, and it was proven wrong in 1874. If you have some evidence for evolution, I want to see it. But don't lie to the kids. Uh, should, we teach that the earth, should we teach that the earth is flat in geography class, since the Bible describes it as such in many passages? See Revelation 7-1, Psalm 24-2, 104.5, Isaiah 24.18, Matthew 4.8, 1 Peter 1.20, others. Uh, obviously, I don't think we should. The earth, if it says the earth is flat in the Bible, the earth is obviously not flat. That's been proven. We can't teach that in geography class. Uh, I don't need three minutes to answer that question. Okay. Oh, there we go. I didn't get time to boot up the verse, um, but the Bible teaches very clearly the earth is round. It says, yes, in the book of Isaiah, uh, chapter 40, that the Lord sits on the circle of the earth. Here it is right here. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 22. Uh, it says, the Lord sits upon the circle of the earth. The Hebrew word there is the word for sphere, a ball, a three-dimensional object. So the Bible does not teach the earth is flat. A few heathen a few hundred years ago started teaching it was flat, and they tried to blame that on the Christians. Uh, I'm sorry, the earth is round. Okay, I don't have a problem with that. Thank you. I guess I get to ask a question first. Um, please state the second law of thermodynamics. And within a closed system, the change will always, entropy will increase. This uh, second law of thermodynamics is interesting. Um, the second law is, is stated many different ways, okay? And no matter how you state it, somebody else is going to find a different definition someplace else. So um, basically, it boils down to the idea that everything tends toward disorder. The evolutionist somehow has got it into his mind that if you add energy, you can overcome the second law of thermodynamics. Now, this is, this is certainly not true. Adding energy does not help anything. You have to have something to utilize that energy. The sun adds lots of energy to the earth every day. All of it is destructive unless there's a system to utilize that energy called chlorophyll, which is a very complex molecule. If it weren't for chlorophyll, the sunlight is eventually going to peel the paint off your car and destroy the roof of your house, and when it's done, it's going to destroy the rest of the house. So adding energy doesn't help. The pouring your, filling your front seat of your car full of gasoline isn't going to make it run faster. You have to have a complex system to utilize that gasoline called a carburetor and a drivetrain. So, the, the normal response to the second law of thermodynamics from the evolutionist is, well, in a closed system, you know, if, if you add in the first place, the universe is a closed system, okay? Where is this extra energy coming from? Secondly, I'd like to point out, adding energy doesn't help. We added lots of energy to Iraq a few years ago. We didn't organize a thing. 
Adding energy disorganizes things. The idea of a human embryo developing from two cells into a full-grown human, they'll say that's an example of the opposite of the second law of thermodynamics. No, it's not. It's following a complex DNA code, and there's an enormous amount of input of intelligent energy. You need not only energy, you need intelligence, and you need a system to utilize the energy. The second law of thermodynamics is one of the main proofs that evolution didn't and can't and won't ever happen. Thank you. Um, can I see the card? Thanks. Second law of thermal within a closed system change in energy will always increase. Why? Um, I guess I guess I don't I don't really understand that. You have to have uh, an intelligent designer to I guess to overcome the second law of thermodynamics. I, I I don't I'm not really I don't really grasp the answer. And I guess uh, uh, I'll have to wait for clarification on it. Um, Things tend toward entropy, but you add energy to the system. Um, you know, I'm not a physicist, but I don't know. In two minutes, I don't know how I would discuss this one. So I guess <coughs> it depends on whether or not you consider the universe to be a closed system. And he said that it certainly is a closed system. Well, I don't see any evidence for that. Um, so I guess I'd have to ask for, for that kind of thing. Also, uh, it sort of fits in with uh, one of the questions that was asked earlier about how things tend toward disorder. Things are constantly losing, like we're losing uh, 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 our appendix or we're losing our tailbone or something like that. We've never gained anything. We have gained things. We've gained uh, larger brains. I mean, evolution is not just about losing things. Uh, you don't have to necessarily lose something or have something tend toward disorder to have it count as evolution. Um, anyway, that's, that's that question. Okay, I was given. Okay, I guess we're switching back and forth. Uh, this is kind of a long one, but I'm just taking them. I am a junior at UALR, which is the university I teach at. You said earlier that you were not trying to indoctrinate freshmen. My freshman year at UALR, I studied biology under Dr. Lanza, an evolutionary biologist. Half of the semester was spent studying evolution. On the first test, I answered her questions thoroughly including quotes from various stories that I had read, but she gave me an F. The only way I was able to pass was by quoting her on the textbook. I was under the impression that college was supposed to be about teaching people how to think for themselves intelligently. If this is not indoctrination of you and your colleagues' theories, what is it? Well, I can't speak for Dr. Lanza. Um, I guess uh, the way this usually works in university is if you're asked a question and you have to provide you know, the, the answer. And if you don't agree with the answer, you know, I, I'll tell you a story I had in graduate school one time. A, a professor asked me to talk about uh, Neanderthal evolution. And I went up to her and I said, you know, I, I don't like the way the question is worded. And she said, well, I'll tell you what. You answer the question the way you want to, but if you can provide me with evidence to back it up, you know, I'll accept your answer. So I did. I changed the, the, the question slightly. I answered it. I provided her with evidence to back up what I had to say. She gave me an A on it. I think it depends on the professor. I can't speak for Dr. Lanza. I certainly don't think that I'm indoctrinating my students and telling them that if you don't believe the way I believe, you're going to get an F. And I don't think that's what Dr. Lanza says either. Um, I know her. I don't know her very well. She may even be here tonight. I mean, the, the flyers were circulated um, in the biology department, certainly. Um, so, I, I mean, I don't know how this really relates to me, per se. Uh, I, don't, I don't do that sort of thing. Certainly, I've flunked students before. Usually the ones that don't come to class or they don't do the assignments, don't turn them in on time. You know, uh, I tell my students all the time, if you want to get an A in college, show up for class, do all your assignments on time. Um, you know, you don't have to agree with what I, agree, what I have to say. In fact, uh, uh, when I talk about evolution in my introductory physical anthropology classes, I say, look, you don't have to agree with what I'm saying. You have to learn it. I ask that you understand it. And that, I think, is the, the key to this whole question. If she is basically saying that, you know, I don't want to learn this stuff. In fact, I'm not going to answer what she wants me, me to answer. It doesn't have anything to do with Dr. Lanza demanding that she agree with her. This has to do with Dr. Lanza asking that she understand it and be able to tell, you know, tell me that you understand it. And that's the whole nature of the testing system. I don't care if you believe it or not, as long as you're able to tell me what it's all about. That's kind of what we're doing here tonight. You, know? uh, you may or may not go out of here believing it, but you know, you're going to know something about it. And if you didn't know something about it before, you do now. And I tell my students the same thing about creationism. If you didn't know a lot about it before tonight, you're going to know something about it when you leave here. Oh, here's the...
Yes, sir. I would say that's an excellent answer, and I wish all teachers did what you do. Uh, believe me, there are some teachers in the universities that will fail a student if they don't, uh, if they don't believe what they want them to believe. It's not just understanding it, and I, I appreciate Dr. Hartman's answer. I would agree with him. Um, there are some, though, that don't, don't fall into that category. I think, I encourage students, if you're going to go to a secular university and the teacher asks a question like, how old is the earth? And you know the answer they want, because you read your book and you did your homework, but you don't believe it. All you need to do is write on the test, the textbook says, blah, 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 however, this is not correct. That's all you need to do. Uh, this question was asked, uh, four pages of prepared questions, obviously somebody uh, <clears throat> thought ahead about this one. Are there contradictions, or why are there three creation myths in the Old Testament? Just the phrasing of the question, why are there three creation myths, shows a little prejudice to begin with, I would say. <laughs> I would say there are not three creation myths, there is one creation story of how it actually happened. Uh, Basically, what they're usually referring to when they say this is the Genesis chapter 1 account, and I'll show you. I cover this very thoroughly on my videotape number 7. Let me get the mouse working here. Genesis chapter 1 says, God made the plants, the herbs, the grass, etc., on the third day. He made the fowl, the birds, on the fifth day out of the water. And he made man the sixth day after he made the animals. So he made animals first and then man on day 6. That's the order of creation in chapter 1. When you look at chapter 2, it says, the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground, and then it says he put him in the garden and made the trees to grow. And they'll say, see, the order is backwards. This is a different creation myth. This is the basic argument. They will say, in chapter 1, God made the grass plants trees on day 3, whereas in chapter 2, he made the trees after man on day 6. And this little chart kind of shows what the, the whole argument about this question about the creation myths. Here's what really happened. The Lord God made birds, he made the plants on day 3, then he made the um, birds out of the water on day five. On day six, he made the animals, and then he made man. And then he put man in the Garden of Eden. And then in front of Adam, he made the trees to grow. But it says it was the trees that were good for food. This is not all the trees. The rest of the world is already full of trees. He only made the trees in the garden, and he made one more of each of the animals so that Adam could name them and select a wife. If Adam had not seen God create something, Satan could come along and say, I did all this, and Adam would not know. The only thing that did not, the only person that did not see anything get created was Eve, and that's the one Satan went to to trick. There's not a contradiction between chapter 1 and chapter 2. Chapter 2 is a continuation of the story, filling in the details of what happened on day 6. And it's not a creation myth, that's the way it really happened. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, um, well this one puts me in an awkward position because I'm not here tonight to, to, to denigrate the Bible or to tell you that the Bible is not, not, not correct or that it has contradictions, but I think it does have some contradictions, um, which I don't, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I mean, lots of, of religions look at the Bible and they interpret it. They say, okay, it's a, it's, a, it's a set of parables, it's a set of morals, it shouldn't necessarily be taken literally because if you take it literally, you run into some problems. For example, in Matthew 27, 5, Judas threw down the pieces of silver in the temple. He departed, and then he went and hanged himself. But in Acts of the Apostles 1, 18, Judas kept the silver and purchased a field with it. He went into it, and falling headlong, he burst open, and all his bowels gushed out. He either didn't keep the silver, or he kept the silver. He either hanged himself, or he didn't hang himself. He died in a field being disemboweled. If you take it literally, then you have to believe both accounts, but obviously both accounts can't be correct unless he hanged himself, fell out of the tree, hit the ground, and burst open. I, you know, um, I guess my, my point here is that um, you shouldn't necessarily take it literally. Uh, you know, I, for example, I don't have a problem with the Ten Commandments. Those are good rules to live by. You shouldn't kill somebody. You shouldn't lie about somebody. You shouldn't steal from somebody. Okay? Uh, you know, do I believe that they should be posted in the public schools? No, because they're not everybody's rules. And some people may have even more rules. Somebody, somebody may have 12 rules for good living, but somebody else doesn't agree with it. Um, so anyway, I'm not going to get into a, a necessarily a debate about the Bible. Uh, pick up your own Bible, whichever copy you prefer, the King James Version, one of the new standard editions, the Catholic Bible, whichever one you're comfortable with and happy with, that's the one you should go by. 
That's it. My, my microphone, there it goes. Ooh, oh. Technology is our friend. Uh, if evolution is true, why don't we have apes instead of babies? <laughs> we do. Human beings. This gets to the question of whether or not humans are animals. Some creationists will tell you that we're not animals. We are animals. We eat, we sleep, we reproduce. We defecate, we do all those nasty things we don't like to talk about in public, but by golly, every one of us does them. If that doesn't make us animals, what does? Do we have dominion over the animals? Of course we do. We've got all the power. Um, give birth to an ape? Well, you can't do that. I've already talked about, you know, chimpanzees are the closest to us genetically, but there's a little problem with the chromosomes. I personally believe that we shared a common ancestor five million years ago with, with chimpanzees. Not that we evolved from chimpanzees, but that we had a common ancestor. The common ancestor probably had 48 chromosomes. And by the way, I'll, I'll point out something that Mr. Hovind said earlier about, um, um, let me see if I get this. Well, no, I, I think I'll save that for my closing remarks. Um, chimpanzees have, have one extra set of chromosomes. We can't physically reproduce with chimpanzees. Um, oh, one thing I will point out is, uh, if we're talking about kinds here, and we have to talk about relatedness, uh, chimpanzees, I said, were 98.2% similar to humans, but gorillas are about 94%, and orangutans are about 92%. Now, if they're all ape kind, and they all have one common designer, then why aren't they all equally dissimilar? You see what I'm saying? Why, why aren't gorillas 98.2% genetically the same as we are? Why are they a little bit different? Because we understand that they evolved at a slightly different time period. Gorillas, in fact, uh, emerged a little bit earlier. Chimps and humans split about 5 million years ago. Uh, gorillas split off about 10 million years ago. Orangutans about 17 million years ago. The fossil record, by the way, agrees with that. We find the fossils in the correct stratigraphic profile, and the dates match up. We find the first orangutans emerging about 17 to 20 million years ago. The first gorillas show up about 10 to 15 million years ago. The first chimpanzees show up between about 5 and 8 million years ago. The first humans show up about 5 million years ago. Anytime you get two lines of evidence, it's not like I'm telling you that geology has the answer or genetics has the answer, but they correlate with each other. Genetically, we, we see that they're about where they should be in terms of how closely related we are. And the same thing we look at in the, in the fossil record in geology, and we can see that that, that matches up fairly closely. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, my response, if evolution is true, why don't we have apes instead of babies? Uh, I would agree there's certainly a genetic difference. Uh, I, I think I would disagree a little when he said, uh, as far as humans are animals, though I've seen some would make me you know, want to believe that. Uh, I think it depends on who gets to decide where the classifications are drawn. Uh, if, you don't, if you divide them up, for instance, uh, maybe God's classification system is not the same as Carolus Linnaeus's classification system. It could be that God considers whales, since they live in the water, part of the fish family. And we've decided to divide them up based on whether they breathe air above water and have milk glands and, you know, uh, have hair, et cetera, et cetera. So it goes back to really who gets to decide what the classification divisions are, and then you can change them wherever you want. I would say plants have a body. Animals have a body and a consciousness of life, and man has a body and a consciousness of life and a consciousness of God. There's something very different between man and the animals. None of the animal, animals have culture like music and thoughts and express their words and their emotions in, in writing and, and pass down this information generation after generation. Uh, so I'd say we're very different than the animals. Uh, I would not want to do that. Okay, my question, I don't know if it would matter to you, uh, Dr. Hartman. Uh, you may not even want to give a response. You certainly, certainly can if you want. The question is, where did you get your degree from, and what is it in? I get asked this question a lot, uh, as if usually it's an indication. When someone starts attacking a man personally, which is often what it leads to, these kind of questions, and I'm not saying it is, but often it is, that's an indication they're losing the debate on common sense, logic, and other things, and so they're starting to look for an ad hominem attack on the individual. 
This is like the you know, Western Union guy comes with a telegram and you read the telegram and you don't like what it says, so you shoot the messenger boy. <laughs> that's, that's what happened. So the question, do you have a PhD? Uh, the dictionary definition of PhD is a doctor of philosophy. I went to a small non-accredited Christian university in Colorado Springs, Patriot University. I earned a doctor of philosophy degree. There's their phone number. Call them up if you don't believe me. Uh, they have about 400 students. They have about 25 graduates every year. There were three graduating that year with me with a PhD in education. My degree is in education. It's from a non-accredited school. I don't argue credentials with anybody. If you don't like to call me Dr. Hoven, call me Kent or Hey You or whatever you, I don't care, but deal with the issue, okay? The issue is not whether a person has a degree. I worked very hard for my degree. I don't know if other people work hard for theirs or not. But when a person gets to the point where they're attacking you personally, that's an obvious sign they are losing the debate. So keep that thought in mind. Thank you. Well, let, let me just remind everybody that I didn't ask this question. So, and I don't participate in the ad hominem, you know, uh, I'm not going to attack uh, Dr. Hovind at all. Um, where did I get my education and what subject? I have a bachelor's uh, of arts degree from the University of Missouri, uh, granted in 1990, uh, in anthropology, and I have a PhD, a doctor of philosophy, uh, from Texas A&M University, Giga Maggie, right? Uh, from 1996, also in anthropology. Um, my dissertation was in archaeology, um, uh, and, and it's, uh, it's available, by the way, if you want to look at it through University of Microfilm. I, I didn't bring a copy of my diploma, uh, but you know, I have it hanging on my wall if anyone cares to look at it. That's the answer to that question. Oh, my question. Well, I love this question. How, if we evolved from apes, why do we have a conscious, I guess it's consciousness, know what is right and wrong? Some of, I'm sorry, some of these are in pencil and it's kind of hard to read. How, if we evolve from apes, why do we have a conscious, know what is right and wrong, and apes do not? Uh, I work with apes uh, almost on a daily basis. In fact, I'm on the board of governors for the Little Rock Zoo, and I'm also director of the primate enrichment program. And I didn't know, by the way, I thought this would be a good time to bring this up, that you all were taking up a collection, we're going to split the money with us. I got a little speaking fee last year when I was here, and I donated the money to the primate enrichment fund at the Little Rock Zoo. So if I get any money tonight, that that's where the money's going to go. We use it to buy... Um, what we call enrichment items. See, because apes are very similar to humans in terms of their consciousness, in terms of their behavior, in terms of their intelligence. Do you know, for example, that chimpanzees have been given human intelligence tests and have scored in the low 60s, which is just below normal for human intelligence. I wonder what they would score if they were given an ape intelligence test and what we would score on that test. See, I think they do know right from wrong. I work with these guys on a regular basis. In fact, um, um, I encourage you all to come to the zoo, and if you get out there about 9 o'clock or 9.30 in the morning, you'll see the results of this enrichment program. I've got a lot of my students that work with me out there. Let me tell you what behavioral enrichment is. Apes are kind of like humans, mentally. In other words, if you just put one in a cage, and a lot of you may remember the Little Rock Zoo when they used to put the primates in the concrete cages with the bars, and they would sit there and throw feces at you or bang their head against the bars. Think about what you would do if you were locked in solitary confinement and had people come and stare at you all day and throw things at you and spit at you. You'd go crazy. And that's what the apes do. They go crazy. One of the ways we try to overcome that is providing what we call behavioral enrichment. We give them things to do to occupy their minds because they have minds that need to be occupied. We give them toys to play with. We, give them, uh, we, we don't just throw their food to them like we used to do in the old days at the zoo. We put it in puzzle boxes things they have to manipulate with their hands, figure out with their brain how to get this puzzle open so I can get the food out. Um, I encourage you all to come to Little Rock Zoo between 9 and 9.30 in the morning, go up to the Great Ape area, and you'll watch uh, the apes come out and get their enrichment items. You'll see them play with it. They use clothing. Uh, they use boxes. You know, they can communicate with us using American Sign Language. I had an interesting debate with a uh, linguistics professor one time who said that apes don't understand language. They do simple mimicry. And I said, well, you know, Washu, the chimpanzee, knows 290 signs in American Sign Language. How many words of chimpanzee do you know? Thank you. All right, let's see. If how, if we evolve from apes, why do we not, why do we have a conscious, 
conscious, uh, and know what is right and wrong, and apes do not. I think it is fascinating to study the apes. The apes are very complex creatures, and I'm thrilled for those who take time to study them and, and uh, try to protect them and things like that. I'm certainly not in favor of exterminating any species at all. But I think the fact that the ape is such a complex creature and is able to, to work very well in his environment is proof he, he was designed by a very intelligent designer. Certainly not proof that we have a common ancestor with them. Uh, again, a freshman law student could take that one apart in a few seconds if it was on trial. Uh, but it's, uh, it's not, unfortunately. It needs to be. They keep putting creation on trial. You know, should it be taught in the schools? Well, let's put evolution on trial. <laughs> Where's the evidence for this theory? Okay, so I have no other response other than I agree they're very complex creatures, but I think it's evidence of design. It's not evidence of a common ancestor. Uh, the question, there's two questions on one, Dr. Hartman, if you don't mind. Apparently one of your students, because um, they signed their name, you said they get credit or something. Uh, what is your definition of kind? I would say uh, the same kind of animal are those that were probably originally able to reproduce. In the original created kind, they were able to reproduce, and they may have diversified now because of all sorts of factors, that now they're no longer able to reproduce, but they're probably still recognizable as the same kind as having descended from an animal that was able to reproduce. Second question on the same card, so your student gets two points, I guess. Why can't you believe evolution and creation? Can you prove there's a God? Well, I guess you'd have to go back to what is the definition of evolution. If you mean animals produce a different, a totally different kind, well, there's no evidence for that. If you mean can animals produce varieties, well, certainly I believe that. So you'd have to define the word evolution before I could answer that question. Um, as far as could God use evolution, couldn't God have used evolution to get us here? Well, I, I have several points I'd like to make on that. Uh, number one, that is not the clear teaching of the Bible. I mean, that's pretty obvious. If you want to believe God used evolution, you're certainly welcome to do that. However, that is not what the Bible teaches. Secondly, I have to point out, that would be a retarded God who couldn't make it right first time. <laughs> I would not worship a God like that. That's for sure. My personal unbiased opinion is that people who believe in theistic evolution are trying to find a nice little God that they can put in a box someplace and control him because they don't want him controlling their lifestyle. That's my personal opinion. Thirdly, it's not in the character of my God to use misfits, suffering, and death like evolution calls for. Evolution calls for blind chance, randomness, nobody knows what's going on, let's just toss it out and see what happens. That's not in the character of the God that I worship. Fourthly, it nullifies the need for the death of Christ. If there was already death here in the world, if, if, see, if creation is true, then man brought death into the world, and death is a terrible thing. If evolution is true, death brought man into the world, and death is a wonderful thing, because that's how we get ahead. See, if evolution is true, one species has to, or one animal within the species has to evolve a little better than the rest, and the rest of them have to die in order for the good one to take over the, the living space. That's Adolf Hitler's philosophy exactly. Number five, there's no evidence for evolution anyway, so why compromise a perfectly good Bible with a dumb theory like that? I was asked earlier to define macroevolution. Macroevolution is simply an accumulation of microevolutionary change over time such that you no longer get two species who are capable of mating naturally and producing fertile offspring. Uh, that's what Dr. Hovind just said happened. You have animals branching out until they're no longer able to reproduce. That's macroevolution, and uh, I like the 250,000 in small bills delivered to my office. I mean, that's it, folks. That's, that's our definition of macroevolution. It's the definition that's in all the science textbooks. That's macroevolution in a nutshell. You get enough accumulated microevolutionary changes until you can't have two species mating and producing the same kind of animal anymore. That's it. Uh, in fact, I put the chart up there and I explained it to you. That's what it is. Um, why can't you believe evolution and creationism? I don't see why you can't. I don't think that if you're a theistic evolutionist or whatever term you want to call them, that you're necessarily putting God in a box, um, trying to control God. Uh, I think it's people that are trying to figure out a way that they can merge their faith, their belief, their, their notion of spirituality with what their eyes and their mind tells them, what we observe about the natural order of the world. You know, there, there has to be a way. If I believe, and I'm, I'm using the I rhetorically, if I believe there's a God, 
but I also understand that evolution is the way things work, then I'm going to try and put the two things together. I don't think they have to be mutually exclusive. Um, can you prove there is a God? You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to make such an offer, but you, you, you know that offer, the $250,000 offer, you could just as easily twist it around and say, I'll offer anybody in the room $250,000 if they can offer me proof that God exists to my satisfaction, because that's what Mr. Hovind is saying. You have to prove it to my satisfaction in order for me to give you the money. Well, again, I'll ask what his criteria are. Well, proving all five of those literally means you do have to create a new universe, because that's the first step in his uh, a list of things that you have to prove. If I could create a new uh, uh, um, uh, universe, I would be like a god. And evolution doesn't teach us that we're trying to be God. We're just trying to be people. Thank you. OK, my question uh, here was asked, what about the geologic column? Discuss the significance or lack of it to the layers of geologic formation. The geologic column was invented in the 1830s by many people. Charles Lyell's the primary culprit. Uh, each layer was given a different name and age in an index fossil. I taught our science for 15 years. Uh, the geologic column is the Bible for the evolutionist. It only exists one place in the world, and that is in the textbooks. There is no geologic column. They know that, those who study it. This author said, if there were a column of sediments, unfortunately, no such column exists. There is no geologic column. There are many layers to the earth, that's true, but those all formed during one big flood in the days of Noah. The fact that you can prove this, because in between these layers, there are seldom, if ever, found any erosion marks. Now, don't you think if that layer sat there for 10 million years waiting for the next one to be laid down, there'd be a little bit of rain? Plus, where did the next layer come from? But from further sediments, which indicates more water moving. So of course there'd be erosion marks. There aren't erosion marks between these layers. Um, the geologic column is a hoax. Uh, it doesn't exist. It's based on circular reasoning. I go through that on my videotape number four for 30 minutes about the geologic column. The layers are not different ages. They cannot be. And it's all based on circular reasoning. I prove all that from lots of quotes on video number four. Let me get to one more point in my last minute. Uh, it's all dated by index fossils. Uh, get up here. Oh, right here. No. Nope. All over the world, petrified trees are found standing straight up. They're running through multiple rock layers. Now, these rock layers are dated at vastly different ages. They'll say this layer is 10 million years older than the one you know, above it, and yet we find petrified trees standing up in the vertical position. Sometimes petrified trees are upside down, running through many rock layers. Those rock layers all had to be laid down in a big flood. The tree didn't stand there for millions of years waiting for the mud to form around it. Mount St. Helens is producing the exact same phenomena right now from the thousands of trees that were blown into Spirit Lake back in 1980. They're being buried standing up. None of them grew there. And it's going to look like a miniature geologic column someday. And it, it's, it, it happened because of a flood. So the geologic column, it's tragic that this is taught to students in school as if it's some kind of fact when it's absolutely not. Uh, it's a bunch of baloney. We cover that in video number four and also on my website. Thank you. The geologic uh, column doesn't necessarily exist in someone's mind. There, there probably is no place on Earth where you're going to find a, a 4.5 billion year old layer uh, in every single layer in between. Uh, um, because of the natural processes of the Earth, the way we understand the natural processes of the Earth, uh, we have two, two basic processes, deposition and erosion. Deposition puts things down and erosion takes things away. To say there's no evidence that, any, that there was any stability, well, I would ask about the Lake Tanyanyika footprints, the hominid footprints that are 3.2 million years old. There was a layer of volcanic sediment deposited. Some early humans, early hominids, walked across the ash layer. And then there was another volcanic eruption that buried the footprints. So that obviously there had to be some point in time when that landscape was stable. People were walking across it. It didn't just all appear in one instance. In fact, where did these footprints come from if all the human beings were, were being wiped out in this single flood instance, and the ones that survived were all on the ark, safe and sound? Who were these folks that were walking across leaving these footprints in these layers where there should be nothing in between these layers? Because the layers all were put down at the same time. Um, uh, in terms of finding things like trees in the geologic column, we find all kinds of unusual things in the geologic column. It's because the Earth is not static. 
it moves around a lot. In fact, um, if you want to understand stratigraphy, which is the science, the study of the, of the layers of the Earth, and you'll learn this in geology class, you have to understand that we talk about uh, layers being deposited, the oldest ones first, kind of like building a layer cake. You put the first layer of cake on, put a little icing on it, put the next layer on top. Which one was there first? The one at the bottom. But we also talk about that in a conformable sequence. That means where there hasn't been any evidence of earthquakes or volcanism or things where things get shifted around, things get mixed up. Um, that's quite common. And you have to be able to read the earth. Um, I have to stop there, but thank you. Oh, I guess I have the next question. This one says, Mr. Hartman, why do you think people should have more than one religion? And if you read the Bible, why do you teach evolution? I mean, the answer is clear, black and white. I don't think people should have more than one religion. I think you should have whatever religious beliefs you're comfortable with. Religious beliefs, lack of religious beliefs. I'm not going to dictate to you how you should believe, whether you should believe, whether you should not believe. That's why I don't stand up here and tell you that if you accept evolution, you must reject God. Any more than I will say, if you accept God, you must automatically reject evolution. Um, if you read the Bible, why do you teach evolution? I mean, the answer is clear, black, and white. Boy, not everybody reads the Bible. What do we do with those people? We just tell them they're wrong. They're all going to hell, by the way, uh, even though they may never have seen a Bible. What do we do about all the people that died before the Bible was written, or while it was being written, before they had a chance to read it? Where are they right now? We're just going to automatically, off the cuff, condemn these people. Um, well, I don't think we can do that. I don't think that, um, you know, you should necessarily say, you know, okay, this is my religious belief, and it should be yours because I'm right. And that's the only basis for this, because the Bible is a book of faith, right? You believe it or you don't believe it? If you believe it, well, great, good for you. How many different versions of the Bible are there? Just one? Oh, I don't think so. There are different interpretations. My Catholic Bible, when I was growing up, has extra books in it. The books of the Apocrypha. I'm, I'm sorry. Heresy. Okay. Now I'm going to be heckled. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Talk about ad hominem and the tax, right? Thank you. Um, I won't, by the way, return the favor. I, I, I won't do that. Um, you know, there's a billion Catholics in the world. They're all wrong. We're right. We know we're right because we're who we are. I'm divinely inspired. I know I'm right. Somebody else makes the same claim. It's the same thing we're doing up here in this debate. Stand up right now if you walked into this room believing that evolution was the be-all, the end-all, the word and the way, and now you've changed your mind. Or vice versa. I'm a Bible-thumping Christian, by golly, but you know what? I'm going to throw my Bible in the trash can because I don't believe it anymore. Did we change anybody's minds that radically tonight? It's not going to happen. I could be standing up here, an audience of Baptists, an audience of Presbyterians. I've given debates and lectures to Unitarian churches, to Catholic churches, to Lutheran churches. I listened. Uh, during the break, I had a gentleman come up and tell me that, you know, uh, basically I was misguided, I was evil, I had these evil followers. You know, I don't, I don't know where that... But he loved me. He said, but I love you. You're, you're evil, you're a bad fellow, you're teaching our children all these bad things, but, you know, I love you. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, well, let's see. We've got about ten subjects open here. I don't know if we're going to be able to close any of them. <laughs> uh, I do appreciate the, the response to, as far as ad hominem attacks, that's certainly not necessary. Uh, and, I, and I agree that uh, should not be included in debate. The, the material that we're discussing uh, is, needs to stick with science. Quite a few of these questions deal with which version of the Bible and stuff like that. Though I have a very strong opinion on that topic, I don't think that's the purpose of this debate tonight. Uh, we can settle that another night. You mentioned about the footprints. That was interesting uh, to me. St. Louis Zoo put human feet on their Lucy display, and yet not one foot bone was found. One of the professors from Washington University said, this statue is a complete misrepresentation, which is a polite way of saying they lied. The zoo director, Bruce Carr, said, zoo officials have no plans to knuckle under. We cannot be updating every exhibit based upon every new piece of evidence. We look at the overall exhibit and the impression it creates. 
we think the overall impression this exhibit creates is correct. I know what impression they're trying to get across, too. They're trying to impress the kids with the idea that they've got evidence for evolution when they really don't. The footprints you referred to found in the ash, it's interesting how they date that ash, by the way. We've got a long answer to that on videotape number seven, my question answer. And somebody mentioned during the, they came during the break and, and said, you're just in this for the money. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, I don't charge anything for my seminars. I have produced videotapes for 10 years that are not copyrighted. Anybody can get them and copy them and return them and get their money back. Show me any evolutionist that does the same thing, would you please? These footprints found in the ash, uh, they said here are 3.75 million years old, but they're perfectly normal human footprints. They even said in National Geographic, the footprints are described as remarkably similar to those of modern man. The form of his foot was exactly the same as ours. Weight-bearing pressure patterns in the prints resemble human ones. Footprints so very much like our own. And yet on the cover of National Geographic, they put dark-skinned, ape-like creatures. Here's a case where they find zero bones and create a missing link from footprints. Now, if the footprints are exactly like ours, how would you know it's dark-skinned and ape-like? Secondly, why did they put a toe separation if it's exactly like ours? This is propaganda, folks. This is not for education. This is propaganda and ought to be removed from the books. Oh, I think one more, I need my mic on, there'll be one more question from each uh, gentleman, and then we'll have the closing remarks after that, so one more question each. Can we and take then, like a two minute break before the closing remarks? Sure, okay. we can. Because I want to get some more water. All right. I got to oh. use half of my thanks. Um, I did not get time to call up the slides that I have for this one, but I cover this pretty thoroughly on my uh, video number six about the fossil record and the sorting of the fossils. The question says, please explain the order in the fossil record from simple to complex. If you use your infamous bird bones and clams argument, please keep in mind that there are far more than birds and clams. Okay, um, let me explain what the bird to clam argument is. What has happened in the early 1800s, some people decided evolution is true, and now we must go look for the evidence. So they start with the preconceived idea that evolution happened, and they did nothing but follow Aristotle's old chain of being, that you start with the simple and go to the complex. It, evolution is nothing more than a regurgitation of Aristotle's theory from 2004 or 500 years ago, whatever it was. Um, the sorting of the fossils in the fossil record, first place, there is no clear sorting to the fossils. And even major evolutionists will tell you, look folks, it's silly for the creationists to be arguing about the order of the fossil record because there is no good order to the fossil record. The fact is, I think clams are generally found at the bottom of the geologic column, though not always. I mean, clams are found on top of Mount Everest. But clams are generally found at the bottom because they're already at the bottom. I mean, when a flood comes, they're the first ones going to be buried, obviously. So I think they're buried, birds are buried on top because birds are going to be the last ones to drown in a flood. They fly around till they run out of gas. So they're sorted based upon their habitat. Secondly, they're sorted based upon their intelligence. As best anybody can figure out, clams are not too bright. Thirdly, they're sorted based upon their mobility. Clams cannot run very fast. So they're likely to be the first ones buried. And I think if there is any sorting to the geologic column, and there isn't a real good sorting, but any sorting that there is is based on hydrologic sorting that is obviously from a flood. See, some people don't like the idea of a flood because that means God, who created the world, has the authority to judge his creation. And they, don't, they want to keep their God, if they have one, they want to keep him in a box where he has no authority to judge their sin. I'm convinced that's the real hidden agenda behind all this. They don't, the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, in the last days, scoffers would come that would be willingly ignorant of the creation and the flood. And that's what we've got. Well, first of all, if there's no order, then there can be no sorting so that the clams wouldn't be at the bottom because they were stupid and the birds at the top because they were smart enough to fly away from it. They would be all mixed up. You wouldn't find the dumb animals at the bottom and the smart animals at the top. You simply would find everything all mixed up. Uh, the rest of the question, which I don't think Mr. Hovind got to, it's, it's difficult to read, admittedly. 
If you use your infinite birds and bones and clams arguments, please keep in mind that there are far more than birds and clams, and explain why the lighter, less dense creatures are near the bottom. Um, well, you know, if the dinosaurs got caught in a flood, and you know, maybe, maybe Noah did take two of each kind of dinosaur, two dinosaur kinds, but the rest of them certainly got wiped out in the flood. Um, they're heavy. Shouldn't they sink to the bottom? Heavy things sink to the bottom when they drown. Bodies sink to the bottom until they start to decompose and they bloat and they float back up. So why wouldn't you find everything that just sort of settled to the bottom? These things sort of settle out and they get all mixed up when they, when they settle out. Um, interesting note, uh, the single catastrophic event. You know, we brought up the fact earlier that in the Bible it claims that the earth is flat. You're also talking about a culture uh, when the Bible was written, or at least parts of it were written, who lived in, in fertile river valleys. And to them, catastrophic events were floods. So it was natural for them to write about floods. It's interesting that you don't find cultures that live in the desert necessarily writing about floods in their creation stories. They write about other kinds of creation. The Australian Aborigines, for example, who live in a desert, they talk about how the ancestors sang the world into creation. It's a really beautiful story. If you're not familiar with it, you should read it. Because I don't just read you know, the biblical creation stories. I read lots of different creation stories. Um, I don't necessarily agree with all of them. You, know, you can't agree with every one of them, but you know, uh, I don't tell somebody else that they can't agree with them either. Um, the stratigraphic column uh, does exist. Uh, we use things like biological correlation. You can go to one stratigraphic layer in one part of the country or the world and find an organism trapped in a particular layer. And you go to another part and you can find another fossil, uh, the same kind of animal. Oh, I have to stop now. In the same uh, stratigraphic profile. Uh, take a geology class. Monkeys, where do women evolve from? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Let me bring up uh, uh, Lucy and her kind, her kin, her kith and kin. Um, we talk about we don't have any bones from Lucy's foot, but Lucy's not the only Australopithecus afarensis to use the, the genus and species that we found. In fact, we have you know a number of them, including a, a group of 13 individuals uh, that we found. And we do have foot bones from them. Um, and this is just a, a comparison of a chimpanzee foot, an Australopithecine foot, not necessarily Lucy's foot, okay, but, but one of her species, and a human foot. And to talk about the fact that the, the footprints are, are fake because they're modern human footprints, this is an outline of one of the footprints at Lay Tolly. And it is clearly not a modern human footprint. It is what we would consider a transitional footprint. If an ape footprint, apes have opposable big toes, not unlike our thumbs. They're not exactly the same. Apes have slightly longer fingers and slightly shorter thumbs, but they're opposable. And believe me, you go to the zoo and you can watch chimpanzees can climb the heck out of trees. They got four hands, essentially, right? So they have an opposable big toe. Humans don't. We're bipedal creatures. We walk upright. We have a big toe that's in line with the rest of our toes. The soldiers all line up in perfect order. In fact, I'll tell you all to do an experiment tonight. When you get up and walk around, feel the weight of your body and how it's distributed on your feet. One of the reasons why that big toe is where it is is because it's a major balance point. If you lose your little toe in an accident, get it cut off, you don't have to necessarily learn how to walk all over again. It might be difficult you know, while it's sore, but if you lose your big toe, and my nephew had a lawnmower accident, he lost his big toe to a lawnmower, it took him several months of recuperation and therapy to learn how to walk again because he lost a major balance point. That's what we use it for. Okay? The footprint of the Australopithecines that lived about three million years ago, which is about halfway in between when we think humans first emerged and today, has a foot that is transitional. Here are the bones and here is an outline of the footprint. These are, this is an outline of the Laetoli footprint with the bones superimposed so you can see how it fits together. The big toe is off at an angle. It's not opposable like you would expect to see an ape footprint. It's not straight in line like you would expect to see a modern human footprint. Okay? It is what we call a divergent big toe. It's off at a slight angle. Now, if I'm going to tell you that in evolutionary terms, we transitioned, we went from a quadruped, an ape-like creature that had opposable big toes to a bipedal human-like creature that doesn't have an opposable big toe, the transition has to be somewhere in the middle. It can't be fully opposable and it can't be in a straight line. It's somewhere in between. And that's, by golly, what we see here. Somewhere in between. And I'll stop there. Would you like me to leave this up? Or?
Yes, if you don't mind, that would be great. Um, there are two books we have on our table over here that deal with this subject. One is called Bones of Contention, which goes through the uh, information about the uh, Lucy, the Australopithecines. Um, the one that was labeled Lucy in National Geographic, 1985, was not L Lucy's knee, at least, was not Lucy's knee at all. Uh, Donald Johansson let that one slide by. I've got, I think, all of Donald's books at home. Um, Lucy, if the toe is slightly separated, again, I point out, folks, you're finding a bone in the dirt. You don't know that it had any kids. And as far as the way they date those layers, it's really hilarious when you get into it to see how these layers are dated. Um, if we had time, I didn't quite get time to call it up because we're jumping back and forth so many subjects here, but the layers of ash are dated by typically potassium argon dating. We cover that for probably 30 minutes on videotape number seven and also on my website, drdino.com, with some of the wild dates that are obtained by potassium argon dating. Uh, a layer of ash called the KBS tuft had been dated for years at being 212 million years old. They dated it several different ways. Everybody agreed that's 212 million years old until Richard Leakey found a perfectly normal human skull under the KBS tuft. Now they have to go back and redate re the KBS tuft because they know their date wasn't right. But the only reason you know it wasn't right is because it didn't match uh, what your, your preconceived idea of evolution. I don't have time. We've got less than a minute. I can't even get my slides up for this. But the, a person that goes barefoot all of their life has a, a foot that's a different shape and wider. The width to length ratio is different than a person that wears shoes all their life. The opposable toe that they put on the uh, footprints in uh, the Laetoli ash over there is not what the footprints showed. I mean, you can read the National Geographic article. It says his form of his foot was exactly the same as ours. So to try to claim that this is a missing link, I think, is silly. First place, all you have are the footprints. And you, they, they create these missing links to try to impress the kids that they have some kind of evidence for evolution. There is none. All we have are apes today, and humans today, and chimpanzees today, and there's no intermediates. That just proves the same designer created them all. Um, this subject, I, th I feel, is extremely important. Uh, probably the most important subject in the world is for a person to decide, who are we, why are we here, where did we come from, and what is the purpose of life? There's only two options, creation and evolution. These two options are polar opposites. There is no compromise between the two. Somebody is wrong. And I think it's worth, uh, it's, it's, it's important that students be shown both sides. I would say, I could, I would, without a fear of successful contradiction, I could say the schools today, the public schools today, do not show students both sides fairly. The evidence is only given that supports the one religion of evolution. The students are not shown evidence to support creation. For instance, if they notice, they'll, they'll point out to the students that you have two bones in your wrist, the radius and the ulna. The whale has two bones in his flipper. You know, the bat has two bones in his forelimb. And then they will say, see, this indicates a common ancestor. Now hold on just a minute. That indicates a common designer. But that is never mentioned in the textbooks. If you really want to be fair and give the kids an education, then you give them all of the options. If you're trying to indoctrinate, of course, then you hide some of the evidence from them or some of the interpretations of the evidence. Um, the Bible's pretty clear that the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. They are without excuse. Nobody's going to stand before God Judgment Day and say, the evidence pointed me toward evolution. No, no, you decided to interpret the evidence that way. You could just as easily have decided to interpret the evidence for a creator if you wanted to. Some people don't like the idea that God created the world because that means there might be some accountability. There might be some rules, you know, thou shalt not commit adultery or thou shalt not steal or something like that. And I'm not, sure, I'm not saying that every person who believes in evolution is wicked, but I've met an awful lot of people who like the theory because it justifies their lifestyle. I've met an awful lot of folks like that. Look, if I was going to invent a God... I would not invent one that tells me I can't do certain things that I like to do. The Christian God would be the last one somebody would invent. Because he tells you, thou shalt not do some things, and that's just natural. You want to do some of those things that he says you shouldn't do. The God of the Bible is not the God of our imagination. It's the God of the universe that created everything. And there's going to be no excuse. When we stand before him, he's going to, every knee shall bow, and you will be judged according to God's word. The Bible says, though, in 2 Thessalonians, that God shall send them strong delusion 
that they should believe a lie. My 30-year study of this has led me to the conclusion that evolution is a lie, and those who believe it are deluded. We see evidence for microevolution, and they are deluded into believing that that is evidence for macroevolution and cosmic evolution and the other ones that I gave. There are six different meanings, folks. One of them is scientific. The other five are purely religious, and they are delusion. If you want to believe them, that's fine. I don't care what you believe. But don't teach that to kids in school. Now, if you want to teach your kids at home, keep your religion at home, okay? Teach them you came from a monkey if you want, or teach them you came from a rock if you want. I don't care what you want to teach your kids at home. But I, I object to them using my tax dollars to spread this stuff in our schools. See, these two theories are polar opposites. If creation is true, there's a creator. <laughs> it's plain and simple. Some people don't like that idea because it chaps their hide. If evolution is true, there is no creator. If creation is true, there are rules. If evolution is true, there are no rules. I challenge you to answer this question. If evolution is true, how do you determine right from wrong? I had a student tell me at Pennsylvania at a public school. I speak in a lot of public schools. I was in five last week. This kid told me in the public school, he sat on the second row. He said, Mr. Hovind, I'm an atheist. I said, really? He said, yes, there is no God. I said, are you sure? He said, oh, I'm sure. I said, well, tell me, son. Uh, if, you're, uh, are you sh if you're sure there's no God, how do, you how do you determine right from wrong? He said, oh, that's easy. I decide if something is right or wrong because, he said, I'm the God of my own universe. I said, well, I'm glad to hear about that, son, because I'm going to shoot you in five minutes. He said, you can't do that. I said, oh, yes, I can. You see, I'm the God of my own universe, and I decided it's fine for me to shoot you. Now, one professor was getting pretty upset in a debate I did one time, and he said, there are no absolutes. I said, are you absolutely sure? Uh, think about it, okay? Yes, there are absolutes, thus saith the Lord. And some people don't like that absolute. But see, evolution is a nice way to get by, get by with saying there are no rules. There's no standard for right and wrong. If creation is true, there's a purpose to life. You're made in God's image. But if evolution is true, there really is no purpose to life. You might as well have fun. If it feels good, do it. Get all the gusto you can get. You only go around once, you know. The humanist philosophies that stem from evolution are frightening. I cover in video number five how that evolution is the foundation for communism and socialism and Marxism. Adolf Hitler was a strong believer in evolution and was simply fulfilling what the theory teaches. The strongest should survive, the weaker should be eliminated for the good of the species. He was acting out what evolution really teaches. If creation is true, then man's a fallen creature. He needs a savior. But if evolution is true, you don't need a savior. Save from what? There's no such thing as sin. That's why the devil gets people to believe this theory, so they won't come to the Savior. He hates you. He wants you to go to hell. God loves you. He wants you to come to heaven. If creation is true, then man brought death into the world. If evolution is true, death brought man into the world. Death is the hero of the plot for evolution. They don't talk about it much, but that's the way it has to work. One animal has to evolve characteristics that are a little bit better, and the rest of them have to die, folks. Death is how we get ahead. Charles Darwin said so in his book. Thus from the war of famine and death, and I forget the exact quote, but I've got it here. He said, the most uh, advanced species, were, are, the most important thing we're capable of conceiving, the advancement of higher animals directly follows. Some words to that effect. Charles Darwin was convinced that death and suffering and war and famine was a wonderful thing because that's how we get ahead. I quote that in detail in my video number four. If creation is true, there's an afterlife. God not only made you, he made you for a purpose. Now, if you don't want to do what he says, that's your business. But you'll stand before him one day, and so will I. If evolution is true, there absolutely is no afterlife. You just get recycled into a worm or a plant. If creation is true, you can actually know the future. Not with evolution. No hope. If you think I leave my gorgeous wife, because I like to come up here and look at you better, you're mistaken. My wife broke her tailbone nine weeks ago and is sitting at home right now in excruciating pain and it hurts me deeply to have to leave. She's, she's, she's fine. I can't do anything much for her except, you know, sit there and talk to her and comfort her. But um, I came because I want students to see there's evidence 
for the other side, and there is no evidence that we've seen any animal produce any different kind of animal. And it's unfortunate that kids in the universities are not shown the evidence for creation. Why are they lied to? Why are they shown that kids are, why are they told that the baby has gill slits? Go check your biology textbooks, folks, right now. It's in your textbooks right here, proven wrong in 1874. Why would somebody leave that in the textbooks? One professor I debated, I gave about 30 different things that are not true in the textbooks, and he said, folks, Mr. Hoven's right, these things are not true. But, Mr. Hoven, I got a question for you. What would you replace them with? I said, folks, what he's trying to not say is, hey, we want the kids to believe in evolution. We have to give them some evidence. He's taken away our evidence, so he's got to find a replacement. I said, sir, I'm sorry. If you don't have any evidence for your theory, I'm sorry. Maybe you should find a new theory. But it's not, the burden of proof's not on me to replace evidence. I think we just simply ought to get the textbooks, which contain lots of good science, and cut out the bad science. And I go through that on video number four of all the pages that need to be removed from your textbooks, and the books will be fine. You don't need to buy a whole new book. I'm not trying to get creation into the schools. I'm not trying to get the Bible into the schools. I want the schools to teach science. And evolution is not part of science. Microevolution is really a bad name. We ought to just call it a variation. That's all it really is. See, the devil's a liar. He's deceived people. The Bible says he's a liar. I think he's using this evolution theory to lead folks to hell. Now, you don't go to hell because you believe in evolution. You go to hell because you haven't accepted Jesus Christ. And I don't want anybody to go to hell. Hey, if you died today, where would you go? You're going to be dead for a long time, you know. The Bible says God cannot lie. He said he'd save you if you'd ask him. 31 years ago, I asked him. Every one of us is going to die. I'm going to try to make it the last thing I do, but it's going to happen. <laughs> And it's going to happen to you too, and you better be prepared for that because you're going to be dead for a long time. I know one thing. Even if all else is taken away, my position is certainly a lot safer. If I'm wrong, I haven't lost a thing. I've had a wonderful life. What if the evolutionist is wrong? It's going to be a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. Thank you so much. Purpose to life. Well, let me start with that. Purpose to life. Uh, Dr. Hovind started out earlier this evening talking about humans having a basic desire to understand things. Uh, where, we, where, where we came from, how we came to be, um, why we are where we are. We all have a curious nature, don't we? And human beings are curious if nothing else. I mean, if we weren't, we wouldn't be doing half the things that we're doing. What purpose to life does evolution offer us? Well, it offers us a chance to learn where we came from, how we came to be, what we're doing here. No morals. Evolution doesn't really discuss morals or not. That's a question for society. What would happen if Dr. Hovind decided that I'm going to murder you in five minutes? Would all of you just stand here and let him do it because that's his personal belief and he believes that that's right? Society doesn't allow that. Society sets rules. There are lots of societies that aren't based on the Christian faith that have lots of moral rules. People understand right from wrong whether it's dictated to them in a religious doctrine or not. We have to have rules if we're going to live in a society. Don't we? See, if you look at, you know, I also teach about different cultures in the anthropology department. If you look at a, a hunting and gathering society, a small group of people, 25 people, living together in a certain area, and they sort of wander around the landscape, hunting and gathering for a living, you know, they don't have a whole lot of rules, because there's only 25 of them. 25 people, they all know each other. They all know if you screw up. They know if you took it into your own mind to murder somebody else, you know, they're not going to let you get away with it. But what happens when society starts to grow? 
There are more and more and more of us. How many people do you think are in this room right now? 100, 200 people? Could we all get along the same way? We have to set down some kind of rules. How many people in here have ever broken a law in your life? Raise your hand if you've ever... Speed limit. That's a law. That's wrong, folks. But, you know, you didn't get caught. Or maybe you did get caught and you had to pay a little fine. How many people have ever murdered somebody in here? Raise your hand if you've committed murder. Well, nobody's going to raise their hand because the rest of us are going to turn around and go, they did it. Because we as a society decide what rules we're going to live by, what rules we're going to have to obey. And, you know, there are sort of minor rules and major rules. You have to understand how society functions, how culture functions. Culture didn't just appear overnight either. It's evolved. Lots of the great state-level societies, the Western world is included in this, have rules that are based on religious doctrine. The Egyptians had rules. The Aztecs had rules. Some of them were pretty nice rules and some of them were pretty evil rules or bad rules. It depends on your, your way of looking at things. We don't necessarily excuse them. All westernized societies that are based on Christianity aren't always good. Now the Muslims will attest to that during the 12th and 13th centuries when the Crusades were happening. A group of religious people got together and decided to go out and convert or kill people if they didn't want to be converted. Well, Dr. Hoven was also spending a great deal of time saying that we want evidence. Show me the evidence. Like, show me the money. Show me the beef. Where's the beef? Give me the evidence. He's holding us up to a standard that he doesn't want to participate in. Here's my offer. Here's my proof. It's in this Bible. Believe it or don't believe it. If you don't believe it, why are you going to be in trouble? Maybe. Maybe not. There are an awful lot of people, evolutionists aside, take the evolutionists out of the equation. There are lots of other people who are devoutly religious, hold very deep religious beliefs who would argue that point, just as vehemently as he would argue his point. But see, most of the people in this room agree with him, so he's right. The other people are wrong. We know they're wrong. They lose. Boy, don't you wonder why there's so much strife in the world? Why we all can't get along? Why can't we? Why don't we all agree? If this is the, 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 the truth, you know, there's an awful lot of people being deceived. Maybe they are. I'm not telling you they are or they aren't. That's not what I'm here to do. That's for you to decide for yourself. A personal decision. I don't think it's fair to hold somebody up to a level of proof that you're not willing to hold yourself up to. What benefits do we get from uh, evolution? I think he mentioned that there weren't any. Uh, how many of you here have been vaccinated for any number of diseases? Anything. Measles, smallpox, polio, all of that came out of evolutionary studies. We studied viruses. We studied bacteria. We studied parasitology. We look at parasites, things that make us sick. And we come up with ways to combat them that are a direct result of evolutionary studies. We understand how these things came to be, how they live. Viruses are weird little creatures. We're not really sure if they're alive or not. They're sections of DNA, they're fragments of DNA that invade your cells, right, like the flu virus, and it does weird things to your cells, and we have to figure out a way to combat it. How many of you had a flu shot this year? I had one. I have to get one at work at the zoo. Anybody get the flu regardless of having the flu shot? Because there are different strains of flu out there. And they're evolving. They're constantly new ones. They're becoming resistant to our antibiotics. If you go to the doctor and they put you on antibiotics, the next time you go, they can't put you on the same ones because the virus that you may have may be resistant to that. That's evolution. I brought a couple of books with me tonight. I just grabbed this one off my shelf. Uh, it's called Understanding Human Evolution, fourth edition by Frank Porter and Jeffrey McKee. And I bought a copy of the Bible. This is a 1901, this was printed. Let's see if I can tell you which version it is real quick. The Holy Bible contained the Old and New Testaments translated out of the original tongues, being the version set forth AD 1611, compiled with the most ancient authorities and revised AD 1881 to 1885. 
It's the 1901 Standard Edition. There's a, there's a difference between these two books. This is a science book, and this is a religious book. You're not going to find any science in here. Uh, you're probably not going to find a lot of religion in here. Okay? There's a difference. This is a science book. It was meant to be revised. Because science is constantly changing. We're constantly finding new things. Dr. Hoven keeps pointing out all the things that Charles Darwin said. Most evolutionists would say, well, Charles Darwin had, had a lot of, he set forth a lot of our basic understanding of evolution, but we don't, we don't simply hold up Darwin and say, he was right. It's all natural selection. It's everything he said is correct. We've revised his theory. This is the fourth edition of this book. Every two or three years, we revise what's in the book because we learn new things. We're constantly learning new things. We know more now than we knew 140 years ago when Darwin wrote The Origin of the Species. He didn't know about Gregor Mendel's work with the pea plants from the 19th century. That wasn't rediscovered until the early 1900s. He didn't understand DNA. If he had, he probably would have written a little bit different version of his theory, the same way we're doing today. We revise the science books. We're not trying to deceive anybody. If you pick up a book from the 1960s, there will undoubtedly be errors in it because we've learned new things. A hundred years ago, we didn't understand that bacteria could cause diseases. 150 years ago. Now we do. Should we not put that in the science book? Should we not revise the theory? We have to. This book was not designed to be revised. Right? We can't use this uh, simply to explain all of nature. God gave us a curious nature, and then he said, all the answers you need are here. Why do we have a curious nature? Why do humans seek to understand where we come from? I like, uh, I know a lot of you are anti-Catholics. I got that from the heckling I got earlier. But I thought I would read part of the papal bull put out by Paul II. It has nothing to do with Catholicism. He simply said that uh, the Bible does not attempt to teach us how heaven was made. It's simply there to tell us how to get there. Other books need to address how the heavens were made, how we came to be, where we came from. Evolutionary theory is a scientific theory. It's not a belief system. I don't care if you believe in it or not. It doesn't alter the, 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 the basic concepts as we understand them. Microevolution is there. We understand microevolution to be accumulated into macroevolutionary changes, which causes one species not to be able to breed with another species. Dr. Hovind's already admitted that that is true. He said there certainly are creatures like that. There have to be. If that's true, then you have to accept evolution. Now, whether or not you choose to accept uh, uh, the Bible as well, that's your business. I have to stop now. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time, and I appreciate you inviting me. First of all, um, I say thank you, both of you guys, for coming. Give both of them a round of applause, would you? The, uh, the primary reason for Heritage Baptist Temple holding this debate is not to get you just to believe in creation, but it's that you'll be saved. And you know what? If you're not saved, not only will you not make heaven, but you're missing a great life that God has for you. Our desire is not that we're putting our thumb on you and making you feel ignorant and making you feel strange, but our desire is, hey, we know what it means to be saved and what a blessing it is. Why don't you just look to the truth? You know, the Bible says in Isaiah 45, 22, look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. Listen, God loves you. In Jeremiah 31, he says he draws you with an everlasting love. Do you want to know more about how to combat the godless theory of evolution? Creation Science Evangelism offers four great tools that help strengthen the faith of believers and win the lost to Christ. After 15 years of teaching high school science, Dr. Hoven began Creation Science Evangelism in 1989. We are a ministry that is dedicated to providing tools which will help you combat the evolution philosophy that is destroying the faith of millions every year. The first tool Creation Science offers is their powerful, life-changing video series. 
Over the last 12 years, well over a million videotapes of Dr. Hovind's seminar have circled the globe. They are reaping a harvest of souls for the kingdom of Christ, as well as helping restore the faith of many thousands confused by the evolution propaganda to which they've been subjected. These videos are available in English, Russian, French, Spanish, Japanese, and sign language. The Age of the Earth, first of the seven-part series, teaches that God created the universe about 6,000 years ago in six literal days. Could this be true? Can it be scientifically proven that the Earth is not billions of years old? This tape gives solid scientific evidence that the Earth is young and that the Bible is scientifically accurate. How did the environment of the original creation differ from ours today? And how would this allow men to live over 900 years? Can Christians have a good explanation for the existence of dinosaurs? Could some dinosaurs still be alive today? These and many more questions are covered in the second and third part of the series. Evolution has permeated public school textbooks with false and fraudulent information. This video exposes nearly 30 lies commonly found in textbooks. Every public school student, teacher, and school board member needs to watch part four of this series. Find out if you have been lied to in your textbooks. Discover the terrible difference evolutionary beliefs have made in the past as well as in recent history in our video number five. Dictators throughout time have used their evolution-based philosophies to rationalize their brutal actions. Learn how evolution propaganda is being used today to prepare people for the new world order. This is just a taste of all the information the 17-hour seminar series has to offer. Also available are college courses that expand on the seminars in great detail. For those who can handle a more confrontational atmosphere, our debate series is just for you. I said, now, Mr. Patterson, if you think the tailbone is a vestigial, I, Kent Hovind, will pay to have yours removed. Dr. Hovind has debated a wide range of atheists and evolutionists all over the country. And you're sure to find these 12 debates very exciting. These would be perfect to present to that scientifically minded person who likes to argue their point. Our topical series includes exciting topics like why evolution is stupid, public school presentation, children's video about dinosaurs, the Bible and health, Leviathan, the fire-breathing dragon, and many more. Creation Science also offers a variety of visuals, like the longevity chart, which presents the entire lineage of Adam to Joseph as given in Genesis. It's exciting to see exactly how many generations were alive at the same time. Hundreds of books on a variety of subjects, videos on incredible creatures that defy evolution, t-shirts, fossils, and more. Make Creation Science Evangelism the one-stop shopping center for your creation material needs. Our two websites, www.drdino.com and www.dinosauradventureland.com, provide our second tool for evangelism. Drdino.com is packed with lots of information, from charts and graphs to articles and frequently asked questions. This is also where you will find more information on all of the products CSE has to offer. Dinosauradventureland.com is great for the kids. They can play lots of fun games and see unusual rides and activities located at Dinosaur Adventureland in Pensacola, Florida. Thousands visit our sites regularly to gain insight into God's creation. The third tool available to you is the live seminars conducted by Dr. Hovind and his son Eric. Since 1989, Dr. Hovind has held seminars and debates in hundreds of churches, schools, and universities in 49 states and 30 foreign countries. His fast-paced, illustrated seminars cover diverse topics, such as evidence for a young earth, how long Adam lived, dinosaurs living with man, where races came from, radiometric dating, and much more. Our fourth tool is the new, exciting Dinosaur Adventureland. Many thousands have come from all across America to visit our museum, creation bookstore, science center, and theme park, where God gets the glory for science. Our unusual swings, rides, and activities each have a science lesson as well as a spiritual lesson. Captivate everyone from age 4 to 94. To order material, find out how to schedule a seminar at your church, or get more information about Dinosaur Adventureland, write to us 
at Creation Science Evangelism, 29 Cummings Road, Pensacola, Florida, 32503. Or call us at 850-479-3466. Or toll free in the U.S., 877-479-3466. We think many of your dragon legends could actually be stories about what we today call dinosaurs. People would say that the dragon legends of old are obviously not true, but it's only obvious because of their preconception that dinosaurs died out so long ago. But when you have this, this universal theme right across the globe, many different continents, many different cultures, and over a, a vast span of human history, then there's probably going to have to be some universal core truth there. Dinosaurs are probably used more than anything to convince people of millions of years. I mean, even little kids all know about dinosaurs. Just just say the word dinosaurs and see what they say next. They probably would say evolution. (laughs) Those two concepts are inextricably linked. The most common objections they encounter is that the Bible can't be true because science has disproved it. You ask them what that means, they mean evolution millions of years. If the soft tissue means what it apparently means, and that is the dinosaurs were around recently. There was no dinosaur age, where only dinosaurs lived and it millions of years ago. Once you topple millions of years, you have no time for evolution. The more you study about dinosaurs, they really fit with creation. And, and the evidence seems to go with humans encountering dinosaurs and not very long ago. Creatures like this were supposed to be separated by mankind for 65 to 70 million years. Yet, here we have respectable people writing in their history books, this is what I've seen, this is what I've witnessed. someone's gonna say something like what got something against Danny oh don't play dumb you know what I mean (laughs) still gonna read it it's on you then nothing to do with me fine okay kids come on over gather around good at story time come on find a seat on the carpet can everybody see yeah okay good okay guys today's story is called Danny the dragon Thank you all for coming. Please note that the opinions expressed during the story time are those of the author and do not necessarily represent those of the Monroe Library or its staff. Thanks, Tony. Would you like me to have them sign release forms? (laughs) Once upon a time, not too long ago, there was a dragon named Danny. He lived in a deep, isolated cave along an ocean coast. One day, he wandered out of the water and saw some houses and people. Curious, he lumbered closer for a better look. Dragons, just the word conjures up all these images and, and people's attention goes right to the, uh, that, uh, the dragons. People want to know about dragons. Dragon legend is absolutely a phenomenon. Um, there are literally too many legends to count. They're in every tribe and nation, every people group. And uh, you have them in China, Australia, Africa, Europe, North America, and South America, everywhere people inhabit. Dragons are really interesting creatures. I think there's not a child with soul so dead that he hasn't become fascinated by dragon stories and dragon legends. And, and the thing that's always struck me as amazing is that it's not, a, it's not a regional legend. It's not a legend of the Chinese, but nobody else, or a legend of the Europeans and nobody else. It's everybody's legend. Now, a legend is, of course, a a legend. It's a fairy tale. But is there, in fact, most anthropologists will tell you that whenever you have a legend or mythology, that there's usually something that happened that started that myth. So the point is there there is some consistent threads in these different cultures, South Sea Island, South Pacific, American Indians, and so forth. So uh, when you find uh, the similar kinds of legends that suggest that either a common legend uh, exchange or 
those legends deriving from some kind of historical antecedent. If we're to believe that they're mythological, that really presents a logical problem for us because there is a consistency that happens throughout all the dragon legends. Of course, dragon legends can become sensational. You know, a lot of your pagan religions attach some sort of meaning to these things. Like uh, a lot of times in Chinese mythology, a dragon would, you know, be responsible for the tides or, uh, or it would control the water or something like that. But if you scrape away all the sensationalism, you actually have a very real creature at the bottom of them that is consistent throughout all really in the entire world you just have a large scaled reptile that has uh, many of them fly some of them don't but the ones that do fly have wings like a bat and uh, they're carnivorous and they're basically going to gnaw your face off and it is consistent no matter where you go um, and that truly is remarkable they look like big reptiles with long tails with scales uh, with uh, sharp teeth uh, claws Oftentimes three claws, by the way, uh, which many of the dinosaurs did have three claws, like theropods. So I believe they're what many people uh, have uh, called dragons or have been translated to the word dragon, uh, uh, really reflect a, a human experience widespread among almost all cultures of having witnessed at some point in history very, very large, very frightening reptiles. You know, the, the dragon legends, uh, the, the stories of these dragons, they always talk about these huge reptilian beasts with fierce teeth and, and prickly spines, and, and they just sound so much like dinosaurs. It's like um, knowing about Julius Caesar or Alexander the Great, we have to rely on, on historical records of these things, because you can't scientifically prove that Julius Caesar existed. It's always a matter of history. I think dragons... A lot of that will be um, um, widespread historical writings of such creatures, including, for instance, the Chinese calendar, where you have 12 um, animals. Uh, one of them is a dragon. I'm, I'm, I was born in the year of a dragon. But all the animals are treated e as equally real. So it does seem like the Chinese people did see a creature we would now call a dragon, which they called the Long Actually, there are a lot of legends of dragons being used for breeding. The Chinese have stories about breeding dragons. Um, there are artifacts that show um, people riding these things. It's quite remarkable that, uh, to, to many people, that Australian Aboriginal people actually have uh, accounts of their ancestors having encountered creatures that today, by any reckoning, you'd describe as being dinosaurs on the basis of scientists' reconstructions from fossils. Uh, on a personal level, I recall meeting a, a university researcher in the Northern Territory in Darwin after giving a, a presentation there a couple of years ago. And she said that she'd been working with the local Larrakia Aboriginal people. And they, um, had a word for a fierce creature that lived in the local swamps there that used to terrorise uh, the um, first Aboriginal people who'd come to that area via canoes from another country far away. And when this university researcher said to them, oh, that word obviously means crocodile, the Larrakia people responded, no, we've got a different word for crocodile. Uh, this other creature, in fact, looks very similar to some of your dinosaurs in your children's book about dinosaurs. There is an Indian legend called the Thunderbirds. And according to legend, these huge bird-like creatures would fly and they would actually be able to bring thunder with them. And at first that seems sensational. But if you start looking at the evidence, things change just a little bit. Because what is in the Black Hills in South Dakota, the, the legend is that these, these, these giant thunderbirds would actually fly to the top of the Black Hills and they would like nest there. Now what is fascinating is that scientists have long believed that those kind of um, gigantic creatures needed strong winds to propel them to high heights. And so in the West where you have these gigantic thunderstorms, it is really postulated that these, these gigantic um, pteranodons would catch thermal updrafts of these storms that would lift them to the top of places like the Black Hills. So from a, an Indian's perspective that is trying to, to uh, pull meaning from the things in nature, they would look at these, uh, what they would call thunderbirds and go, wow, they are bringing thunder. But it's actually, uh, what's really happening is that it's the thunderstorms that are actually bringing the pteranodons. This is taken from a book named After the Flood where he recounts 
Dinosaurs in the form of flying reptiles were a feature of Welsh life until surprisingly recent times. As late as the beginning of the present century, elderly folk at Penlyn in Glamorgan used to tell of a colony of winged serpents that lived in the woods around Penlyn Castle. As Mary Trevelyan tells us, the woods around Penlyn Castle, Glamorgan, had the reputation of being frequented by winged serpents, and these were the terror of old and young alike. An aged inhabitant of Penlyn, who died a few years ago, said that in his boyhood the winged serpents were described as very beautiful. He said it was no old story invented to frighten children, but a real fact. His father and uncle had killed some of them, for they were as bad as foxes for poultry. The old man attributed the extinction of the winged serpents to the fact that they were terrors in the farmyards and coverts. This is a pteranodon, an example of one. And by the way, not all of them were huge with big long wings. And in Beowulf, it describes two different kinds. One which had massive huge wings, which we know existed from fossils, 30 foot and more wingspan. But there's another kind of winged serpent that was smaller, but it was just as much a pest, not just in Beowulf, but in England and to the North American Indians and Central American Indians, etc. Interestingly, there's a Scandinavian king called Beowulf, and there's a very famous poem about his exploits. And if you read about his description of this big beast that he, he killed because it was terrorizing the villagers, it's a very accurate description of a Tyrannosaurus rex. Most people say Beowulf is entirely mythical because there's all these monsters in it. But if you read Beowulf, the poem, it doesn't say fairies and magic elves. It's talking about the Grendel. It's talking about a bipedal monster with giant mouth and big teeth that ate people, just like we might imagine a pteropod dinosaur might do. In the Agat National Park in Nebraska, there are these structures in the side of the rocks called Devil's Corkscrews. And for years, scientists thought that the plants or some sort of plant created these spiral structures that descend from the surface down about six feet. Um, but it was not until they started excavating them that they found these little fossils of beavers at the bottom of them. And they found out that these beavers made these wild corkscrew lodges um, in the rock. and. Uh, Evolutionary timelines would put this beaver to be extinct about 30 million years ago. But the problem with that is that uh, American Indians know full well what those corkscrews were. And if you would have asked a Lakota Indian, they would have told you they were beaver lodges. My point with Haas Eagle is the Maoris tell a legend about a giant eagle. And it's easy for us to say, oh, giant eagle, pff, whatever. But it's been verified and it's published. It's the real deal. It was a giant eagle. So if they were right about the giant eagle, then perhaps peoples have been telling the truth in their legends of other creatures too. Most people today accept that dinosaurs have become extinct and even uh, creationists who uh, look at the accounts of uh, apparent recent human uh, dinosaurial contact would say, look, it does seem that dinosaurs are extinct. However, there are some tantalising accounts of sightings in very recent decades from various places around the world. Uh, in the Congo, for example, the local people there talk of a creature they call Mokele Mbembe. And when uh, Westerners have gone in with drawings of African creatures and dinosaur handbooks, uh, and they've pointed to pictures of, say, the hippopotamus or the rhino. The people have said, no, that's not Makele Mbembe. And when shown a picture of a sauropod dinosaur, in a dinosaur handbook, they've pointed to something like a small sauropod dinosaur. Uh, another example comes to mind, the Lake Murray region of Papua New Guinea. Uh, there were people there out in a canoe, and as they looked under their canoe, they saw a large creature swim under the canoe that had what looked like triangular plates extending down its back and all the way down its long tail. And the people speak there of uh, large nesting sites um, adjacent to the water's edge, uh, which have been clearly left by a large creature. If you only had one or two stories uh, that sounded a bit similar to dinosaurs, you could see it as uh, just a coincidence. But when you have this, this universal theme right across the globe, many different continents, many different cultures, and over a vast span of human history, then there's probably going to have to be some universal core truth there. In fact, the late Dr. Carl Sagan, one of the most well-known of all the world's evolutionists, took it so seriously that he actually wrote a book called The Dragons of Eden to, to 
try and answer this question as to how come there are so many different stories of dragons that are very similar to the dinosaurs when no one's ever seen a dinosaur. And the answer he came up with in his book was essentially that, um, well, we evolved from reptiles, so part of our brain is, is a sort of a leftover of when we lived in the age of the reptiles, and so dragon legends are really, if you like, inherited memories from the age of reptiles. Now, there was an embarrassed silence from many of his evolutionary colleagues because, of course, there's uh, no scientific credibility to the idea that memories are inherited. You know, that you might r remember what some ancestor did when he was serving Cleopatra or something like that. Uh, but the importance of that little account was that one of the world's leading evolutionists took this issue so seriously that he tried to explain it, even though he didn't do a very good job. A much better explanation is that the Bible is right, that man and dinosaur did live together, and what we see are the somewhat corrupted legends, um, somewhat corrupted stories of a time when people and dinosaurs did really know each other. Some people saw Danny coming. He was huge with scales and a long tail. They ran away screaming, dragon, dragon, run for your lives. Danny yelled, come back. But it just sounded like, roar. This made everyone run faster. Stories about Danny's huge teeth and claws soon spread across the land. If these really are stories based on memory, that means that at one point in time, man did see dinosaurs. In National Bridges National Monument, Utah, there's actually some carvings, petroglyphs, done by the Indians that even an evolutionist in an evolutionary textbook says looks like a sauropod dinosaur. And we've actually had a team go out there, they've seen it, photographed it, uh, did a wax cloth impression of it, and it just looks like a sauropod dinosaur. But of course the evolutionists would say, well no, it must be some mythical animal, why? Because dinosaurs didn't live with people. Well, how do you know that? And, and so to me, that sort of evidence, when you look at your dragon legends, many of the descriptions of those dragons actually fit nicely what we would call dinosaurs. And many of your dragon carvings, for instance, uh, that you see dragon paintings around the world, they look like some of the dinosaurs that we would understand existed from the fossil record. The exact date was 1186 AD. And it's a stone temple that's in the Angkor Wat temple complex around Cambodia. and. Uh, in a jungle area. There's a number of stone carvings of uh, things that are familiar to us today along with Hindu and Buddhist mythology and very distinctively there's one that looks very much like a stegosaur as, uh, as reconstructed from fossils by scientists and the question becomes how did the people who carved that stone 800 years ago have carved so beautifully uh, a stegosaur without having um, had any knowledge about what's in today's encyclopedias? And the clear conclusion is they were familiar with those creatures because they were alive at the same time. Unless it was living, how could they get its anatomy correct? They had to see it in order to reproduce it correctly. And that's just one of over 80 instances around the world in every single continent where it's been found that humans and dinosaurs have coexisted because the humans have reproduced dinosaurs in one art form or another. There's a cathedral in the UK, Carlisle Cathedral, uh, which has been there a very long time. And one of the bishops buried there uh, 600 years ago has uh, on the brass trimmings around his tomb a number of uh, engravings of animals, many of which are familiar to us today, but there's also some that look very much like sauropod dinosaurs. In fact, any 21st century child would immediately recognise them as being sauropod dinosaurs. And so when we think about the evolutionary view that says dinosaurs became extinct, 65 million years ago, and then we look at these sauropod dinosaur engravings on this 600-year-old tomb, how did they get there? The oldest artifact that we have, period, is an Egyptian slate that commemorates uh, an Egyptian king. And Hierakonpolis slate is one of the names given to this artifact. And on one side it shows him grasping the head of his recently defeated foe and about to chop the head off. So it's, it's a slate saying, look how great I am. And on the back, 
it's got some Egyptians with ropes around necks of two great sauropod looking, I mean, they look just like a children's book with a apatosaurus on it or something, necks intertwined. And we have this motif repeated on two different, totally different places, separated by hundreds of years. Obviously, if there are engravings of sauropod dinosaurs, which are hundreds of years old, uh, prior to any scientist reconstructions of fossils, the only way that we could say that they could have done it so uh, intelligently was if they had viewed the creatures for themselves, or at least had access to sketches or drawings or descriptions made by eyewitnesses of those creatures at around that time. As some people look at the fossil record, as some people look at evidence that humans and dinosaurs lived at the same time. They see uh, pictures, they see drawings, they see carvings, they see uh, work in metal and weaving of uh, individuals that have actually reproduced dinosaurs. And the American Indian is uh, one of those uh, uh, groups that has done that, especially in uh, paintings and, um, and drawings. Adrian Mayer, first of all, if we talk about what she's done on this, I think we ought to give her credit for doing a tremendous amount of research. And when I say data, I mean legend after legend after legend after legend of descriptions of the same kinds of creatures that were giant, terrible lizards. Um, there were thunderbirds. There were um, water monsters given the same description from tribe after tribe after tribe across North America, but even in South America and Central America. We've got this robust legendary lore, complete with descriptions of habitat, descriptions of habit, anatomical attributes. Where did all this come from? And some people say, well, we don't want to have the Indian living at the dinosaur. So the, uh, the uh, Indian went ahead and found bones and then went ahead and assembled those bones into uh, the proper shape and then put the musculature and the skin on the bones. And then based upon what they came up with, they then did a drawing showing what this dinosaur or uh, reptile would look like in life. Now, with all due respect, to the, the skills of the American Indian, and there are a great many of them, I honestly don't know if paleontology uh, hundreds of years ago was one of them. Well, the very fact that we have these artifacts begs the question, how did they know to draw these? In other words, if they're mythological, how, did, how is it that they all drew the same exact myth, <laughs> and yet they're separated through distant time as well as distant geography? And the question, it's a tough one to answer because it depends on your worldview. And if you back up and think, if I just go based on the data, then it seems to suggest on its surface that these people, real live people at some point, encountered creatures that looked like this. I've been informed that in a cave in France, there's a mammoth seemingly engaged with or in combat with a dinosaur. Now, if that's so, that's very significant because even though mammoths are extinct, everybody accepts that mammoths and humans live together because you sometimes find spear points of uh, uh, human spears in mammoth fossils or mammoth skeletal remains in caves. Um, and of course, there are many drawings of mammoths by people and everybody agrees they're mammoths. So um, if mammoths and humans are together and you see a picture of a mammoth and a dinosaur together, then obviously dinosaurs and humans were together too which of course evolutionists say is impossible. American Indians had this legend, they called this creature the grandfather of the buffalo. And uh, you know, that is, that's an interesting description because you're like, okay, uh, what would a grandfather buffalo look like? Obviously it would have long hair, it would look like a buffalo, but they said it was much, much, much bigger. Well, there was a waterfall found in Minneapolis and um, underneath this waterfall was this uh, tusks of a mammoth and Indians actually pointed to that spot and said that's where the grandfather of the buffalo lived. And what's fascinating is if they were able to understand the flesh, they were understand the hairy characteristics of this mammoth, there's only one way they could have known that is if they would have actually seen the creature. And once again we see that 
The evolutionary time frame that the layers in the rocks represent millions of years comes to grief on things like this, which uh, show that people, dinosaurs and mammoths and many creatures that we're familiar with today all lived at the same time. First of all, what we have to understand now was not until the year 1822 when Gideon Mantle and his wife found the iguanodon tooth. And that was supposedly the absolute beginning of our understanding of uh, dinosaurs. And it be modern academia will tell you that is when we discovered them. Well, the problem with that is, is that we have all these images of ancient people groups that had intimate knowledge of dinosaurs. They drew them on vases, they were on pottery, and, um, if, and if it is true that they had no knowledge of dinosaurs, then where in the world did all those images come from? The people went to the police and demanded that something be done. The police gathered their weapons and their bravest officers and went off to see what they could find. Danny was terrified. He just wanted to find a friend. He was very old and had looked everywhere but couldn't find anyone else like him. It was like he was the last dragon on earth. You know, it's funny how historians treat ancient history. Because we've got a lot of ancient historians writing things that we take today as matter of fact. Like, you know, this event happened, okay. But then when they start talking about some other things that they believed were true, historians will just discount it. Like, you know, Marco Polo's writing about dragons, Alexander the Great's talking about his giant lizard that frightened his army. Um, and there's all, all sorts of other accounts in history f as, as matter-of-fact accounts of great lizard-like beasts, and yet they're routinely discredited as not being true. You know, it is a misnomer that some of these dragon legends, or all the dragon legends, are just a product of opium-inspired pagan religions. I mean, that is not the case at all. What you have is you have actual historians. You have Herodotus, you have just, um, Flavius Josephus, you have Marco Polo that talk about dragons. Herodotus actually heard an account of flying reptiles, and he went and checked it out himself. And so, I mean, he showed the medal of a true historian. 400 years later or so, you have Flavius Josephus, a, an incredible Jewish historian, also talking about seemingly the same creature. You have this, this flying reptile. You have Marco Polo that, after his journey to China, uh, is describing a huge dragon. He calls it a dragon with this tail that is really dragging through the sand, leaving these marks. And um, we come to the point where we have to ask ourselves, are all these people just making this up? They're describing creatures that were not supposed to be alive then. According to evolutionary theory, that creatures like this were supposed to be separated by mankind for 65 to 70 million years. Yet, here we have respectable people writing in their history books, this is what I've seen, this is what I've witnessed. And they sound just like dinosaurs. Well, I think we should take the testimony of these very reliable historians. For the most part, I think that they were very candid in what they were writing about when it came to historical narrative. And if they were talking about these large, formidable creatures, I don't see why there's any reason to question that. If man and dinosaurs never lived together but were separated by millions of years, then we have to say all those ancients were mistaken. And I don't believe that we should accuse them of that because they were intelligent people like you and I. They built cities before the flood. We're told that they had musical instruments. They had tools of iron and brass. Now you think about that. Before the flood, they had metal tools. That implies they had to find the metals, they had to mine them, and they had to smelt them exactly like we do today. So. Let us not dare accuse ancient people of being unintelligent and untechnological. The Bible does use the term dragons over and over again. It talks about ocean dragons, it talks about flying dragons, it talks about land dragons. And you know, that seems to fit with these great reptilian beasts that include the dinosaurs. It makes sense. If those things were so dominant on the planet before the flood and certainly right after the flood, they would have made it into the, 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 the history of the culture. In 1845, the, uh, a newspaper in um, the town of Geelong in Victoria published a sketch of a creature that the local Aboriginal people had described as a bunyip. A common Aboriginal term for monster, it's often thought of as mythical, but this Aboriginal had big, deep claw marks across his chest, and uh, the description he gave, presumably through an interpreter at the time, uh, was the basis of this sketch in the Geelong Advertiser, and it looks very much like one of the, the duck-billed dinosaurs. In fact, some large bones were reported at that time that were fresh, 
and were unlike any other creature that uh, people were familiar with at the time. And 13 years later, on the other side of the world, a uh, dinosaur was unearthed and uh, it was called Edmontosaurus. And when you look at the reconstruction of Edmontosaurus next to uh, the sketch of the Bunyip, drawn by um, the artist for the newspaper in Geelong on the basis of Aboriginal descriptions, the two are very similar. You have to interpret evidence of the present in relation to the past. And what I would say is this, there is very strong circumstantial evidence because all evidence in relation to the past is like a forensic scientist, they're working with circumstantial evidence, is, is very strongly confirms the Bible's history that dinosaurs and people lived at the same time. With so many people hunting him, Danny had to hide. As he rumbled back toward the ocean, he passed a man with two daughters walking along the beach. Instead of running, they just stopped and stared in shock. Danny said, hello, how are you? Which sounded like a ferocious roar. <laughs> we think many of your dragon legends could actually be stories about what we today call dinosaurs. The reason why you don't find the word dinosaur in the Bible is the same reason why you don't find words like computer or locomotive, because all of those words were invented in the English language well after the um, Bible was translated into English. The word dinosaur wasn't invented until 1841 by Sir Richard Owen, who was head of the British Museum. Before that, words such as dragon were used in the Bible. The King James Bible was first translated into English in 1611. So the word dinosaur is a modern word. There is a distinct philosophy that is uh, able to be identified when you look at the King James Version of the Bible that was first printed in 1611 to the more modern translations in the English language uh, like the ESV. In 1611, they used the word dragon 35 times. Uh, in the Old Testament alone, they used the word, the plural word dragon 16 times. But if you look at the ESV today, they use the word dragons in the plural form zero. And what is very clear to see is that whenever dragon is used to refer to a real living, living, breathing creature that walks upon land, the ESV has decided that that is not a word that can be used. Uh, most of the time they replace it with jackal, which is like a little hairy dog. Um, now that is a big discrepancy between a small hairy fox-like creature and a big gigantic reptile-like creature. Uh, and what you see is that the evolutionary mindset has seeped into nearly to so many things that you, we have even our most conservative Bible theologians look at dragons. They do not make the connection between dragon and dinosaur. And they have the idea that, wow, dragons aren't real, so we have to protect the inerrancy of the Bible. Most of the um, uh, people believe that dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago, and therefore uh, humans couldn't possibly have seen them because they haven't been around that long. So it's a case of a faulty uh, view of history with this millions of years imposed upon it, uh, which means they have to try to explain away um, human encounters with um, creatures which we would call dragons. But sometimes we treat God like he's a little old lady that needs help crossing the street. You know, no, I believe that God said what he means, and he means what he said. So if dinosaurs and dragons really are one and the same, one might actually ask, well, why did dragons fade into mythology to begin with? And that's a really good question. So you had all cultures in the world essentially passing on stories about big lizards. And over time, those stories get corrupted, they get distorted. It's a fish story of the day, you know, they, they get this added or that added and all of a sudden they become magical and they cast spells in at least a modern fantasy literature. Um, it was not until around the year 1800 that a French scientist named Georges Cuvier started to publish his findings that the extinction of a species was actually possible. Um, before that time, no one thought that species could go extinct. They actually thought that God had a kind of a supernatural preservation on the, all the species of the world. Um, the reason they thought that was an errant view of the Bible. They go back to Genesis and said, you know, that God created the, um, all the creatures and that it was good. So they, th they thought that at that point that there was kind of a, a supernatural preservation on that. That then got reinforced again when the flood came. And, and, and the story of Noah's flood is that God was going to cleanse the planet and was going to basically start over and with Noah and his family. Well, he had Noah bring all the animal kinds two by two to the ark. And again, there was this sense of preservation. We didn't invent the word dinosaur until the 1800s. And so 
anything before the 1800s could not have used the word dinosaur. And so no Bible translations would use the word dinosaur pr prior to the 1800s. And since then, no Bible translation would dare to use the word dinosaur because of the pressure from the evolutionists. So people before the 1800, as they're hearing the stories of dragons, they're looking around saying, I don't see that creature alive today. And if it is not alive today, then it was never alive. And that is how and why dragons fade into mythology. There are a lot of things that, that over the years have been found that were thought to have been extinct. Um, some mammals, some fishes, um, some plants. Uh, the coelacanth was, was the classic example uh, from the early 1900s. The Wollemi pine, which was discovered uh, in the later 1900s. Um, so there's a lot of things that, that pop up that no one thought should be, that no, everyone thought went extinct. But it turns out that they're still here and they're essentially unchanged from the way they were supposedly millions of years ago. And also there's an Australian um, living fossil that's very well known. It's called the Wallamai Pine. And it was found in a very isolated part of a conservation reserve near Sydney in New South Wales. And uh, it quickly became known as the dinosaur tree because they said it had lived alongside the dinosaurs. And the initial dating of the Wallamai Pine fossils was that it had been thought to be extinct for many millions of years. Now when they found this Wallamy pine just a short time ago, um, the curator of the uh, Sydney Botanical Gardens apparently said it's just like finding a live dinosaur. I think he said a live small dinosaur um, because the point is it has exactly the same significance. Now the coelacanth is a fish uh, fossils have been found of this fish that the evolutionists say um, died out, say, 70 million years ago, uh, came on the scene about 400 million years ago. The reality is, in 1938, off of the island of Madagascar, fishermen started catching coelacanths. And so now the evolutionist is presented with a problem. If coelacanths died out 75 million years ago, What's a live one doing in 1938? And they found a lot more of them. Some are even in aquariums today. Here's an interesting thing. Years ago, when I was in undergraduate school in Minnesota, I was taking a course in botany. And our professor took us all outside the botany building to pay obeisance to a, a, a ginkgo tree. And we all stood around in just deep reverence looking at this ginkgo tree, because we were told that this ginkgo tree uh, we can see it in the fossil record back to the time of the dinosaurs and beyond, and here it is growing alive and well just outside of our botany building, and isn't that amazing? And boy, we were impressed, but you know, now that I look back on that, why didn't our prof just show us the far more abundant oak trees and elm trees? Because they're in the fossil record too. We have acorns, we have walnuts, and these are dating back 40, 50 million years. No, I don't accept these dates. I believe the Earth is 6,000 years old. Uh, but uh, if you're going to accept these dates, uh, we have a tank here in the Creation Museum that is full of native Kentucky aquatic creatures. Sunfish, which have been found, the good old sunny you fish for, you know, if you like to fish. Uh, they were around back, according to the fossil record, 40, 50 million years ago. Uh, garfish go back at least as far as the dinosaurs. We have the short-nosed gar in the tank. Turtles, uh, 120 million years. Uh, bats, 60 million years, 50 million years. And they look just like the bats do today. Amber is what I call a time capsule. It uh, is some, some amber is supposed to be up to 50 million years old. And uh, quite a bit of amber has what are called inclusions in it. Now, inclusions can be uh, insects, they could be uh, water, uh, actually, uh, they could be uh, oxygen or air bubbles, if you will. And uh, the reason I call amber a time capsule is, lo and behold, when we find, for example, um, ants and termites, uh, we've even found uh, the pine bark beetle that is decimating the forests in the Rocky Mountain West. These animals, or these insects, if you will, are exactly the same as what we have today. The Jurassic shrimp was supposed to become extinct during the Jurassic time, and yet they're alive and well and just as delicious today as back in the uh, alleged evolutionary past. And so these uh, living fossils, I think, are clear testimony to the youth of this earth. Terrified, the man pushed his daughters behind him and said, Oh God, 
You are wonderful and powerful and created such amazing creatures. Please don't let him eat my daughters. As you love all your creation, I love them. Then he turned and plunged back into the ocean. According to conventional wisdom, the dinosaurs lived from about uh, 250 million years ago to about 65 million years ago. The reason not why they say that is after the so-called Cretaceous layers, you don't find any more dinosaur fossils above there. And so they believe the dinosaurs were wiped out 65 million years ago. And they believe that man only evolved in the last two million years, say, because we only find human fossils at the very top of the layers. And so man and dinosaurs, in their view, could never have lived together because they would be separated by over 60 million years. An evolutionist would look at the fossil record and they would, based on their, their idea that the earth is ancient and that the present is the key to the past, and they would look at natural processes which act very slowly, they would say, therefore, the fossil record must have accumulated very slowly. And because it's such a slow process, it's actually, a, a, you can look at it and look at different eras of time. And so in, in this section, these fossils are buried. That means that these fossils are alive at one point in time. And then a, if there's a layer that appears above that, well, that must be a later period of time. There's a different set of fossils being buried there. That's a snapshot of a different period of time. And then they build this very elaborate tree structure of all of life, and they build this very elaborate uh, model of, of the geologic record. Well, basically what they do is look at the sedimentary rock units and the Jurassic layer, and they find some dinosaurs there, and they say, because we find dinosaurs here at this particular layer is at least 70, 75 million years old. And so it is a tautology where they date the fossils by the rock layers, and they, they date the rock layers by the fossils that they find in them. And so it is a, a cause for circuitous or circular reasoning. I did one year of geology in the, uh, my university, and it's interesting that the head of the department uh, said um, the fossil record does not support Darwinian evolution. He said this plainly. He made it clear he was not a creationist, but he did say the fossil record seems support, to support a series of divine creation. This I heard from the professor of geology, and professor in New, in New Zealand was the high rank of, of uh, university teachers, not just any old lecturer. Well, fossils are formed only under special circumstances. Um, I've, I, I'm a marine biologist. I'm a scuba diver. I've, oh, I lost count after about 500 scuba dives. And it's funny because most people think marine biologists study whales and dolphins, but really most marine biologists study worms and bacteria and mud. And so in my, my life, I've studied a lot of mud. I've, I've dug mud in lakes, rivers, and streams all over the southeast. Um, all, all looked at the sediments all up and down the Florida Keys, over in the Bahamas, in, in Belize, uh, one, one trip to the South Pacific, which was very nice. And all that digging and all that sand and all that dirt and all that mud, I've never found a fish skeleton. I've never found an incipient fossil. I've never seen, found something that was being fossilized. Because fish, when they die, if, when they finally do hit the bottom, they're eaten by everything. And usually, um, they're eaten on the way down. And so their, their bones tend to be scattered all over the place and, and their flesh is, is destroyed. And even if they land in the mud, the bones dissolve over time in the water made of calcium carbonate is soluble in seawater. Uh, it, it, it really, it takes special circumstances to make a fossil. And most of those circumstances are met by Noah's flood, where you have a very rapid amount of sedimentation. We have lots of fossils being buried very quickly being sealed off away from oxygen and then be impregnated by the minerals that dissolved in the water that can recrystallize inside those bones, prevent them from dissolving away, and you get a, a fossil. I believe those dinosaurs were uh, uh, buried in sediment at the time of Noah's flood, which would have been about 4,000 years ago. So either at the time of the flood or at some point after the flood, during the runoff, because all the dinosaurs that we know of, with rare exception, are buried in water-deposited sediment. As Ken Ham says, if there really was a worldwide flood, you'd expect to see billions of things buried in rock layers deposited by water all over the earth. And what you really see are billions of dead things buried in rock layers deposited by water all over the earth. And that is certainly true of the dinosaurs. And when you read about them, they always are, are described as having wandered too close to an inland sea or lake, and maybe got a little tipsy and fell in. And before their flesh could rot, before scavengers could eat, uh, they became encased in a very cementitious rock. 
This isn't going on today. I have rabbits and squirrels in my backyard. I don't know what happens to them when they die. I've never seen any little rabbit funerals or anything like that. And I'll tell you, they're certainly not making fossils. You can't get a fossil. If you, a dinosaur died uh, in the, the forest, it's going to uh, rot away and get scavenged. And you can see that in the farms today. You don't see uh, sheep and cattle fossilized. And you have to bury them quickly. And when you have something uh, like the, a global flood, you're going to bury lots of creatures. And that's why we find um, lots of fossil dinosaur graveyards where they've been washed in the, the Iguanodon graveyard. Which makes sense if you've got a huge catastrophe, uh, a watery catastrophe. And of course, when you have a watery catastrophe, you don't need millions of years to explain where rock layers either. Right behind me is what is called a polystrate fossil. Poly meaning many, straight meaning strata. So here's a fossil that is straight up and down, going through many layers of strata. And what is significant about that? Well, first off, the conventional wisdom around here in uh, the Hell Creek Formation is that it could take a thousand years uh, a centimeter to lay down all of the uh, uh, sedimentary deposits. Well, is that uh, polystrate fossil behind me going to wait around for 100,000 years while slowly all of the uh, sediment is uh, put in around it to hold it straight up? No. It's going to decompose, going to fall over long before that happened. It had to have been done very, very quickly. There are some fish fossils that I've seen with exquisite preservation. All the scales, all the fins are intact. The, the fish's mouth is closed. His gills are closed, which is an indication that he's buried in squish. In fact, the, the streamlines around the fish in the mud, it looks like he was struggling and trying to swim as he's being buried. We've got abundant evidence of rapid fossilization. There's some three-dimensional dinosaurs that are preserved where a dinosaur is crouching down, and yet he's covered in mud. And the only way to do that is if the mud is accumulating so quickly that he's literally suffocated in the mud because if he had died, he would have fallen over, or at least would have laid down flat. But no, he's crouching, the mud covers all the way up above his head. And Mount St. Helens is certainly an excellent example because we saw things happen there that blew geologists' mind. Uh, May 1980, the eruption of Mount St. Helens, and the next, uh, you know, in, in that major eruption and subsequent ones, up to 600 feet of rock layers, new material was deposited around Mount St. Helens. And at one particular level, we find a 20-foot horizon that was produced on June 12, 1980. We, we know the day and the year because people were there to observe it. So it's testable, you know, we've got, we've got reliable eyewitness accounts. But within that 20-foot thick layer, we have multiplicity of small layers, alternating coarse and fine-banded coarse and fine-grained layers. Now, a geologist normally looking at that with a millions of years belief system, we call it mental glasses, looking through the idea of millions of years, who would have thought that each of those little bands would have taken thousands of years to accumulate, or, you know, alternating yearly, yearly sequences. And so the whole sequence, hundreds of them, would have taken hundreds of years. But we observed it to happen in just one day. The rock layers are not a sequence of age, but a sequence of burial. Taking their age interpretation, they shouldn't be, the see the cancer died out. Yet we know they're living today. People will ask, why are there no dinosaur and humans fossilized together? I would ask, why are there no coelacanths and whales fossil together, even though they live in the sea together? It's because they just weren't buried together. Now, how do you explain that by slow and gradual processes with little local floods over millions of years? Now, only a global flood can explain rock layers with marine fossils up on the continents that were catastrophically deposited and buried that swept right across the continents and, and between continents. I mean, the evidence is crying out for catastrophe. It screams Noah's flood, it therefore screams a young Earth. You know, radiometric dating is seen as the linchpin of, of the evolutionary age of the Earth. They say, oh, all these radiometric dating techniques show the Earth is ancient, so how can you believe in a young Earth? Well, actually, what I do is I, I appeal to known lava flows. Go to Hawaii, sample a lava flow, sample some basalt that's come out of the Earth, bring it back to your laboratory, tell me what age you measure. It's not going to be zero. It's not going to be even a few thousand years old. You're going to get an old age. Uh, it doesn't matter what technique you use. So what that does is that takes the idea that you can measure the difference between the daughter product and the parent product and calculate an age as if there was a clock. That discredits 
anything that, that's using the assumption that there's zero daughter products. Well, I was involved in a project called the RITE project, R-A-T-E, it stands for Radioisotopes and the Age of the Earth. It was an acronym that we put together to describe so people could quickly identify uh, what this project was and, and it was uh, conducted uh, between 1997 and 2005 and we got some exciting e evidences that confirmed that the conclusion we came to was that it, the nuclear decay rates, radioactive decay rates, had been grossly accelerated at some time or times in the past. At some event, the decay rates had been accelerated, that had been speeded up to such an enormous extent that you could essentially have hundreds of millions of years worth of nuclear decay measured by the rates at which they occur today, all of that happening within a few thousand years. So one of the best examples we came up with, well, there are several good ones. There were tiny crystals found in a granite in New Mexico from a drill hole. And uh, essentially, when uranium decays to lead, the parent decays to the, Lord, to the daughter lead, the byproduct is helium. And helium gas is it, it's not, it's chemically stable. It, it doesn't re react with other elements. It's an, what we call an inert element or inert gas. And because it's only got small atoms, it could leak very easily out of those crystals. But we found that the uranium lead date for these crystals, suppose, you know, with the millions of years scenario, using the radioisotope dating, was one and a half billion years. But most of the helium that would have been produced by that amount of nuclear decay was still in the crystals. So we, we made predictions. Then we sent the crystals to a well-recognised laboratory who, who was well known for doing that work to actually measure the rate of leakage. And what, where did it fit? Exactly on the 6,000 year prediction. In other words, while the uranium to lead clock had ticked at the rate of 1.5 billion years, that's 1,500 million years, while uranium had been ticking through that rate, Helium had been leaking at a different rate. That means because we know of the law of leakage of these atoms, well-known physical law that we can reproduce in the laboratory, that was a far more credible age determination method. There was a, some basalt flows that, that erupted uh, on the rim of the Grand Canyon, flowed down into the canyon all the way to the base of the canyon. That means that the, the lava flow is younger than the canyon younger than the, the uppermost sediments, and yet that lava flow dates to millions of years older than the canyon itself. It really raises the question, how do we know that these techniques are valid? We've got other lines of evidence, there was about three or four lines of evidence that we found that all pointed in the same direction, that the assumption of nuclear decay rates always being constant at the rates we measure today isn't true that they were accelerated in the past, and that means the clocks can't be trusted. We have done carbon-14 dating on coal and diamonds, which are hugely old. Diamonds are supposed to be over a billion years old, and yet we find carbon-14 in them. Now, hang on, carbon-14 would have long just decayed if they were that old. One of the uh, discoveries that has really rocked the evolutionary world was made by Dr. Mary Schweitzer and Dr. Jack Horner. Uh, from analyzing the uh, interior, uh, the bone marrow, if you will, uh, of the thigh bone or the femur of a T-Rex that was excavated back in 2003. Their report was published in the March-April uh, 2005 edition of Science Magazine, a very prestigious peer-reviewed science magazine. And they reported, and to my left, our pictures, uh, just a few pictures, there's many more that were actually in the magazine, they reported soft, stretchable, elastic, snapback like a rubber band tissue in that thigh bone. In addition, they reported finding red blood vessels, uh, blood vessels that still had blood cells in them that were identifiable, and all of that would be impossible if this dinosaur died out 65 to 68 million years ago. Clearly, Science has shown this dinosaur died out very recently, and I would say perhaps as a result of the flood of Noah's day, just a matter of, say, 4,000 years ago. Doctors Mary Schweitzer and Jack Horner are paleontologists. They study fossils. Specifically, they're interested in dinosaurs. In fact, 
I think you could call Jack Horner Mr. Dinosaur. I mean, he's probably associated with the study of dinosaurs as much or more than anyone else that comes to mind. Mary Schweitzer said that on one such test, as she said she couldn't believe it until she'd done it 17 times. This is pretty thorough. So most people are, are understandably shocked, and that includes certainly evolutionists, uh, that you should find what appears to be fresh marrow. Still soft, still with blood vessels, still with red blood cells. More recently, they've gone beyond that. Schweitzer, working with other investigators, have looked at the biochemistry of the marrow, and they have indeed found protein fragments. Now, not the whole protein, but protein fragments. Proteins usually don't remain completely undisturbed for uh, a few thousand years, and of course we have no idea for 70 million. Well, of course, the evolutionary naturalists who adhere, who embrace the long ages of evolution, who maintain adamantly that man and dinosaur are separate by 65 million years, are very, very uncomfortable with these continuing discoveries of Murray Schweitzer. Tom Kay of Seattle, who was also a critic of the first study of Murray Schweitzer, said, and I quote, this will either be nothing or the biggest revolution in paleontology ever. You know, I would have to agree with the, the latter portion of his quote. This is one of the greatest paleontological discovers, uh, discoveries ever. Danny returned to his cave, deep in thought. What had made that man on the beach so brave? The man had spoken about someone who had created him. The man had spoken about a creator that loved all his creatures. Was Danny one of those creatures? Most of your dinosaur books, if you go to Barnes and Noble or wherever, uh, they're all millions of years, millions of years, millions of years. Kids have been to see those movies uh, that uh, talk about dinosaurs. They might be fictional movies uh, like Jurassic Park and so on, but at the same time, they still teach millions of years. Ever since Darwin and Lyell, that this idea of many, many millions of years is a philosophical necessity, but is certainly not found in science. I mean, the main movers and shakers at the time were really striving to discredit the Bible. I mean, Lyell himself said that his stated goal was to free the world from Moses. And if that's a stated goal to free the world from Moses, he is actively trying to undermine the biblical account, biblical account of creation. So that's why we have to talk about the age of the earth issue if we want to talk about dinosaurs and humans, because these are two radically different views. And if the earth is young, then dinosaurs and man did live together and the dinosaur, the dragon legends are believable. Paleontologists uh, also, I believe, go ahead and uh, fill in the gaps as they see them in the evolutionary timeline, going from monkeys to man, going from uh, microbes to man. One of the things that they find, though, in the process of doing that is that life is very complex whether it's dead life or living life. It is still extremely complex. And so that means they've got to have huge amounts of time in order to give people any idea at all that um, it's credible to go from microbes to man. And that's really, time is the magic bullet for the evolutionist. It's a lot of time which makes the impossible possible. Old Earth, uh old universe even, but certainly old Earth, 4.5 billion years, is important to the evolutionist uh, because they need a great deal of time for things to evolve by the evolutionary process, which would involve random changes due to mutations uh, and natural selection. I would suggest it requires infinitely more time than the pittance of 4.5 billion years. I encourage them to think along the lines of Google years. That would be to the Google power. I mean, you need years that make billions look like nothing if you're going to try to attribute to chance uh, even a single biologically useful protein. Well, they say that over billions of years anything is possible, but would you ever expect someone to win the lottery every single day for 10 years straight? That's essentially the, the odds that they're claiming anything is possible. If that happened, a court of law would call that guy guilty, send him to jail for the rest of his life because he's cheating. Even if they don't know how he's cheating, they would have to conclude that you are cheating because this is impossible. So their, their idea that anything is possible is really ridiculous on the, face of, on the face of it. Would require more time and material than is in the known universe to have ever evolved by chance. 
Uh, once you can buy all that and accept it, once you can accept photosynthesis having formed by chance, I don't see a hill of beans difference between believing it happened by chance in 6,000 years versus 6 billion years. I mean, one's just as improbable as the other. We've reached a point where the p-values are so low that what's the difference? But evolutionists know that their arguments would be even less tenable to laymen if the times were shortened too much for them. We say humans are very complicated and, and a sponge or a jellyfish would be very non-complicated. Uh, but it's really funny because a, a jellyfish, or at least the, the sea anemone, has got about the same number of protein coding genes as people. So in all these billions of years of supposed evolution, we actually haven't increased the number of genes hardly at all. And a lot of the genes that they have that we thought at first was, was something specific to vertebrates or specific to higher life forms, they have them also. So the evolution is scratching their head. The simplest cell is utterly complex. The simplest life out there is so mind-bogglingly complex that it's, 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 to me, it's impossible to conceive that it just spontaneously evolved from random chemicals. There, there is an unbridgeable gap between the simplest cell and random chemistry. It's sort of like saying, um, oh, well, we can find, if you go out in nature, you can find a rock sitting on top of another rock. Just from natural processes, you know, maybe fell off the cliff and landed on top of another rock. And because you can find rocks sitting on top of rocks, that explains the Great Pyramids. Well, of course, that's ridiculous. Uh, we have decay. We have the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, I look in the mirror every day, and it's hitting me with a vengeance. Uh, yeah, we've been told that if our theories ever run counter to the second law, we can be pretty sure they're not right. Uh, the second law basically tells us that at least a uh, closed system, everything goes downhill. Uh, things fall apart. They don't spontaneously self-assemble over the long haul. The evolutionist tries to get out of this by arguing that the Earth is an open system, that energy keeps impacting on the Earth from the sun, and that this energy sort of drives the uh, evolution uphill and causes entropy then to decrease rather than increase. This is really not a good argument. We know that energy is necessary for the assembly of complex things. That's true in an automobile plant. Without energy, the plant comes to a halt. But uh, energy by itself is a necessary but not sufficient condition of, say, making automobiles. One needs information, you need programs, you need sequences. Things have to be done in a certain order. Parts have to arrive at a certain time, have to fit other parts. There's an integration of complexity. Energy alone is not sufficient to explain it. The Achilles heel in evolutionary theory is a lack of transitional species. There should be millions of transitional species. There should be tremendous numbers of transitional species between the major groups of animals, but there aren't. In fact, you've got the Cambrian explosion where all the major phyla of life, the biggest differences that exist, they just poof, appear out of nowhere with no transitional species. You've got, um, you know, Darwin saying that he, he's leaving up to future generations of geologists to, to discover all the innumerable transitional species that must exist. But since the 1960s, the fossil records changed by about 4%. So what they have is a handful of disputable transitional species. Uh, those transitional species they use today were not the ones they used in the 1970s. It's not the ones they used at the 1925 Scopes trial. It's not the ones that Charles Darwin had in his, in his day. Each transitional species seems to have a shelf life of maybe 10 years. And then it's kind of quietly shuffled off to the side and they think of something else and something else is brought up as a transitional species. And we had the, the famous evolution of the horse series. Everyone remembers that, the little horse or the big horse. That's not found in, in, the, in the textbooks anymore, and if it is, it shouldn't be, because that's been routinely and soundly discredited. And a lot of the other things that, that people would remember as the best evidence for evolution uh, really turned out to be no evidence at all. Charles Darwin did the same thing when he thought up his idea of evolution. He saw that the facts of the fossil record did not line up with his theory, and so he made a very unscientific decision. He decided to hold on to his theory and ignore the facts. The same thing happened in the 21st century. Mary Schweitzer said in Discover Magazine, April of 2006, quote, I had one reviewer tell me he didn't care what the data said. He knew that what I was finding wasn't possible. I wrote back and said, well, what data would convince you? And he said, none, end quote. And so here's a perfect example of where people are saying, I have my unproved theory of evolution that spans many, many millions of years where there's no creator, no designer, it's just time, chance, and natural processes, but the facts don't line up with it, 
I'd rather hold on to the, uh, the uh, theory than the facts. Many of the opponents of young earth creationism point to young earth creationists as being the enemies of science, that they don't think rationally and they actually stop good science being done. In fact, when you look at the uh, really great breakthroughs of science in recent decades, very often you'll find those who made those breakthroughs were uh, Christians and uh, certainly understood the God of creation. I mean, who can we name uh, bigger, more influential than Isaac Newton? He was a Bible-believing Christian, Pasteur, Kepler. I mean, we're not just talking about mere Nobel Prize winners. We're talking about people that opened up whole areas of science. Boyle, Maxwell, Faraday, George Washington Carver, Louis Pasteur, all of these men of science who were also men of God, who believed that in the beginning, God created. So many people think it's the religion versus science. No, it's, it's the science built on one religion versus the science built on a different religion. And see, I start with a belief that God's word is true, that we have reliable eyewitness accounts of what happened in the past, therefore I build my science on that. Whereas an evolutionist has a belief in millions of years with no God, just everything happening slowly and gradually, and now he builds his science on that. What, what most people have to decide which view is correct. The search continued for Danny, and the tracks he had made were easy to follow. Soon the authorities were searching the water, and Danny had to leave his cave and dive deeper and deeper. Somehow though, despite not finding a friend, he didn't feel as alone as before. Someone out there must have loved him. Enough to make him, he may be different, but he was loved. I think that a dinosaur is described in detail more than most other animals in the Bible. I really do. For instance, when you go to Job 40, there we have an account of God speaking with a man called Job, and this was after the flood. And he was saying to Job, look at this animal called Behemoth. Now that's just not an English word, that's just a transliteration of a Hebrew word. The Hebrew word there is plural, because Behemoth is a well-known word for a beast. So Behemoth is saying it's the beast of beasts, and God said to Job, behold this. So he was expecting Job to understand what was being, what he was talking about, and what I made along with you. So it implies that it was made along, on, alongside mankind. And um, then it says, so it's a beast of beasts made along with mankind. Everything about it is big. His legs are big. His, his bones are strong like brass and iron. He's an enormous creature, chief of the ways of God. Some Hebrew experts say that means it was the largest land animal God made. And you know, the largest land animal we know of today from the fossil record are some of your dinosaurs like your sauropods, like a seismosaurus or something. And then it has a tail like a cedar. Well, you think of the cedars of Lebanon. I mean, a tail like a cedar, that'd be an enormous tail. You know, many Bible commentaries, for instance, the NIV study Bible in the notes actually says this was a hippopotamus uh, or an elephant. But a hippopotamus tail is like a little flap of skin. And, you know, uh, an elephant's tail, it's like a piece of rope hanging in the wind. It's really difficult to know why uh, many commentators, even conservative commentators, are unwilling to take the descriptions in the book of Job about this, this creature and to try to apply them to a hippopotamus or some other animal when the description doesn't fit. Uh, I suppose only they themselves know their motives and, and the Lord. Uh, is it that they're afraid of looking foolish or, you know, scientifically simplistic or, or whatever? But, but it is very clear that the description of the, the animal there in Job's uh, book is not a hippopotamus. When we look at the, the description of that creature, it really does seem to fit with a, a brachiosaur or a patasaurus, sauropod type dinosaur. You read the description of Behemoth while looking at a fossil at, say, the Pittsburgh uh, Carnegie Mellon Museum of Natural History, and limbs like great bars of iron, you know. That's exactly the way it looks. doesn't mean the bones were made out of iron. It means they were just like great big bronze tubes and uh, iron tubes and uh, these big ribs, this immense belly, this big tail. I mean, we're clearly not describing a pussycat. Uh, this fits uh, a dinosaur. We know Leviathan in Job 41 was not a dinosaur because technically the word dinosaur only refers to land animals. 
So we could say a dinosaur-like creature, if you like, that lived in the sea. The Bible describes it as a dragon that lives in the sea. This thing is about the size of a school bus and weighed eight tonnes. And just as Leviathan is described as leaving a trail in the mud with, you know, potsherds, like, like shattered pieces of pottery, that's the sort of trail that a crocodile makes in the mud. But you're not talking about the crocodile that we know nowadays. If you look at this picture of a modern-day crocodile skull, and uh, this Sarcosuchus skull around it, you can see the vast difference in size. And it truly fits the description in the book of Job where it talks about how, you know, this sort of creature will just shrug off harpoons and arrows and, and, and laugh at fish hooks and things like this. And also, uh, the book of Job describes as if it has rows of shields closely interlocking with no space between them. And it's interesting that the um, uh, description of Sarcosuchus includes the many scoots that have been found and these are like the big scales and they are closely overlocking and they're about one foot in diameter these shields on uh, Leviathan. It says that he breathed fire. Now when people look at that they say well now we know the Bible can't be trusted because that's just a mythical creature breathing fire. I say whoa whoa wait a minute wait a minute who says animals can't read fire? I mean think about it we have a little beetle called a bombardier beetle that can mix chemicals like hydroquinine and hydrogen peroxide together and blast out hot gases at 212 degrees Fahrenheit to put a frog off its lunch. You look at uh, the electric eel, the ability to electrocute. You look at the spitting comer that uses a huge gust of air from its lungs to really create an aerosol type effect for its venom that shoots out and will hit the eyes of, of uh, you know attackers or, or enemies. You start looking at some of these things, you're like, okay, can, is it possible that these eyewitness accounts really did have some evidence behind them? Interestingly, the uh, snout of Sarcosuchus had a bulla, some sort of a hollow cavity of some sort at the tip that nobody knows exactly what it was for. Could that have been for mixing of chemicals or some sort of a chamber, uh, some sort of a chemical storage chamber, for generating the, the fire and smoke that the um, uh, Book of Job also describes concerning Leviathan. We have the eyewitness testimony of these dragons in the world after the flood, which fits them being on the ark with Noah. When we're talking about dinosaurs and talking about dinosaurs as um, being on the ark of Noah, boy, immediately uh, some people that uh, don't believe that, their, their antenna goes up. They say, oh, dinosaurs are too big. They couldn't have fit on the ark. But let's think about this for a second. First off, what's the average size of a dinosaur? The average size of a dinosaur is like a sheep or a goat. It's not like a big, huge T-Rex or a big, long neck uh, Apatosaurus or something like that. But then let's look at the long neck dinosaur or the T-Rex or any of the others of that size. The main thing that God wanted to do was to have two of these creatures on the ark so that, that when the flood was over and they left, they could reproduce after their kind. And so uh, God would want to send younger ones. And uh, science today believes that dinosaurs could reproduce at about age 8 to 10. So younger, smaller, uh, the ark was big, 450 feet long, and there would have been plenty of room for two of every kind of dinosaur along with all the other animals that God wanted. Why would they become extinct after the flood? Well, because the climate was changed after the flood. It was a much more harsh and climate with a different topography. And second, they would have competed with man for food and, and places. A lot of things have become extinct. Um, things become extinct by chance. I mean, a lot of them would have been wiped out during the flood, which is why we have the fossils. And the survivors, which the Bible says were on the Ark of Noah, a gigantic ocean liner-sized boat, they could have been hunted by man, which is why you have dragon legends of hunting dragons. And the Ice Age, which almost certainly happened just after the flood, would have not have been good for large reptiles. Danny found a deep valley at the bottom of the ocean floor and dove down into it. It was murky and hard to see. He thought no one would ever find him here until he noticed two very large eyes peering at him. Out of the dark waters came another creature. To anyone else, she looked enormous and scary. But to Danny, she was gorgeous. He said, I'm Danny, who are you? Which sounded like, roar! <laughs> but instead of swimming away, she roared back, I'm Lucy, 
I thought I was all alone. Danny smiled. Not anymore. Never again. And deep in the cold and dark at the bottom of the ocean, the two dragons swam off to live happily ever after. The end. <laughs> if it could be shown that dinosaurs were 4,000 years old, it would not be the end of evolution. Nothing will be the end of evolution except the return of Jesus Christ. Man simply cannot tolerate a creator because a natural man, apart from having come to know Jesus Christ as Savior, we can't tolerate a creator because it involves accountability. And so we have to explain how we could come into existence spontaneously without a creator, without a designer, without a builder, how nature left to itself, matter, energy, time, and space, that must suffice. In fact, it's the whole philosophy of science nowadays. Scientists are, are no more objective than anyone else, and there's a worldview thing. Because if the flood account is true, it means that uh, God has judged sin, which means we're accountable to him, and that is unwelcome for a lot of people. It's not surprising to me at all that we are finding evidence of man and dinosaurs together because if you take the creation account literally, then it says on the sixth day would have been the day that God created all of these animals and uh, man also. Therefore, they were concurrent. They, the, the dinosaurs didn't precede man by one million or 65 million years. They were on this earth together. Once you look at the soft tissue, combined with the evidence for man and dinosaurs or dragons having interacted, boy, it all fits together. The evidence itself really fits together. The dogma of millions of years isn't borne out by the evidence. Rather, the evidence is forcibly smashed into that dogma. Evolutionary theory is driven by the paradigm and not by the evidence. A lot of people, when they uh, think of creationists uh, who have science degrees, and they wonder, how can they believe in creation? Uh, what they don't realise is that creation is, the, is a logical way of looking at the world we have today in light of historical canon of the Bible. It all makes sense. Like, makes a lot more sense than from an uh, evolutionary perspective. The reason why we have the Appalachian Mountains and the Himalayas is because of the flood and all the upheavals that occurred in the flood. Why do we have dead, billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water over the earth? because the Bible says all the high hills under the whole of the heaven were covered with water and all the animals were swept away and the water would pick up sand and mud that would bury billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. And so I hold to the view that the Bible explains, tells us what happened in the past, we can test that and we find the overwhelmingly the evidence supports that. I had actually, uh, I guess, really felt that I was reading something special because I could tell God how he did it. I'd put God in a box and I'd say, yeah, God, you started out, but this is exactly how you did it. You used evolution. Now, I just, when that was pointed out to me, it hit me right between the eyes. Boy, how arrogant. And then he started pointing out the evidence, much of the evidence uh, we've been talking about uh, uh, today. And this evidence is just stacking up, proving that the Bible is true. Yeah! Hi, I thought this was a public library. It is. Is there something I can help you with? Yeah, the story was a little preachy. Who decides what to read? I'm sorry you feel that way. I actually chose the story. I thought it was nice. Not everyone believes there's a god. I liked it, Daddy. Can you take it away? Sure, sweetheart. But let's look for some other books, too. What's the point? I mean, why do you care how old this rock is, how old this fossil, how that animal got to be the way it is? But there are underlying meanings that go to the very core of our being, that answer life's big questions. Who am I? Where did I come from? What's the meaning to life? What happens after I die? These big questions are answered by creation information. Today, I find that the biggest objection people say as to why they can't accept Jesus is because they've been taught evolution at school of the millions of years and they say why should I trust the bits of the Bible that talk about Jesus when you can't trust the very first bits that talk about creation. 
Well, I was an atheist all the way through university uh, because I believed that everything made itself, because I believed in the millions of years and so on, and, and it was obvious that the history and the Bible, um, that the gospel depended upon that, that if evolution and millions of years were right, what the Bible was teaching just didn't make sense. It was only when somebody gave me a book that explained how I could look at the same facts and interpret them logically and rationally in a way that was not only intellectually satisfying but that fitted the Bible and that actually made more sense than the evolutionary long ages point of view that I could become a Christian. Today's scientific geological discoveries are confirming that processes that used to be thought to take literally hundreds of thousands or millions of years can be done very quickly which supports the sudden creation it supports the flood of Noah's day and is adding additional support to the true history of the Bible. Your knowledge about the Creator is testified by the creation itself. The creationist, the scriptures, the heavens declare the glory of God. The, 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 whether you're talking about astronomy or microscopy, the, uh, the frontiers of science bear testimony to design. And that design is sufficient to hold us accountable. The Bible is very clear that, that God is omniscient. He knows all. And if you accept that scripture is the word of God, uh, then he has given us a perfect record that we can base our lives on, base our views on. And therefore, uh, because man's views are always changing, uh, man's opinions have shifted down through the decades, centuries, uh, even just from an experiential standpoint, it makes sense that we would rest our hope, our faith, our views on God's wisdom and not man's wisdom. You see, a, a, a court in a courtroom, a judge and jury are going to look for eyewitnesses, aren't they? If they want to re-establish what happened in the past at the scene of the crime, they can have all the forensic evidence they like, but the forensic scientists weren't there. They're interpreting what the blood stains might mean and what this, you know, the, the gunpowder and the angle and all the rest of it, but they could be wrong. The judge and jury will determine the case from an eyewitness that was there who could describe exactly where the person was standing with the gun, exactly what happened when the gun was, was fired. You see, that's what we have with the Bible. The Bible is telling us who was holding the gun, who was firing it, what happened. The scientists weren't there. The Bible stands on its own, but from science, we can really establish that it's true. We can find confirmation of it. We can find the evidence that it really did happen just that way. And so when I go and test that, I see there is evidence in God's world that supports God's word. The point is the creator himself who did all this entered his creation and fulfilled a mission that we were unable to fulfill for ourselves. And he did it on our behalf. That's the staggering discovery that awaits the person who's seriously interested in trying to find out what it's all about. The science we present is in order to remove stumbling blocks from people listening to the gospel message. We're not saved because we believe in Genesis 1-1, we're saved because we believe in Jesus Christ. It's by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone. Think about how contrary evolution is to Christianity. Uh, evolution is this idea of, of survival of the fittest, which really means extinction of the unfit. The vast majority of everything goes extinct. Um, and yet, how does Christianity approach things? The very kernel nut of Christianity is that not the survival of the fittest, but that the most fit of all, Jesus Christ, died for the unfit, so that the unfit could survive. That's me and you. Jesus entered the human race, even though he was creator, he entered creation, and he came as a man, lived a perfect life, died a substitutionary death on the cross for our sins, so that we could be redeemed, and a person who acknowledges his or her sin and is willing to humble themselves before God, repent of their sin, and receive Jesus Christ by faith is what the Bible refers to as being born again. That person is given new life, whereas they were dead in their sin. Now they have new life that comes from a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ.
how does aspirin work? The answer is next on today's Creation Moment. And now, here's our Creation Moments host, Ian Taylor. The aspirin tablet has been hailed as the miracle drug of the 20th century. Although it took the 20th century to flavor, coat and stamp little letters on the aspirin, some people have been using aspirin for centuries. The most common form in which aspirin has been taken is as willow bark tea. Aspirin has cured billions of headaches and brought nearly as many fevers under control over the years. Despite its long-standing use in medicine, physicians had no idea of how aspirin worked until just a few years ago. Researchers now know that aspirin does not simply mask the pain of a headache, but chemically turns off the cause of the average headache. It does this by deactivating the chemical made by the blood vessels which cause them to constrict. Another member of that same family of chemicals, called prostaglandins, prevents blood platelets from sticking together, helping blood to flow more freely and preventing heart attacks. This is also why aspirin can cause stomach bleeding. In his foreknowledge, our creator knew, regretfully, that among the effects of a world changed by sin would be pain and sickness. So in his mercy, he provided plants, which would make the active ingredient in aspirin. But the greatest expression of his love for us was in providing us with a cure for sin itself, in his Son, Jesus Christ. For a free copy of our Creation Resource Catalog, visit our website at creationmoments.com or call us toll-free at 1-800-42-BIBLE. That's 1-800-422-4253. And be sure to join us next time for another Creation Moment, proclaiming evidence of God's truth. facts about creation and how God made the world and all that is to know for sure you're going to heaven. If you believed God made the world and you believed in the flood and the days of Noah and you believed the whole Bible but you never did get saved, you'd still die and go to hell. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3 and verse number 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says we're all sinners. We've all broken God's laws. See, God gave the law and we have disobeyed. If you even just look at the Ten Commandments, let alone the other laws, we've broken them. We're guilty. We have disobeyed God's laws, plain and simple. When I was 16 years old, a friend of mine said, Kent, do you know if you're going to heaven? I said, oh, I don't know. I've been baptized and catechized and pasteurized and homogenized. You know, what else is there? And he said, are you going to heaven? I said, I don't know. He showed me from the Bible I was a sinner. I've disobeyed God's laws. I said, well, no argument out of me. You're right, I have. Then the Bible says in the book of Romans, chapter 6, and verse 23, For the wages of sin is death. 
Wages are something you earn, and you have earned death because of your sin. So have I. We deserve to die. We're guilty. God would be perfectly fair in sending us all to hell. But it goes on to say, the gift of God is eternal life. See, just like your parents gave you the gift of physical life when you got born, God wants to give you a gift of eternal life. And the only way to get it is through Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. So my friend said, Kent, you're a sinner. I said, I agree. He said, you deserve to go to hell. You deserve death. That's eternal death. I said, yeah, I agree. But Jesus died for you. And he wants to take you to heaven. He wants to forgive you and save you. Then he showed me Romans chapter 10 and verse number 13, which says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He said, Kent, if you'd like to ask the Lord to save you, he'd do it right now. And as two people actually worked on me. One was my friend Tim, and he said, would you like to get saved after he showed me this? And I said, no, I don't want that. Because if I ask the Lord to come in my heart and save me, then he's going to want to change my life. About a month later, my brother got saved. And my brother took me down to a University of Illinois where he was going to school, or Illinois State University in Bloomington, Illinois. And we visited a little church there, and my brother had just been saved a couple of weeks, and he brought me to church with him, and some of the guys there showed me and said, Kent, you need to ask the Lord to save you. And I said, boy, I sure do. I've been thinking about it. You're right. I'm ready. And so on that day, February 9th, 1969, I prayed, and I said, Lord, I'm a sinner. Would you forgive me and save me right now? And he did, just like he promised right here. That's my birthday into God's family. Hey, if you're not sure you're going to heaven, why don't you ask the Lord to save you? It really is that simple. Just pray with me right now. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws, and I'm sorry. Lord, I believe you died for me. Would you please forgive my sin and save me right now? Amen. Well, friend, if you just ask the Lord to come in your heart and save you, the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You've got God's promise you're going to heaven. What you need to do is write this date and the time down in the front of your Bible someplace because the devil will certainly try to make you doubt that you're going to heaven. And you need to start reading your Bible. You need to start going to a good church that believes the Bible and start learning what this book says and read God's Word. As a newborn babe, you need to grow by desiring the sincere milk of the Word. The more you read this book, the more you grow to be a good Christian. Call us and let us know or write us a letter. We'd be glad to rejoice with you and give you some information to help you grow closer to the Lord in your new life. If we can be any help, don't hesitate to call. Thank you so much. This is October 3rd, 2011. I've been having many prophetic dreams lately. I work around the clock. <laughs> Most of the time it's lots of times. Too many times, my husband says. It's 24, 48 hours before I sleep. So it's rare. It's, it's rare that I can remember my dreams and all of a sudden Abba Yahweh has put such an urgency in me to make sure that I'm recording the dreams. I will start out with the one today, and then I have to do another one that I did not record yesterday. And these are put into videos for a purpose. And that is because Yahushua said that we have to entertain as well as inform this hardened end time generation. So I will have these made into videos also. I firmly believe from everything I've heard of people who had to be martyred because they love Yahushua, the one called Jesus Christ. And I believe with all my heart that they don't suffer. From the testimonies that I have heard that the devil will not have the satisfaction. I believe with all my heart and I want to encourage people. This dream, huh, and they were back to back and, and they were similar. They were similar and yet you'll hear it was, about, it was about martyrdom. It's so close now people. If you're afraid to stand up now and defend Yahushua and defend holiness and defend others who are preaching holiness, and you're only, and you're afraid of just having a bad word spoken about you, or on YouTube, to have a sub or a friend that you'll never see. 
drop you. What are you going to do? I'm talking about those who are calling themselves born-again Christians. What are you going to do when they're going to come to you, the governments of this world, and they're going to say, this is your new God. I demand, and the law demands, that you worship this new God, this leader of the world. Or we're going to chop your head off, or we're going to chop body parts of you off, or we're going to make you suffer untold agony. You're not going to have any food anymore. You're going to see your family starve, your children starve, if you don't worship the one that we call God and give up the one that you worship, the one you call Yahushua, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You have a new God now. And if you don't accept him, and you don't carry the mark, and if you don't gather together and worship on a mandatory Sunday, this is what's going to happen to you. What are you going to do, people? You're cowards now, okay? And the Bible says in the book of the Revelation, the cowards are not going to go to heaven. You know why? Because they're going to sell Yahushua out. You see, it's not a sin to be afraid. I breathe fear like oxygen since I was born. And I know what the word says. For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. And when I say that I breathe fear like oxygen, I mean that's a, that's a, a spirit that torments me continually. But you know what the sin is? The sin isn't being afraid. The sin is letting that fear stop you from obeying Abba Yahweh Yoshua and the precious Real Kakodesh. In other words, obeying God. That's the sin. Yahushua, he said, if it all be possible, take this cup from me. And he wept tears of blood, of anguish. He knew what he was going to face. For he was in a, a body of flesh, although he was God in the flesh. And he is God. So I have to start this with this telling you. It's going to come. It's, ha- it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen very quickly. And this ministry of a mighty wind ministry has been so brutalized. Because you see, this ministry isn't for everyone. Just like, like Elijah of old wasn't sent to every widow was there up at. So too I, the pastor, apostle, prophet, whatever. The one that Yahushua used. And Abba Yahweh used to put on this internet nearly 17 years ago. But it's, it's hard for me to count years. <laughs> For me to keep counting years means I have to get older. But the ministry is over 25 years old, okay? Hard to believe, I know. I don't want to say what this dream was, but I'm telling you, it's going to happen. And I have to record it. God warns to his prophet. He shares secret to his true prophet. And I pay a big price to be able to warn you. But I have Ezekiel 3, 17 to 21 that tells me I must warn you. I have no choice. You see, I fear offending the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob more than I fear people. In my dream, I just want to say when I woke up, I felt, and, I, and I'm waking up now, after going 24 hours without sleep, ministering, <laughs> oh, battling lies. Oh, man. It just gets more ridiculous every day. And I feel like I've been traveling. I feel like I, I don't know what we do when we dream, but I felt like I really was in another place. It appeared, and I believe it was in a Muslim country. And there was four people on the on the outside, and they were being guarded. And there was a fire in the middle, and it was at night. I'm not sure if it was at night. It it wasn't it wasn't like it was pitch black at night. I'm just gonna say there was a fire in the middle. Maybe it was even just to keep warm because I could see everybody so clearly. I don't know what time it was. It was before all the way pitch dark. And there was a woman that was very very pregnant, and she was dressed in black, and they had a long Muslim scarf on, you know. And there was a man, and I believe there was two more women, if I remember right. And they were going to be executed. They were going to have their heads cut off because they are Christian followers of Yeshua, Jesus Christ. I say Jesus Christ for those that don't know the name of Yahushua. But after this, I only want to say Yahushua. Because it means Yah saves. And this is the name the devil hates. This is a true Hebrew name. In the King James Version Bible, they gave our beloved Messiah a Greek name. J-E-S-U-S. But in reality, Miriam Mary, a Hebrew woman, would not have given her baby a Greek name. But out of the mercy of Abba Yahweh, he allows that name. Because there's still, and that's the name we all love. Learned and are saving, forgiving, healing, delivering, resurrection power, miracles in that name. And I'm so grateful, otherwise I wouldn't be saved. <laughs> 
But you see, now you're being warned that when the Antichrist comes, he's going to come, defiling that name. So I want to get back to this. I saw this woman, and she was all dressed in black, and she had the heavy black scarves on, and oh, she was ready to give birth any moment. She was like nine months pregnant. And then there was the two women, and there was a man, and I was... I was reassuring them. I was speaking to them. And I was praying for them as I knew they were about ready to be executed and waiting for their name to be called. And I said to them, I believe in faith. And I just know this. Please don't be afraid. Don't give them the, don't give your executioners the joy of seeing fear on your face. Instead, you praise Yoshua. Instead, you realize that you're going to go home before I do with your last breath. Just say, Yoshua, save me. And before that guillotine blade hits your neck or sword, I don't know what they would use because thank God I didn't see it. I said, I believe with all my heart and soul as every martyr is killed, that their spirit is taken from their body before death can even be pronounced. I believe it. You see, our God is merciful. And I said, I'll see you in heaven. And you're getting there before I do because your job's done. And then the guards came. And they uh, took the three away. And then I saw this precious pregnant woman. And I said, they won't kill you too, will they? I mean, you're ready to have a baby. That's, that's like killing two at one time. And she said, oh, yes, they will. And I felt helpless. I couldn't do anything. But watch and pray. We're not praying for these people who are being martyred. I'm guilty of it too. They're giving their life right now for Yahushua. And just because it didn't come to America yet, it will. It'll come all over the world. How many are you praying for them? Then the dream goes into another. Oh, I just want to add, it was like all of a sudden, as I felt so helpless, <laughs> all of a sudden I, I felt peace as I sat there. And I told the woman, I said, they're home. They're in heaven right now. And they're not grieving. They're rejoicing. Because, oh, death, where is your sting? Where is your victory? <laughs> Hallelujah! They believe in, even if we have to be martyred, even if you have to be martyred, just remember, the end result is if you do not allow fear to stop you from worshiping Yahushua and letting the devil know you'll not serve him, the end result is heaven. <laughs> There's no greater reward for all eternity to be happy, to know joy, nothing but holiness around you, to behold the face of your Creator and your Messiah, <laughs> to have holy angels surrounding you, to be with each other. Don't let Satan take your soul because of fear. This is a training ground right now. This is what we're on this earth for right now. <laughs> if you can't stand up and if you're afraid of being insulted with words, you're in trouble. You're in real big trouble. Most likely, I can pretty much guarantee it, you'll sell Yeshua out. You'll betray him like you betray the holy ministries, like a mighty wind, like me. And you sit there and you watch and you're quiet. You won't have, an, you won't have a chance. You won't have a choice. You will have to choose on that day which God you will serve. And you're choosing right now whether you know it or not. You're practicing right now for your decision, just like I am. You see, I thought I gave God everything I had to give. I've been serving Him and ministering for so many years. Started out at, I, I didn't even, <laughs> I started out young, okay, really young. And um, the moment I got saved, I was prophesizing and evangelizing. <laughs> And, of course, that's more than 25 years. And never once have I backslid. Never once did I go back in this sin. There's no excuse for you for backsliding, okay? Once you really know the love of Yahushua in your heart, once you really have the Holy Spirit, if you don't have head knowledge, okay, and it's not a really strong relationship where you know that God watches everything you do, that everything your eye sees, everything, every action you do, you're forcing the Holy Spirit within you to take part in it because the Holy Spirit's inside your body. I never could understand backsliders. They all use the excuse of the prodigal son. But you know what? The prodigal son didn't deny the father. These people who deny, who taste the goodness of Yahushua HaMashiach and, and who get saved and born again and filled with the Holy Spirit and then say, well, I've decided this is too hard. I don't want to believe my friends in hell. Yeah, I've been going to an apostolic church and yeah, I claim I have the, the gift of tongues, but 
this is this is too hard. Surely, I don't want to worship a God that would send people to hell. I'd rather go to hell myself. And you know what? You will, because Hebrews ten does not lie, and Hebrews six, I'm sorry, Hebrews six four through eight does not lie. It is impossible. Do you hear me? All of you out there who think you're playing games, you deny Yahushua HaMashiach and you think you can go into all Buddha and, uh, and turn to Muslim and whatever and you think you can come back anytime you want. You could go into witchcraft, you could go into Satanism, you could become an atheist, but oh, anytime I want, when it's convenient, I know the door is a revolving door and I could come back again. No, you can't. You're a liar. Yeah, you've been lied to. Now, either you knowingly know you're lying or Satan has got you deceived. To think with your last breath, you'll just come back. I don't care even about these who say, oh, but I have such a testimony and I learned my lesson and I come back. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> it don't work that way. It really don't work that way. I believe the word of God and it says it's impossible for now you have openly mocked Yahushua Hamashek, the one who shed his blood at Calvary, who covered your sins, who you accepted as Lord, God, and Savior, and had a Holy Spirit, but because sin was more important to you, because living holy was too hard, you went to go find another religion, another belief, or no belief, and then you tried to say, oh, but I'm back again. I decided I, I, I've come back again. I, I know the truth now is in the Bible, and I know the Bible better than you do, Elizabeth. Oh, yeah, sure you do, Inventor Gorilla. Sure you do. I got news for anybody who plays this game, like this man and others. It's not a revolving door. Before these people die, they will once again deny the name of Yahushua HaMashiach. It's guaranteed. You know why I know? Hebrews 6, 4 through 8. It's impossible to return. Once the Holy Spirit leaves, it's all over with. Second part of my dream. This was very sad. There was a pregnant animal. And again, I'm sitting right outside. I'm, I'm the same. It's the same scenario. Only I don't see the pregnant woman anymore. I just know that she's she's been taken. She's been executed and she's in heaven. But there's this pregnant animal. And this animal is a, little, a, a, it a, it's a, a very pregnant sheep. And it's running and running around and around all around me. And like in circles. And, and um, there's a big bear. Appears to be like a grizzly bear, big brown bear, huge, and is sh chasing this little sheep that's ready to give birth any moment. And I'm helpless to watch. And all I can do is I'm helpless and I'm watching, and I don't know what to do because I know that that pregnant sheep is gonna is gonna collapse at any moment. She's ready to give birth, and this bear has no mercy. It just wants to eat. That little sheep. And so what happens is the, the sheep finally collapses, like right where I'm sitting on the ground. And I don't know what to do but hurry and scoop it up and put it in my arms. Thinking, I'll protect this sheep. That bear ain't going to touch this sheep. And then in my horror, the bear stops at me and eats the sheep's head while it's in my arms. I couldn't protect the sheep. I tried, and I failed. There's people who come to this ministry who think I'm able to protect them. Please don't look at me to protect you. There's only one good shepherd. I'm just the pastor. I'm just a woman saved by the same blood of you so as everyone else who accepts it, who lives holy. I can't protect you when it comes time. And if you've been chosen before the foundation of this world to be a martyr for Yahushua, I can't protect you. I can only encourage you. That's two back-to-back -back dreams. People, it's coming. I don't care where you live in this world. It's coming. Are you ready? Are you ready? I don't know what it's going to take, what I have to go through before I'm out of this world. I do know this. <laughs> by being uh, suffering the persecution that I've been suffering by these enemies... And everybody who is associated with the Mighty Wind Ministries or any other ministry. So these are my two dreams and they're martyrdom back to back. And I leave them with you now to think about what I've said. You better practice being brave now. Because that's what you've been put on YouTube for. That's what you've been put on the internet for. That's what you've been put in this world for. To stand up and defend. There's another brave one. Iron Cross 66106 Ron. Ron was told, and Ron was threatened, that he 
and, and he's intimidated and they make videos about him and when I say they I mean there's a Nehemiah Center cult with Pastor George C who, <laughs> who claims to be a Messianic Jew but he has a church on Sunday oh he's a real enemy alright He said he stoned me to death if he could. In his first video, the man don't even know me. Over two years, he's really done all he can do to try to destroy me. And you know, he, he, these enemies, they, they got, they're like a small army. They get together and they get re recruits. And um, they recruit people. They threaten people. They intimidate them. I'm going to write all your subs and your friends and they'll drop you. If you have anything to do with that ministry called a mighty wind, if you don't make this video against her, and if you don't make those comments, we'll make you regret it. How stupid. How stupid. How many of you people have fell for it? You don't even bother to go to the website to see that this is a holy ministry. You don't even bother to read the prophecies for yourself. The newest lie is that I am Sherry Shriner, who is a mortal enemy of mine who God has put in prophecies 91, 92, and 93 and ripped her apart and exposed her for a high-bred demon which is commonly called an alien in this world? I'm sorry, people. I have no respect for you. I have no pity for you. Because you just repeat the lies that are told about me. And you don't even bother to see who I really am and what a mighty wind ministry and the youth ministers really stand for, which is holiness, righteousness, the righteousness of Yahushua HaMashiach. In 25 languages, we teach it, we preach it, and that includes Hebrew now. I shake my head in amazement for what I have seen on the Internet. Just remember, the right of Yahushua HaMashiach when the rapture happens, just remember, they're few. They're a remnant. But they're like unto a Joel II army, and we're not going to be stopped. And we're not going to back down. And we run towards the Goliath. We don't run away from him. And no matter what the price we have to pay, we will not betray our Yahushua HaMashiach, and we have proven it. I know it's easier to stone me than to defend me. I mean, you've got the, the occults joining together, you've got the New World Order Church, you've got the Satanists, you've got the atheists, you've got the fake Christians. Hey, they outnumber the holy in this world and on the, on the Internet. Not to mention just pure heathen, reprobate, and then you've got just the lukewarm who just barely have any faith at all. Who don't know right from wrong. And these enemies, they go after these. Or the brand new baby converts. Who just started to saying, I found the truth. I know that a mighty wind ministry is preaching the truth about holiness. And i got to get right with God. And, and then they come in there and like a vulture, they scoop them up. And they'll say, no, you don't have to worry about sinning. That's too hard. Like this MOA 373 satanic rec recruiter. That's a, so they got a youth too. That's him. Going after and trying to take away our beloved trustee 777. And say, don't worry about living holy. Get away from that false prophet, your pastor, Elizabeth Elijah. She tells you you got to live holy. Well, nobody can live holy. Just do the best you can. So what if you sin? No big deal. God understands. He doesn't expect us not to sin. Liars. We had that excuse before. We had the Holy Spirit. We don't have that excuse anymore. So I leave you with these two dreams that tell you martyrdom is coming. If you're a coward now, I can't even face up to a few insults or your friends or your family forsaking you. Good luck. And I don't really mean luck because I don't believe in luck. Oh, how you're going to suffer. The worst suffering of all is if you don't get refined in the great tribulation. And if you don't, you have all eternity in hell in the lake of fire. See, for me, I know when my job is done, I know the God that I serve, and I know how much he loves me. I have beheld him face to face. I have seen and I have looked. It will be 24 years ago on December 24th. I have beheld the face of Yeshua HaMashiach, who at that time I called Jesus Christ. He sat on the edge of my bed, and just to date myself a little, it was a big water bed, okay, and it was a, a cushiony, 
uh, leather rail, but he, but he woke me up. I wanted to know who was looking at me with such love in his eyes. Well, I knew it couldn't be the abusive husband that I was married to at that time. And I was clear on my other side of the bed, close as the rails you can get. <laughs> and I opened my eyes, and I saw this bright, bright light with such love. They were staring at me. And it was the one I called Jesus Christ that I now know by the Hebrew name Yahushua. And the love, people. Oh, if you just get a sample of that love, if you just can, I pray you do. You'll never be the same. You'll never betray him. You'll be willing to go to have your head cut off or be martyred however you have to be martyred for his namesake. And I pray everyone who is destined to be a martyr, I pray right now, Abba Yahweh, in the name of Yeshua, that you show them that love that I saw coming out of your eyes. It's like a giant Tusami wave, and it whooshes over your mind, body, spirit, and soul. And he has beautiful, bright blue eyes. They're not brown. They were blue. And he looked at me and he said, I'm so sorry you have suffered like this. For I had a sickness that could have led to death. And the doctors wanted to do some painful tests. And I said, no. Either Jesus heals me or I just go home to heaven. And I had just given birth to a child. I get stubborn. But he said, I'm so sorry you suffered like this as I was mocked. He said, oh, well, then you'll die. And I didn't even know at that time. That very well could have been Hanukkah time. I didn't even know what Hanukkah was because it was December 24th, the day before Christmas. And I told him that I knew that if people stood back to back around this world and said that Jesus Christ did not love me, I would know that they are a liar. And I believe he did that. Not only healed me, of course, I wouldn't be here, but he did that for the time that I'm going through right now where I have people saying the most hateful things that don't even know me and and they are used by Satan to try to destroy a mighty wind ministry and my reputation that I truly have kept holy because I love my Yeshua and I want to be an example to others. And I pray with all my heart that those of you who are destined to be martyred, those of you who have to, will have your, your friends and your family forsake you because you refuse to to give up the truth that you have learned about our beloved Yahushua. I pray with all my heart that you feel the love that I saw in his eyes. And as they take you away, and I'm, of course, there's a bride of Yahushua, and I'm not speaking to you right now. I'm speaking to the guests at the marriage supper of the Lamb who will be martyred. Not all of them, but many of them. That's my prayer for you, that the love that I saw in Yahushua's eyes, not in a vision, but face to face, you will see also. And he'll be right there with you. And your spirit will leave your body before even the blade can touch your neck. Forgive me that I have not been saying that prayer for those are There's so many. There's so many being martyred right now. There's so many being tortured and imprisoned and killed. Forgive me, Yoshua. I have not prayed for them. I pray that this video will stand as a testimony when people hear it. And they will remember to pray for it these people, especially knowing this could be you. And if it is you, what will you do? I suggest you start practicing right now. <laughs> I suggest it very highly because that's what God is doing. He is saying, choose ye this day which God you will serve. And he uses me as his Elijah of new, not because I'm the reincarnation of Elijah of old. Oh, please don't believe these lies. I'm a woman, a W-O-M-A-N, like Helen Reddy's song says. I'm a woman, okay? That's one big difference. I don't have a long white beard, and I'm definitely not in heaven, but I will be one day. And Elijah of old was a prophet, and I'm a prophet of Yahweh. Not anything special I did. Believe me, I told him I didn't want to be called a prophet. And he said, I don't care what you want to be called. I call you a prophet. There it is. And the other thing Elijah of old and I have in common is he was chased by Jezebel, okay? Everybody out after him, literally chasing him. Well, I got enemies that chased me with the spirit of Jezebel. And they got a small army just trying very hard to find me because they would kill me if they could. They got videos out there saying, where is this woman? If you know anything about her, putting personal information, win a registered website. When it first was on the air, that of course none of this information applies right now. 
I'm not stupid anymore. I have my information in, in private registration. I didn't know better then. Oh, man. So they put it in a video. Phone number, address. Stupid people. Stupid reprobate. The bride of Satan. That's who I'm battling right now. How many of you going to stand with me? How many will stand for holiness? Anyone hears this and they believe they are the bride of Yahushua HaMashiach and they have identified with what I've said, contact me. My YouTube username is Yah's Lady in Red because I belong to Yah. And the red is for the blood of Yahushua that saves me, delivers me, anoints me. So those are my dreams. I love all those more than words can say who have encouraged me. There are so many prophecies that have been held up, maybe as many as 20. I need your prayers for them to be released. It's brutal on the front lines. We tried going through the legal route to stop the defamation of character, and the names and the lists are so long. We had, Google was served with a subpoena. I mean, people, they're not just saying they don't like the prophecies, okay? That's their, their freedom to do that. I don't care. They got all of YouTube, but when they're falsely accusing me of crimes, where does it stop? You see, it's not even just about me. It's about the sheep and the lambs being chased away. I care so much. When I see a little sheep just starting to walk, and I'm over there petting it, and the next thing I know, it's in a wolf's mouth being carried away to hell. I care. I grieve. And that's what Satan's done. And only those truly with the Holy Spirit are going to be able to have discernment to know who is evil and who is good. Because they copy and paste scripture pretty good. And they share their little Christian songs. <laughs> They're as evil as evil can be. I'd rather battle an open Satanist or an open atheist than have these as Satanists and atheists disguised and come as fake Christians. Beware, people. YouTube is a sewer, and you have to know where to step. It's got good in it. The real, genuine, born-again, Holy Spirit-filled followers of Yeshua who really do strive to obey and preach holiness, they I call my brothers and sisters. But the majority are cowards and fakes. They're the ones that are going to say, hide us from the face of the Lamb, and he who sits on a throne. They would rather have a mountain cave in on them to hide them from the face of Yahushua. Just wait. The wrath of the Lamb, he is not that... Sacrificial, slain, tortured, humiliated, mocked God that hung on that cross. He is so much more. He's not only that. That was for one time he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Now they know what they do. And there is no excuse. And he's coming back with fire in his eyes and a sword in his mouth and an army behind him. And we, the bride of Yahushua, will be on those horses behind him when it happens, when he returns for the second time. And he will slay these enemies. That's all I have to say. I offend most, but I praise Yahushua. There is a remnant that still consider me a blessing. So for those that have considered me a blessing this day, I love you. And I thank you for everything you're doing for the kingdom of heaven. And whatever we have to do, we're going to do to finish the work that God has given us to do. You know who it is that hinders from the Antichrist being revealed right now? That which hinders is we, the bride of Yeshua. We are the standard that God uses against these evil ones. We are the voice crying out in the wilderness, Choose ye this day which God you will serve. Live holy, given the message of a John the Baptist. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And when the bride of Yahushua HaMashiach is taken, all hell will break loose on this earth in a way that people will want mountains to fall on them to hide them from the wrath of the Lamb and he who sits on the throne. So don't say I didn't warn you. In the meantime, remember to pray for those who are being martyred. Thank you. In Yahushua's name.